Just to give you an idea of who I am, I am a 13-year-old, able-minded girl. I've never been suspected of any sort of mental illness, and I have no medical problems other than asthma and tinnitus. I was born in Arizona. I currently live on a very small Caribbean island that I will not be sharing the name of for privacy reasons. I am a science-based individual. Last night at about 10 p.m., it got really windy all of a sudden, which was odd considering that it hadn't been stormy at all. When I looked out at the ocean, it was flat, smooth as silk. I decided to ignore what my gut was telling me, and my father and I went outside. What I saw will stick with me for the rest of my life, however much longer that will be, which, due to what I've seen, I don't think will be much longer. We saw three red lights in the sky, at the top of the mountain. Of course, because of how stubborn my father is, he told me that it was probably some kind of military craft, Dutch marines or something. But once we went back inside and told my mother, she believed a portion to each of our stories. My father, who believed it was just the military doing some sort of training, and me, who believed it was a UFO, of the words true nature that is, simply an unidentified flying object. Whether it was from another country or another world, I wasn't sure. And my mother, well, she believes that it was some kind of government spy or experiment sort of thing. I found my mother's estimate more likely than my father's, until about 30 minutes ago. I saw someone, well, something. I'm not sure what it is or was. It was on top of one of the flat points on the mountain. Subsequent to us seeing the lights up on the mountain, I asked my friend if she saw the lights too. She said that she did. We're planning on hiking the trail that goes around the island to check it out. We're thinking about waiting until something more major happens until we investigate the situation, in the off chance that my father is correct. Update number one, May 26th of 2020. Today I was hiking for one of my school clubs, and I saw some blood on the trail. Maybe goat blood? I'm not sure what the blood was from, but I have a feeling that it's related to that thing I saw in the sky. Update number two, May 27th, 2020. I just found out that three goats that are on a Caribbean goat farm sort of thing are missing. I think that something is eating them. Update number three. May 31st, 2020. I spoke to an archaeologist here because I wanted another adult's opinion. He told me that there is a certain legend on certain islands that every 177 years, red lights will appear in the sky or mountain, and things emerge from the mountain and will eat and drink and do all that they need to do to survive. He said if they're real, they're more like demons or spirits and won't go away until they're stopped. But they can only be stopped and seen and interacted with by certain groups of people of their choice. It seems that they have chosen teenagers to fight them off. I hope this doesn't end bad for us. I can only hope. Update number four, June 1st, 2020. Today at around eight, I was sitting in my room doing homework and I heard a tapping sort of sound, like something was on my roof. All of a sudden, I heard a screeching sound, and the tapping was over. I was too scared to go outside and look. Final update, June 2nd, 2020. Today I went hiking for my school group, and two of my friends walked up past the part of the trail where we were supposed to stop at. When we were all walking back down, one told me that she saw a dark-skinned woman, like a native or Hispanic woman but on the darker side, hiding in the bushes. She said that she didn't recognize this woman, which they would have if they were a local. Our airport and the ferries are all shut down, so nobody can get on the island. And my other friend told me that when he walked up, he heard a voice speaking almost in a whisper, and what he thought sounded like a native language to the Caribbean. I found a pile and shrine and altar sort of thing slightly off the trail, and we all agreed not to tell anybody just for the sake of convenience. We're keeping in close contact on WhatsApp and Snapchat, 
If anybody knows what's going on or has any suggestions or ideas, please let me know. These events took place in British Columbia in the summer of 2018, June and July to be precise. The events that I'm going to describe took place in two different locations. The first occurrence was by Gold River, near the Mawachat First Nation. The second was by Cathedral Grove. My buddy and I were spending the summer on the island. We were staying in Royston, where we both work. We decided to go spend a weekend in the wilderness. We planned to go rock climbing all day by Gold River and in the evening, find a quiet spot to stargaze. The first part of the day was uneventful, beautiful, and sunny. We decided to camp by Gold River boat launch. For those unfamiliar, it's at a dead end. The only way to go farther is to take a ferry. There's nothing around except trees, valleys, the sea, and an abandoned little parking lot, which nature has slowly taken over. The only civilization nearby is right across our improvised camping spot, the First Nation of Mawachat. We went to bed at about 2 a.m. It was a perfect night. Not a sound, not a cloud, and a lot of stars. It was beautiful. Now here comes the interesting part. Not long after we went into our sleeping bag in the tent, we heard the distinct noise of monkeys. Literally, it sounded like chimpanzees, like we were at the zoo. We both heard it, and it was loud and distinct. It gave us goosebumps. We knew it was impossible because there's no such thing around there. We tried to rationalize it. Initially, we thought it could have been birds we weren't used to, or some small animals, maybe. The sound repeated itself about three times, and then nothing. Everything returned to its quiet state. We've talked to a few locals who'd been staying on the island for a long time about the incident, and we couldn't get a straight answer. About a month later, we went to Cathedral Grove and spent an afternoon there with friends, by the end of the evening, around 7 p.m., we heard the same weird chimpanzee sounds. It seemed like the sound was following us. It went on a few times again and then went quiet. We got kind of creeped out and we left. I don't know if anybody else has ever experienced something similar, but it was certainly interesting. In every city, there is a place that local residents are aware of. Whether it's a home, an office, an abandoned building, or a park that everyone has heard the rumors about, there is always something haunted. The story begins with a murder, a suicide, or some tragic death. And, decades later, tales circulate of the paranormal activity within the area. Some believe, while others scoff. But, either way, everybody knows of the place. I want to share with you the haunted history of Paveglia Island. Paveglia is a small, 17-acre island located in the Venetian Lagoon between the cities of Venice and Lido. In the past few decades, the island has taken upon the reputation of being one of the most haunted locations on Earth. Paveglia holds many tales of paranormal activity, going back for centuries. Local residents refused to set foot on the island, believing that they would be cursed by those who haunt it. The history of Paveglia is a dark one, shrouded in death. There are beliefs that the Romans had used it to isolate victims of the plague and the mentally ill. The first recorded settlement on the island was in 460 AD, of people fleeing the invading barbarians on the mainland. Over the centuries, Paveglia was the scene for many battles as people sought to raid or control it. 
During the Middle Ages, the island was designated as a quarantine area and a burial site for those who contracted the Black Death. Over the next few centuries, Paveglia served as a fort, storage of shipment goods, and continued as an isolation station for those infected with the plague. In the 1920s, the island was set up as a hospital for the mentally ill and the elderly. Soon, stories started to emerge of patients encountering ghosts along with the counts of being possessed. There is the legend of a doctor who conducted medical experiments on the hospital's residents that was driven insane by the spirits to committing suicide. In 1968, the facility was closed and abandoned. Today, the island has been deemed as one of the most haunted places on the planet. Historical researchers estimate that more than 100,000 people died on Paveglia in its history, and many of those souls are believed to still reside there. Locals won't go there, and the fishermen steer clear of its waters. It's said that a few fishermen had caught human remains in their nets. The few paranormal investigators that braved Paveglia had reported encountering a lot of paranormal activity, with claims of being attacked by unseen forces. In 2014, the Italian government sold the island to a developer in hopes that the island could be made into a resort. Currently, rumors on the internet have said that the workers sent to survey the island had an experience and refused to return. As I write this, the Islamic holiday Eid al-Adha just recently ended. I would like to share with you a story that I heard based on my experience helping out at the mosque for last year's celebration. I was there as a journalist, working on a small island off the coast of Singapore. One of the islands has a small mosque, but they were organizing the lamb slaughtering event to give out to the poor. Many villagers, consisting mainly of Muslims and Christians, received free meat on that day, which also contributed to the next event, which was a large feast especially made for the villagers. I got the chance to aid in that and get free food as well. However, one must understand that with a lot of goats, there will be the foul stench all over and constant blood coming from the butchering area. By nightfall, things would have been kept clean, of course. This story is told by one of the staff there that mentions of a tale that will disturb me forever. There is this story that revolves around the mosque being used by an unknown cult to summon the goat woman. They would use the praying hall in the middle of the night and do some sort of satanic ritual before sacrificing a woman, most of the time a villager, to summon the goat woman. Usually the sacrificed is a young girl in her twenties, a virgin, and she was stripped of all her clothing before she was killed. An axe is placed on the sacrificial table, and several red candles light up before some chanting goes on. And then, the spirit of a demon would enter into the deceased's body and rise, placing the decapitated goat head, still fresh, on hers. Blood would drip all over her as she picked up the axe and went after the villagers that killed all the goats. When coming after young virgins, their bodies would be crucified, cut, open by the axe and left on the roads to allow all the villagers to see. According to an old man that lived on that island, the cult consists of satanic worshippers that suddenly came to the island and began performing their demonic rituals one day in the forest. Ever since then, there will always be strange noises coming from the forest. The sound of a goat, the screaming of a woman, or the stomping of a large creature. Many people did go missing, but no investigations conducted were able to find them and so their cases all went cold. The villagers managed to, of course, stop the demon with their exorcism and their guns. They summoned a religious teacher to stop the demon, while a priest from the nearby church also aided the villagers. 
However, this account varies, as some say that she escaped into the forest with her cult, coming out each night to kill young girls. This could be the reason why most girls are given curfews, to protect them from the goat woman. I had always prided myself on being rational, even keeled. You have to be when you're a maintenance technician in a sprawling facility like St. Augustine's Hospital. You troubleshoot electrical issues, fix leaky pipes, and ignore whatever local legends float around the place, except for the unexplained breezes in the West Wing. When I mentioned the cold drafts to Carol, the senior nurse who'd been at St. Augustine's since the days of dial-up internet, she leaned in. Oh, yeah. They come and go. You get used to it. That was easier said than done. The West Wing had been closed off for years, a relic of older, less efficient designs. Budget cuts, someone had mumbled once, but who knows. Despite its emptiness, it was my responsibility to make periodic checks for structural issues, leaks, and electrical faults. The first time I felt the breeze, I was at the end of one of those routine checks. My hand was on the door, ready to leave the derelict wing when it happened. An inexplicable blast of cold air hit me, snaking its way down my collar, chilling me to the bone. The air was still, windows were bolted shut, doors sealed. There was no rational explanation for it. I tried to dismiss it to chalk it up as one of those quirks old buildings have. But then it happened again, and each time the breeze seemed to last longer, to feel colder. It became a distracting, unsettling mystery that I couldn't ignore. I even pulled up old blueprints of the hospital, trying to find some architectural explanation. Air shafts, hidden vents, anything. I found none. Determined to solve the puzzle, I decided to stay overnight in the West Wing. If there was a pattern to the chill winds, I was going to find it. Armed with thermal sensors and a high definition camera, I set up my equipment in the center of the wing. The night stretched on, endless and uneventful, until about 3 a.m. Just as I was questioning my own sanity for doing this, the temperature readings on my thermal sensor plummeted. A chill wind, stronger than any before, howled through the corridor. Papers scattered, old window blinds clattered against the walls, and I was engulfed in a cold unlike anything I had ever felt. I grabbed my camera, fingers trembling, and scanned the room. But there was nothing, no visible source, just the icy gusts battering against me, as if pushing me away, out of the wing. When the winds finally ceased, I was left standing there, disoriented and chilled to my core. The thermal sensors normalized, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had trespassed into something I didn't understand. I packed up my equipment, my movements robotic. I couldn't wait to leave, but as I reached the door to the exit, I hesitated. My camera lay on the table, its lens staring back at me. I played back the footage, fast forwarding through hours of nothingness, until I reached the moment when the winds began. There it was, the papers scattering, the blinds clattering, and then I saw it, a shadow, fleeting and barely discernible, moving against the current of the wind, not with it. It was as if something had walked through, passed by me, unnoticed and undisturbed by the laws of physics. I never spoke of it, never showed anyone the footage. What could I say? What rational explanation could I offer? But I knew I couldn't go back to that wing, not alone, maybe not ever. Months passed and the West Wing became a distant concern, buried under the weight of more immediate issues. It became easier to ignore, easier to forget. But the air in the hospital changed, sometimes subtly, 
sometimes noticeably. A cold draft would pass through a crowded hallway, or a sudden chill would fill a warm room. Nurses blamed the air conditioning and doctors shrugged it off. Only I knew that something had left the West Wing, something that defied explanation. And while the icy winds in the derelict wing had ceased, they now seemed to wander the hospital freely. I often find myself wondering where the chill will appear next, whether it's aimless or searching for something, something that perhaps only it understands. And so the hospital's pulse continues, now with a cold breath that reminds me that there are things in this world that remain beyond understanding, things that you can neither repair nor explain. My girlfriend and I went camping this summer on Mears Island. We didn't know too much about the island, aside from the fact that it has some of the best old growth forests in British Columbia, and that there's the campground and hostel and a small village there. When we got there, we went exploring and felt fine checking out the abandoned cars and rotting docks, as well as going inland along the waterways. We decided to go check out the lake around dusk, since we were told that there was a boardwalk and a boat available for use. As we walked there in high spirits, we listened to the birds. It was a quick walk, only 15 to 20 minutes from the campsite. Once we hit the lake, the atmosphere changed, however. All animal noises ceased. It was complete silence. It was very eerie. At the time, nobody vocalized anything, but my girlfriend and I later discussed the experience and both agreed that we felt uneasy and in danger. We were with a third who I didn't ask the feelings of. I didn't feel comfortable going out on the boat, so I stayed on the dock. My girlfriend and the third person with us went out for a few minutes but felt too creeped out and paddled back quickly. Nighttime had fallen and we decided that it was time to head back to camp since I know silence generally equals predators. We quickly walked back and once we passed the threshold of where we had originally stopped hearing all the noises, animals and birds could be heard in the distance. It was a quiet walk back as we were intent to listen for anything behind us. I know it doesn't sound very scary or eventful. I figured it was probably a black bear or a cougar, but I've encountered those before, and I've never felt threatened by one, particularly not in advance. Cougars could definitely be the reason, though. They said that the big cats stay farther away than that. I wouldn't have thought much of it, except that today, I learned that the island is a Bigfoot sighting hotspot and has a good deal of First Nations lore about wild men and Sasquatch, and the thought creeped me out. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience of not really encountering anything, but feeling like you're on the verge? Here are some of my family stories from Ireland. I was about 17 years old, living at my mom's house. I was just finishing secondary school for my trade in painting. A few of my friends and I from school decided to go out and celebrate our upcoming graduation with drinks. I said, haven't we been celebrating graduation all year? And I got a laugh from the boys. We went out to the pub and did what we did every night, drink. Now, on school and work nights, I kept my wits about me, knowing that I had to get up in the morning. Not only that, but the bars back home didn't stay open until 2 or 4 a.m. They'd put you out at about 12, and maybe you'd get lucky and get a crowd in on a Friday or Saturday, and they'd keep you there to make a bit of money. The night went as usual, and I watched the first two of the group say their goodbyes, grab their jackets and hats, and then head out into the dark. 
Now, you have to remember, Ireland is still a poor country by the standards of the EU and was even worse off than today when I was a teenager in the 70s. Some of the people I grew up with had no plumbing. Most used fireplaces to heat the house. And a couple had no electricity. So when I say they headed into the dark, there were no street lights for miles and there was very limited artificial light. I looked at the clock on the wall. It was 10.30. About 20 minutes passed since the pair had left, and I asked my friend Jerry if he was coming home, since he lived only a few minutes up the road from me. He replied, I'm having a good crack, I'll see you tomorrow. So I left him and headed out myself. The walk from the pub to my house was about two miles or about a 40 minute walk. I said my goodbyes and started out. For some reason, I felt uneasy. I didn't know what was wrong. But walking the dark roads, I walked every night, every day, my whole life, put a knot in my stomach on this night. I got halfway up the road, looked back, and thought about waiting for Jerry to head home with me. I knew Jerry was the kind to stay until closing, and I didn't have the money or the energy to keep up with him until payday. So I turned around, reassured myself, and kept walking. About ten minutes into my walk, I heard rustling in the bushes along the road. It sounded big, and I assumed it was a deer. I kept on, and about halfway home, I heard the rustling in the bushes behind me again, followed by a stone hitting me in the head. I turned quickly and said, Quit it, guys, now. Come out. I don't want to be walking the whole way alone. My heart sank. My friends, who I expected to come out of the bushes, didn't. I was met instead with an eerie silence. I turned around, told myself I'd just had a bit too much to drink, and kept walking. Five minutes later, I heard footsteps behind me. They were keeping pace with my own. This time I darted around and yelled, The joke's gone on long enough, come out now. Again, where I expected to see or hear my friends, I was met with an eerie silence. I turned and picked up the pace, then immediately heard the footsteps, still keeping pace with my own. I stopped dead in my tracks, and so did the footsteps. And then, I ran as fast as I could. And again, the footsteps kept pace, only this time they were getting closer and closer to me instead of keeping the same distance like they had before. My heart was racing, and I finally saw the bridge to the brook and ran across. Then the footsteps stopped, but I didn't. I ran all the way home. When I got home, my mother was sitting by the fire, I sat down next to her out of breath and shaking and she asked me what happened. I told her and she replied, you're lucky you got to the brook, ghosts can't cross water. The ghost never even crossed my mind until she said that. I even asked my friends at school the next day if it was them and said, you really had me going. But I was met with puzzled faces. Later I found out the last three of the group didn't even leave until closing, almost an hour after I started out home. It may not have been a ghost, but what's scarier is truly not knowing what it was at all. The radio looked like it belonged in another era. Wooden casing, weathered dials, the sheer heft of it a testament to its age. When I saw it at the yard sale, the nostalgia was too much to resist. Ten bucks and a cloud of dust later, I was back at my apartment, setting it up on my coffee table. I wasn't expecting much, maybe a couple of garbled channels if I was lucky. But when I turned the dial, what I heard sent chills down my spine. It was the unmistakable timber of my grandfather's voice, announcing the date as October 15th, 1965. At first, I thought it was some sort of prank or trick. My grandfather had been a radio announcer, yes, but he had passed away years ago. The more I listened, the more I became convinced it was him. His tone, his phrasing, the unique way he pronounced certain words. The broadcast covered mundane topics, some news updates, a baseball game commentary, but interspersed between segments were personal remarks that only he and I would understand. Little sayings, 
family jokes, names of people we both knew. I sat there, entranced as his voice filled the room. It was as though a portal had been opened, linking two moments separated by decades. I wanted to reach through, to talk back, to tell him everything I never got a chance to say. The radio seemed tethered to that specific date, October 15th, 1965. Turning the dial didn't change the channel, only the volume. My phone couldn't pick up any signal when I tried to record the broadcast, and nobody else could hear it when I invited them over. It was as if the radio and I had a private connection, one that defied explanation. I spent nights just sitting there, absorbed in the conversation from the past. My grandfather's voice became a constant presence in my life, a link to a time and a person that were both long gone. The isolation it brought was both comforting and eerie. There was something profoundly unsettling about listening to a voice I knew belonged to someone no longer alive, as though I was eavesdropping on a moment that wasn't meant for me. And then one day, the radio fell silent. I don't know what happened. I tried everything, changed the wiring, replaced the tubes, but it remained mute. My grandfather's voice, that had filled my lonely nights, was gone. I keep the radio on my bookshelf now, a relic more than anything else. Occasionally, I'll turn the knob, hoping to hear that familiar voice once again. But all I get is static. However, every year on October 15th, I sit down in front of that silent piece of technology. And for a moment, I can almost hear him, my grandfather, speaking to me from another time, another place, another life. I don't know what I saw in Northern Ireland by user Jukes for Spooks, posted to r slash paranormal. In 2017, I was in Northern Ireland for a college field trip. My religious studies class was visiting stone circles throughout Northern Ireland and Ireland to focus on religious geography. On this particular day, I think we were visiting the Bagmore stone circles it was a normal, cloudy day, and we were enjoying learning the history of the Bronze Age wonder, excitedly waiting to go back to the hotel to begin a new day of pub hopping. I remember the stone circles being separated from the nearby woods with a small wire fence. For some reason, we were hanging around the fence, peering at the woods that lay not 20 yards away. We had yet to go into any woods during our trip, staying mainly at the sites surrounded by farmland. I remember wanting very much to go into this old wood for whatever reason. We all seemed to feel curious about it. I decided to climb over the small farm wire fence and see if there was anything interesting in the woods. Now, these woods were different than the woods I was used to in North America. The branches were thick, too thick to stand in, I had to bend at the waist to traverse them. The ground was covered in a soft, light brown moss, broken up by tree roots. I remember quickly moving under the branches, staring at the ground so as not to trip. I felt giddy, like I was a child going somewhere my parents told me not to. I felt light, and I began to pick up speed. I suddenly looked up to make sure I wasn't about to run into a tree trunk, when something made me stop in my tracks. I saw legs, human legs. I could only see their legs, like someone was standing straight up in the trees. The branches were too thick to stand in, but this person's legs were the only thing visible. I felt an almost animalistic response of fear that didn't really make sense. I told myself they couldn't see me because I couldn't see their face but for some reason I felt that they knew I was there. Why would someone be out here just standing? We were the only group at the circles and there were no houses nearby. 
I looked behind me and realized I was much farther into the woods than I had thought. I could barely see the light from the place I entered. It was so quiet that they had to have heard me approach. My only thought was, I'm closer to them than I am to the entrance. They could get me before I make it out. I was only standing there, bent over for no more than a minute, but it felt like forever. I didn't see them move, but I could tell that they were facing toward me, not away. I now really felt like I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. Only this time, instead of giddy, I felt nauseated. It was like I was a deer and they were a hunter. I turned and bolted. I flew through those trees, still bent to avoid collision. I didn't look down this time, stumbling as fast as I could, just focused on the light at the end of the trees. I felt branches pull my hair and clothes as I ran. I couldn't hear anything over my own breathing. As soon as I broke the tree line, I felt a weight lift. The group standing at the fence looked startled by me bursting out of the woods. I told them that I thought I saw someone, but it almost felt wrong to talk about it. We left soon after, and I don't know what I think it was. Was it just a person hanging out deep in the forest? Was it a fae, a spirit, the green man? I don't really know. All I know is that it felt like I had come close to something from somewhere else. This is what I believe to be the truth. I'm totally open to the possibility that it was a hallucination or a trick of the eye or anything else. I'm honestly just looking for some ideas. For some background, I have had some experiences seeing shadow people as a child, but in the past 10 to 12 years, I haven't really experienced anything other than a weird shape in my peripheral vision or a strange feeling of being watched. Nothing too major. That was until the night of the 23rd of December. I couldn't really sleep that night because I'd been working a late shift and was still kind of in an energetic mood. Weirdly though, that afternoon when I was sitting on my bed putting my shoes on, I could have sworn that I felt something touch my foot from under the bed. I didn't really pay much notice to it, I just remember thinking, oh that's weird. But it was the middle of the day and I was running late. Anyway. That night, once I did finally get to sleep, I kept being awoken by scratching noises. Now that sounds a lot scarier than it is because we always get mice in our attic at winter so it really wasn't anything new or scary. However, the third or fourth time it woke me up, it startled me because it sounded different. This time it sounded like, I guess I would say it sounded like someone really lightly running their finger along the wall. Not scratching at it or anything, just like when someone very lightly runs a finger along a wall. I also noticed that my wardrobe door was open. In my culture, there's a lot of superstition surrounding specifically wardrobe doors being open. I actually have a string keeping it closed, which would have to have been untied in order to open the wardrobe. This immediately made me think that something spooky was afoot, that I was so tired that I was just happy to ignore it. Anyway, I turned on the light and of course there was nothing to be seen, so I got a drink, took a few breaths and went back to sleep. I then woke at about 7 o'clock, lying on my side facing the wall. For some reason I got this overwhelming urge to turn around, and before I knew it I was already rolling over. I noticed that there was what looked to be a shadow man, standing about one meter away from the side of my bed. I got the feeling that it was facing me but peculiarly it had no head. It wasn't like it had been decapitated or anything gruesome like that. It just had an uninterrupted line across from one shoulder to the other. As well as that, I remember it not having any hands, like its arms just ended in a sort of rounded point. I also immediately noticed that it was quite small, maybe five feet tall, possibly less. I'm 5'11 and I could tell it was a decent bit shorter than I. I did not feel threatened at all at the time. I just saw it and thought, oh wow, 
this is actually happening. And then immediately thought, this isn't what I imagined you would look like. For reference, as a child, I remember frequently seeing a huge shadow figure pretty often. So in my mind, that's what a shadow person was supposed to look like. Anyway, I kind of snapped out of it and dove for the light switch. This meant passing the entity in order to reach the switch. It didn't move or run or anything. It just stood still. When I passed it, though, I did notice a coldness in that area and the air feeling thick or dense. That's really the only word I can think of. As soon as the light was on, it began to fade into like a smoke, but there was still a clear outline of it for a few seconds. The best way I can describe it is like, you know when it's really hot outside and you can see the heat waves rising off the road? Yes, well, it looked exactly like that wavy air, but in the shape of the shadow. I'm from Ireland, and assuming this is one of the Ishi, I asked it to leave in Irish. I then felt the newfound sense of dread momentarily lift. But when I sat back down on my bed to kind of process my thoughts, I felt a rush of cold air come toward me, and I did feel a sense of anger or annoyance. But I can't explain where or what it was coming from. It was almost like the air was angry at me. Naturally, I decided that this was a battle I was not willing to fight, and I left the room. As soon as I closed the door, though, I noticed that my two pet ferrets were both wide awake and had all of their fur standing fully on end. I brought them both into my room then, and they both immediately started hissing and puffing up their fur at something. I've never in my life seen them act this way, so it really did freak me out. I had been hoping to just pass this off as some sort of hallucination, but their actions unfortunately made me feel quite justified in my fears. I initially worried that it was the fear Dorka of Irish folklore, a shadow man of the Ishi who acts as a warning of your death, but it doesn't fit any of the descriptions of him from our mythology, which honestly was the best Christmas surprise ever. Fully thought I was a goner there for a while. Anyway, if you made it this far into the story, thank you, and please let me know if you have any ideas as to what this was, if I handled it wrong, or what I should do in the future. I am located in the twin islands of Trinidad and Tobago. There is generally a culture of supernatural entities and folklore that is present in everyone that lives in the country. I have always encountered ghosts periodically in my life, but two days ago I saw something that really disturbed me. I was by myself in my kitchen window at around 2.30 am. I live in a three-story apartment building, and I live on the third floor. Located just outside my window, about 150 meters away, is a church that is also three stories, with the bottom level being the church, and the other parascending levels seem like a house. I was looking out of my window, onto the windows of the church, when I saw the silhouette of what seemed to be a man on the top level of the church. I began to peer at this thing, and upon staring at it, it moved from facing west and slowly turned south, staring directly at me. Then, suddenly, it backed up and seemed to materialize into the wall behind it, like it melded into it. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable, but I'm scared out of my mind. I don't know what I saw. I have no thoughts on what it might be. I'm also getting nightmares frequently these days. I don't know if they're connected or not. I come from a remote island called Rendova, located in the Solomon Islands, and have since moved overseas. Across from our island is another one called Tetepare. The story of Tetepare is really interesting, because it was abandoned completely by the inhabitants a few centuries ago. Just like the villagers fled the island to come to neighboring islands such as my own, here we are a few centuries later. 
Because of the lack of humans on the island, it is known for its biodiversity, and a few researchers come every now and again to have a look. If you are looking for cool remote places to travel, I highly recommend it. The interesting part of Tetapare for me was, why did everyone just leave? If you were a villager back in those days, it would have been a great place to live. Volcanic soil to grow crops, an abundance of fresh water, animals that are easy to hunt. The official story told is that there was a great sickness, and people were dropping like flies left and right. So, the villagers fled to get away from the sickness. However, the island is known to be very big, so realistically, if you wanted to get away from others, it wouldn't be too hard, because you could be self-sufficient on other parts of the island. The story told to me growing up is a little bit different. Back in those days, we loved to fight. A war canoe from my island Rendova arrived on Tetepare to fight. However, upon arrival, they were met with numerous unburied dead bodies. All the large canoes that belonged to the Tetapare people were gone. To leave so hastily, and to not even properly bury your dead, is a really weird thing. Because it was back in those days, the first thought was that a spirit had done this to these people. However, the people from Rendova decided to set up villages against better judgment. In due time, they also fled, because the spirit that had decimated the population of the Tetapare people apparently attacked the newly set upon villagers there. Ever since, the island has continued to remain uninhabited, except for the few ecologes the tourists come to visit at. Now in the present day, we go to Tetapare to maybe have a picnic or go hunting. We are, however, extremely cautious because it is believed that the island is still extremely wild. And because of the lack of humans, that spirits run amuck there. I have some weird stories about going hunting there, but in any case, Tetapare is a completely mysterious island. The Shadow of Charles Fort My paranormal encounter at Charles Fort in Kinsale, Ireland remains one of the most inexplicable experiences of my life. Charles Fort, a 17th century star-shaped fort, is not only an architectural marvel, but also a site steeped in history and, as I came to find out, ghostly tales. I was traveling through Ireland, and visiting the famous historical sites of this particular region was on my list. I've always had a keen interest in history, and the opportunity to explore a fort as old and storied as Charles Fort was something I couldn't pass up. I joined a guided tour one afternoon. The weather was slightly overcast, typical of an Irish day, adding to the fort's somber ambiance. As the tour progressed, our guide told us about stories of the fort's past, including tales of battles and sieges. He also mentioned, almost in passing, the legend of the White Lady of Kinsale, a ghost said to haunt the fort. According to the story, she was the daughter of the fort's commander, who fell to her death on her wedding night after witnessing her husband, a soldier at the fort, being shot. The tour concluded without incident, but I decided to linger a bit longer, captivated by the fort's sprawling structure and the breathtaking view of the ocean. As I walked along the ramparts, the atmosphere around me felt increasingly heavy, and a sense of unease began to creep over me. That's when I saw her. Standing at the edge of the ramparts was a figure in a white dress, her back to me. Assuming at first that she was another tourist, I called out, asking if she was okay. She didn't respond or move. As I approached, a cold wind swept over me, and a feeling of profound sadness engulfed me. I was mere steps away when she suddenly turned. Her face was pale, her eyes empty and sorrowful, and she seemed to look right through me. My heart raced 
and a chill ran down my spine. I blinked, and in that instant she vanished. No trace of her remained, and the heavy atmosphere lifted as abruptly as it had appeared. I stood there for a moment, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I hurried back to the visitor center, my mind racing with questions. I asked one of the staff about the white lady, and their response made my blood run cold. They said that sightings of the white lady were not uncommon, and that many believed she still wandered the fort, mourning her lost love. The experience left me shaken. I've always been open-minded about the paranormal, but encountering it firsthand was something entirely different. The encounter at Charles Fort has stayed with me, and since then I've read more about the fort and its ghostly inhabitant, delving deeper into the legends that surround it. But no matter how much I learn, I can't seem to detach from that sorrowful figure standing at the edge of the world, and I have a feeling that she will always be with me. The Siren at Giant's Causeway My encounter at Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland was as bewildering as it was chilling, a stark contrast to the natural beauty of the place. Known for its unique basalt columns, Giant's Causeway is a popular tourist attraction, steeped in myth and legend. But what I experienced there was far from the tales of giants I had heard. It was a cool, foggy morning when I set out to explore the causeway. The fog was thick, enveloping the landscape in a mysterious veil, making the hexagonal columns appear otherworldly. I was captivated by the surreal beauty and the rhythmic sound of the waves crashing against the rocks. As I walked further along the coast, away from the main tourist paths, the fog seemed to grow denser. The sounds of the ocean became more pronounced, and I could hear what seemed like a melody intertwined with the waves. It was a hauntingly beautiful song, unlike anything I had ever heard. Drawn by the melody, I found myself moving toward the water's edge. The song grew louder, more enchanting, and that's when I saw her. Through the mist, there was a figure sitting on one of the rocks just off the shore. She was ethereal, her hair long and dark, her skin pale against the dark sea. She seemed to be the source of the captivating song. I stood there, mesmerized by her presence and her voice. It felt as though the song was wrapping around me, pulling me closer to the water. I took a step forward my mind foggy as if in a trance. Suddenly, a loud wave crashed onto the shore, snapping me out of my daze. I looked again, but the figure was gone. The song had ceased, leaving only the natural sounds of the ocean. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized how close I had been to the water's edge. I hurried back to the main path, glancing over my shoulder half expecting to see the figure again, but there was only the sea and the fog. Back at my accommodation, I shared my experience with the host. She told me about old sailors' tales of sirens in the waters around Ireland, mythical creatures who lured sailors to their doom with their enchanting music. I don't know if what I saw was a siren or just a figment of my imagination, influenced by the eerie atmosphere of the causeway. But that melody and the sight of the mysterious figure have stayed with me. There was an old stone mill where I lived. It takes a while to walk to the mill and on a number of occasions in my life, I would enjoy walking there. A lot of weird things happened, and this is one of those times. Basically, I live in a town that used to be the capital of Ireland during the medieval ages, 
The town has a castle in the center and a canal that runs along one side that in turn leads to the mill in question. I only say this because it's important later on. One day, two of my friends and I decided to go for a walk down to the mill to see if anything would happen. Ten minutes into our long journey, and it started. A groaning. It was the oddest thing. It was so loud that I thought it was one of the other lads, but it really wasn't. It just sounded so fake. Literally sounded like anyone pretending to be a zombie. I mean, it was so fake sounding I genuinely wasn't even scared. The canal was to our left and the wall of the castle to our right. The castle is closed at night and security patrols the castle grounds. I genuinely just thought that someone was in the castle grounds on the opposite side of the wall and was just trying to freak us out. It didn't work though, I thought. It was so random at the start. One of the guys was getting some sort of panic attack. He claimed he had a dream the night before, about a girl dressed in white, roaming around his house, and that she had caused his grandfather to pass away. He was convinced the dream was connected to what was happening, but we continued on anyway. The groaning continued the entire way until we reached the halfway point of our journey to the mill. The halfway point is just a car park. The trees open up to reveal the sky. It's one of the only places during this walk where trees aren't covering your head. At this point, one of the lads wanted to have a cigarette, so we stopped. And then, it happened. I don't really know how to explain this, but it's almost like there was a flash of black over the sky. Even though it was dark, it was like in a split second, the sky just flashed black. Blink and you'll miss it, but we didn't miss it. Right after this, the groaning got so loud, like it was all around us, but there was nothing there yet yet the sounds were so loud and so real. The friend who'd had the panic attack let out a noise of pain. And then, everything stopped. No groaning, no rushing water from the canal, no nature, just him groaning in pain. He begged us to look at his back because it was burning. And sure enough, he had three scratches the length of his back from the base of his neck all the way down to his lower back. We used the road that leads to the car park to get out of there. I never really knew how to explain this, as some people just claim it's all explainable, but honestly, to this day, I've never seen the sky flash black like that. I've never heard groaning like that, especially when there's nothing and nobody around to do it. A few weeks later, a friend of mine, Scott, told us of an old legend of a headless horseman who would ride up and down the canal looking for his head. Apparently, the groaning is his decapitated head. I guess it was just lucky for us that we didn't meet the rest of him. I have always been open-minded about the supernatural, and I enjoy a good ghost story as much as the next person. The following is an account of something that I experienced a little over 20 years ago in County Dublin in the Republic of Ireland. I've had very little experience with what could be called supernatural phenomena, but this one has stayed with me and left me wondering about what I experienced. The girl that I was seeing at the time gave me a call to let me know that her parents would be out of town for the weekend and that I was more than welcome to spend the weekend alone with her in her parents' house. Now, being a teenage boy, I naturally didn't need to be asked twice, and before I knew it, we were cuddling away in her bedroom. It wasn't long, however, until our passion was interrupted by the distinct sound of footsteps coming up the stairs. On hearing the footsteps, I immediately leapt up and said something along the lines of, What the fuck? I thought your parents were gone for the weekend. She assured me that they were indeed gone for the weekend and seemed to brush off the fact that we had both clearly heard heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. Strange things continued to happen throughout the day, such as once when walking by a room to get to the bathroom, I couldn't help but notice that all the windows had been opened, and that the curtains were blowing around like they were in a hurricane. The thing is, I could have sworn that those windows had been shut the first time I passed them, but who knows, maybe I was mistaken. In fact, I wasn't really feeling spooked by any of this, 
and I just told myself that what I'd witnessed could have been the result of any number of things. It wasn't long until I actually was freaked out, though. At some time in the middle of the night, both myself and my girlfriend woke up, and I remember asking what the hell was going on. I had a feeling that I can't quite describe, sort of a mixture of dread and despair, with a hint of curiosity, if that makes any sense. I could hear movement downstairs, and I had the distinct feeling that there was a crowd of God knows what below in the kitchen. I could also hear conversations, but I couldn't make out what was being said. I again asked my girlfriend what was going on in this house, and to my surprise, she calmly said, Oh, this kind of thing is always happening. This didn't exactly reassure me, but I managed to get back to sleep without any further incident. Now, one more thing I'd like to add is that the house in question was a terraced house, and the house next door had not been too long before the scene of a murder. From what I remember in the news, a woman had been pretty brutally killed, but no one had ever been convicted. Everybody was convinced that it was the husband, but I think he got off on a technicality. I've always wondered if this had anything to do with some of the strange things I experienced there. I grew up in the countryside, literally in the middle of nowhere in Ireland. The house was originally a small cottage. My parents bought it before I was born, and they renovated it and added an extension. There were five other houses on our country road, the closest being a large field away. I don't know much about the history of our house, the land that it was built on, or the history of the area other than an elderly lady lived in the cottage before my parents bought it, and she passed away in a nursing home. The only info that I have about the area is that it was old, and it was a civil parish. Civil parishes are units of territory in the island of Ireland that have their origins in the old Gaelic territorial divisions. Some other things worth noting before I get into the experiences. Behind our house, across a newly built road, was an old graveyard and the ruins of an old church enclosed in a stone wall. When I say old, I mean the gravestones were tipping over, sinking into the ground, and you couldn't read the writing on them anymore. You could see the graveyard from my window and my brother's window. On top of that, when they built that road, they built it when I was a kid as a new main road into town, Archaeologists discovered signs of an early medieval monastery, the site dating back between the 6th and 9th century. They also found some old signs of medieval settlements, some artifacts like tools and things like that relating to the time period, as well as undated burial activity, that's how they put it. Some scattered human bones and the remains of bones of a boy that they think was probably around 7 years old were also found. In the field right next to our house, there were also the ruins of what looked like a small cluster of old stone houses. And there was something similar further down the road. Whenever we get together as a family, we always end up talking about the house and what we experienced. We moved out six years ago. I don't know who or what it was, but there was definitely more than one ghost or spirit. It seemed like there were a lot. I don't know if it has anything to do with the graveyard or what they found or the house or the land itself. I really don't feel like it was the woman that lived there before us either. My mom, dad, two brothers, myself, obviously, and friends that stayed over all experienced something or just got a weird vibe. Funny enough, almost everything that happened happened in the new or built on part of the house rather than in the old part. And stuff happened outside too. I would often feel like there was someone in my room, and I don't know why, but I felt like it was a man. I would never chill in my room alone, and I would dread nighttime coming to go to sleep. I just felt like somebody was there. I heard what sounded like someone walking around. Not footsteps, but just like the movement of someone. I often felt like I was being watched, inside and outside. Fair enough that it could have just been my imagination, or me freaking myself out as a kid, but on multiple occasions I heard what sounded like children talking and playing, but then nobody would be there. 
On one occasion, I heard what sounded like a choir singing in the direction of the graveyard and church. And on another occasion, I heard what sounded like drums being played. Like this weird, repetitive rhythm, almost like a chant. It's hard to describe. Another time, I was outside playing near the side of the house. I was kneeling down, and it was as if somebody had thrown a small stone or pebble, not at me, but in my direction from behind. We had stone clippings in our garden, so I figured it was that. I heard the stone land as if somebody had thrown it, and it happened three times within like 20 seconds of each other. I turned around to see who might want my attention, but nobody was there. Another time, I went to bed really early when it was still bright out. I remember this so vividly, I can even remember the duvet cover that I had on. So I was laying down, wide awake, and it felt as if somebody poked me pretty hard. It was like a strong index finger poking in my lower back. I kind of froze, felt freaked out, didn't turn around, and just convinced myself that it was the paw of one of my teddy bears. I didn't think about it again until years later. From the living room window, my brother saw a man in a hat, smoking a cigarette, standing outside, leaning against the wall near the front door. He got up, like, who the hell is that? Went outside, but nobody was anywhere near us, and he didn't hear anybody run away. You could hear people move even the slightest bit on the stone chippings. Which brings me to my next point. A couple of times, my mom heard someone knock on the back door, but when we went to answer it, nobody was there. She never heard them walk or run away. Another time, she saw the silhouette of someone, again smoking, through the window of the back door, as if they were standing just outside the door. As usual, though, nobody was there. On a couple of occasions, she felt as though somebody was sitting in the back of the car with her when she left our house to go to the shop in the late evenings. The feeling was so strong that she would keep looking in the mirror. A couple of times she even stopped the car and looked under the seats just to make sure nobody was there. My dad, who was a full-on skeptic, saw a black shadow down the end of the hall go from one side to the other. My brother felt like somebody had touched his foot in bed. And on a couple of occasions, heard what sounded like somebody walking down the hallway and stopping outside his door, as though they were going to come in, but hesitated. He would call out to see who it was, but nobody ever answered, so it wasn't any of us. He would also see the hallway lights being turned on and off, and when he was outside around the back garden, he would get this sudden urge or feeling like he should go inside, and he would run in like there was imminent danger. This is weird because I used to feel that way too. Our dog stared and barked at nothing a few times, and a friend of mine that stayed over hated when she had to wake up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night because she said she felt like somebody was watching her from the end of the hallway. I would love to hear any of your thoughts as to what might have been going on in my house. I've been wanting to tell this story for a while. I'll never attempt an EVP again, by user Murphy Brock, posted to r slash paranormal. I lived in a haunted house in Ireland. It was the house I grew up in, and it was left to me in a trust. At some point, the trust turned the house over to me. However, in the expanse of time between my stepmother's death and the age of the trust at which point it could be given to me, the acting trustee left the house and property under my care, even stating that I could live there expense-free. It was a late 50s Newport-style home, with 14 acres atop a scenic hill. I had dreamed for almost my entire adult life of retiring and being home again. I made the decision not to move in after tending to the house and property for the first three months. When I reached the age of taking possession in full from the trustee three years later, I sold it within five weeks. Whatever goodness and light had existed within those walls, and it did, from the age of two to 26, had changed into an oppressive and dark creep show off the Richter scale. 
What I witnessed and felt during my three and a half year oversight is too deep to place into a written narrative. But I'll give you the proverbial icing on the cake. Two weeks prior to closing, my wife and the realtor that was handling the approaching closing were in the kitchen talking. I was standing in the living room. I had been fascinated with EVPs for decades, but I'd never attempted one. I took out my cell and clicked memo and started asking questions for about three minutes. I heard nothing. But for the last 40 seconds, I was silent, but I could see the voice graph moving as if noises were being registered. Before I could do a playback, my wife walked in and asked if I was ready to go. I clicked off and left. I didn't listen to what had been recorded until the evening after I sold the house, the closing. My delay wasn't deliberate. I had just forgotten about doing it. So I listened. While listening, I saw why the noise graph had been bouncing around for that initial 40 seconds. There were voices, two voices, talking. One not specifically addressing my questions and the other addressing them. I played the recording for five people, one close friend and four family members. All of them heard what I had captured, but no one knew what to say, and neither did I. I'm ending this with two declarative statements. I will never attempt an EVP again, and I'm glad I sold my family home. I worked at a state park for a number of years on a 30-acre island that was mostly taken up by a 20-acre granite star-shaped fort from the 1820s. It was actively used through World War II. During the Civil War, it was used as a prison for Confederate maritime officers and political prisoners. Sounds creepy, right? It was. Only a few staff would stay overnight, and some nights I was there alone. The staff stayed in the upstairs of a brick building that was built about 1900. The upstairs had been converted into staff housing sometime in the 1960s, with five or six bedrooms, a kitchen, a small living room, and a big storage area. Two of the bedrooms were original to the place. The back stairs that led to the living quarters were wooden and old and loud when you walked up them. It was a big building, but when someone was walking up the stairs, you could basically hear it through the entire place. Back in 2006, another coworker and I were hanging out in the workshop downstairs at night, having a couple of drinks and listening to the stereo until bedtime. We were the only two people on the island. I woke up at about 2 a.m. and I could hear my partner walking down the stairs. I didn't think much of it, because sometimes we would forget to lock the main door before bed, and one of us would get up in the night to do it. In the morning, when we were making coffee, I said, Hey, did we forget to lock the door? I heard you going downstairs in the night. He looked at me and said, I thought that was you. That was our introduction to the stair ghost. It actually became so common that it wasn't even spooky anymore. It was just kind of like, oh, there's the stair ghost again. Also, when I brought it up to a woman who had worked there for many years, she was like, oh yeah, the stair ghost, like it was nothing. A few years later, I was alone on the island in the off season when the park was closed, but it was during the day. I had just woken up and was in the kitchen when I heard someone coming up the stairs. I figured that the labor crew must have arrived for the day and someone was coming to talk to me. So the very clear, loud steps get to the top landing and stop. I'm waiting for the door to open, but it never does. So after a minute, I go over and open it. Nothing. I walk to the front of the building and look out at the pier. No boat. Nobody else was there, and the labor crew never came out that day. 
I know that was a lot of words for relatively little, so I'll leave you with one more story from this place, though I do have some more. Another of my co-workers was staying out there by herself, but she had her dog with her, a very mellow golden retriever. She said that at about 2 a.m., which was the time that most of the really weird crap would happen, her dog woke up and started barking fervently at the door to the bedroom. This obviously freaked her out, so she figures maybe he has to pee or something. She opens the door and her dog runs out into the hallway. It's one long hallway with bedrooms on one side and a storage area on the other, and the dog is running up and down the hallway, peeing and crapping while running and barking like it was completely terrified of something. I never did have a good feeling in that place, though I also never heard of anything terrible happening in that particular building. There were deaths on the island, of course. Who knows, it was a farm before the government bought it, and Native Americans used it for thousands of years before that. So, who knows what it could have been. I'm not sure we'll ever know. I have a weird, ominous topic that I wanted to talk about. I grew up on a small island chain off of the Texas Gulf Coast. Never really experienced anything out of the ordinary, until I moved to another island in the chain, North Padre. I don't live there anymore, but when I come to visit, there's this little thing that bothers me every time, and I've heard it ever since I've moved. There's this constant mechanical sounding ring that I can hear. It's always there. It's hard to describe, but I know exactly what direction it's coming from. The ocean. I have no idea what's making it. I always hear it coming from a certain point on the island. Ships tend to stay far away from this point, so I don't think it's a horn. Especially since it's very rhythmic. The sound is very low. I always hear it in the back of my head. Sometimes I won't hear it for an hour or so, and I feel fine when it stops. When it starts up again, I get a really bad headache, and sometimes I can get confused or dizzy. I was told by my boyfriend that I'm most likely hearing the hum of the earth, but to me it's more like a ringing. I don't hear it anywhere else other than Padre. When I stand on the beach, I can point directly to where it's coming from. It makes it really hard to sleep, and I always feel on edge, like something awful is going to happen. I don't know if anyone else experiences this where they live, or if they've been to North Padre and have heard this noise, but I just thought it was an interesting story. For the longest time, when I actually lived on the island and wasn't just visiting my parents, I assumed it was the lighthouse. I'm not sure why I assumed this, but it seemed to make sense in my mind. It turns out the island does not and has not ever had a lighthouse. When I learned that, that's when I started getting that awful feeling from the sound. Before it would bother me, but I just brushed it off, thinking that it could be reasonably explained and that I was being irrational. Anyone I've ever talked to about it says that I have hearing problems, or that I'm being overdramatic, other than my boyfriend, who has tried to hear it with me but can't. I've always had sensitive hearing, and over the years I've been clinically diagnosed with PTSD, and I have developed a trigger for alarms and rings, especially fire alarms, even though I've never been in a fire. I've gotten a whole lot better at picking out individual sounds and where they're coming from, I use this to calm myself and figure out why something is going off so I can rationalize it and not have a panic attack. So far, I haven't found an explanation that quite fits for this sound, and I think that's what bothers me the most about it. I can't rationalize it, because every time I do, somebody disproves my thinking. Like the lighthouse, the ships, the military base, church bells. We have one teeny tiny airport, 
The military base is all the way on the other side of Corpus, and out of the four churches on the island, only one has a bell, but it's broken. I'm always on edge and anxious, as I have no idea where it's coming from. I mean, the actual source. I just know the direction. Maybe I am just a crazy person whose PTSD has taken over, but I sincerely believe this sound is real and coming from the ocean. I lived in a haunted house in Ireland by user John Von One, posted to r slash paranormal. Make of this what you will. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage. It suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom railing was strewn across my bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was someone in the house with me. So I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder because the door was locked and all the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I wasn't paying attention and that I might have actually left the towel in my room even though I knew I didn't. But things only got worse as time went on and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from work, particularly at nighttime, there was a light switch on the wall by the doorway. I'd have to switch that one on before I would even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I'd open the door at nighttime, there'd be a gust of wind coming out from the house to greet me. But it eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about 3 a.m. after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom that was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. So this night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by all I can say was a big man's shadow, and this thing was standing at the end of the hallway. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me, because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood within the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense I roared out, leave me alone, just leave me alone. And with that, whatever it was, it turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. Then there was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back into my car and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time, and he thought I'd been in some kind of an accident. I tried to explain it to them the best that I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anyone about the goings-on in the house up until that point, and I'd been living in it for about six months, and it had been going on that whole time. Almost every day something happened. 
Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day, and we found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge, and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was as if somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it and then it just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house about six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed, it was about 1 a.m. And coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, no doctor please, help me. Petrified, I leapt out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere, checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television was plugged out because it sometimes turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which was also unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like for some reason, she didn't want me to bring a doctor. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I had asked a neighbor and he told me that the couple who had bought the house off, the wife had been complaining about hearing things in the house. I don't know what I saw or heard, but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house because I haven't experienced anything like that since then. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off me experienced anything, I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't talk about this with people, as I don't want them thinking that I'm crazy, but I know that this happened to me. The Original Hellfire Club My encounter at the Hellfire Club, an infamous ruin on the summit of Montpelier Hill in Ireland, is an experience that still haunts my thoughts. The Hellfire Club, originally built as a hunting lodge in the early 18th century, has a reputation for being a place of supernatural occurrences and dark history, including stories of so-called satanic rituals and unexplained phenomena. I was visiting Ireland last autumn, drawn by the rich history and folklore. A local I met in a Dublin pub told me about the Hellfire Club, piquing my interest with tales of ghost sightings and strange happenings. As someone fascinated by the paranormal, I decided to visit the site. I arrived at the ruins on a chilly, overcast afternoon. The remains of the building stood stark against the gray sky, its empty windows like dark, watching eyes. The air was thick with a sense of foreboding, and the wind seemed to carry distant whispers. As I explored the ruins, I felt an increasing sense of unease. The wind grew stronger, and the whispers became more distinct. It was as though multiple voices were speaking in a language I didn't understand. I tried to dismiss it as my imagination, fueled by the stories I had heard. But then, in the main gathering room, where the Hellfire Club once held their meetings, I saw something that stopped me in my tracks. A shadowy figure, cloaked and hooded, stood by the fireplace. It was so clear and defined that I thought it was another visitor. But when I called out, the figure slowly turned toward me, its face obscured by the hood. And then the figure began to fade, dissolving into the air until it was gone. The whispers fell silent. I stood there trying to process what I had just seen. A bit shaken, I quickly left the ruins. The way back felt longer than the hike up, every sound making me jump. 
Back in Dublin, I did some research on the Hellfire Club. The stories ranged from the mundane to the bizarre. Tales of wild parties, occult practices, even murder. Some believe the club's activities invited something dark into the building, and some think that that presence lingers to this day. I don't really know what to make of my experience at the Hellfire Club. Whether it was a ghost or a trick of the light or something else, I can't really say for sure. But the memory of that cloaked figure is something that I will never forget. The painting caught my eye at a local estate sale. It depicted a figure, a woman dressed in a flowing Victorian era gown, standing at the edge of a dense forest. Her face was obscured by a veil, but there was an undeniable allure to her posture, a sense of mystery that drew me in. Without much thought, I purchased the painting and hung it in my living room. The first few days, it served as a conversation piece guests would comment on its haunting beauty, speculating about the identity of the woman and the artist who painted her. But as the days turned into weeks, I began to notice something unsettling. Every morning as I passed by the painting, it seemed as though the figure had moved ever so slightly. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light, or my imagination playing games. But day by day, the woman in the painting seemed to be inching closer, moving from the edge of the forest toward the foreground. I tried to rationalize it. Perhaps the paint was reacting to the humidity, or maybe the canvas was warping. But deep down, I knew something supernatural was at play. One evening, as I sat reading in the living room, I glanced up at the painting and froze. The woman was no longer at the edge of the forest. She was now at the very front of the canvas, her veiled face mere inches from breaking free. And as I stared, I could have sworn I saw the fabric of her veil flutter, as if caught in a gentle breeze. Disturbed, I decided to research the painting's origins. A deep dive into local archives led me to a tragic tale from the late 1800s. The woman in the painting was Lady Eleanor, a noblewoman who had vanished without a trace. She was last seen entering the very forest depicted in the painting, and despite extensive searches, no trace of her was ever found. Rumors swirled about her fate. Some believed she had been taken by spirits, while others whispered about a forbidden romance and a heartbroken departure. But one thing was clear. The artist who painted her was deeply in love with Eleanor and devastated by her disappearance. In his grief, he painted the haunting portrait, pouring all his longing and sorrow into the canvas. Realizing the situation, I sought the help of a local medium. She sensed a powerful energy emanating from the painting. The spirits of both Eleanor and the artist intertwined in a dance of love and loss. To free them, we held a seance. As the medium chanted, the room grew cold and the painting seemed to come alive. The forest in the background rustled and Lady Eleanor's veil lifted, revealing a face of ethereal beauty. A soft voice echoed through the room, expressing gratitude for being seen and remembered. With a final heart-rending sigh, the figure in the painting retreated returning to her original position at the edge of the forest. The room warmed and a sense of peace settled over everything. The painting remains in my living room, its beauty undiminished. But now when I look at it, I see not just a portrait of a lost noblewoman, but a testament to the power of love, a reminder that even in death, our stories continue, waiting for someone to bear witness.
My work as a geologist often took me to remote corners of Arizona, places where the roads stretch out into the horizon and the desert stretches out even further. A landscape that could be hypnotic in its repetitive beauty. But that day in September, the land felt different somehow, its eerie emptiness weighing heavily on me. I was returning from a soil testing job, driving my well-worn pickup down a highway I'd traversed at least a dozen times before. Dusk was falling, casting long shadows on the ground and turning the sky into a canvas of reds and purples. I was listening to a podcast about ancient civilizations, their folklore and myths, which usually fascinated me. But on that drive, the words became a monotonous drone, blending into the background as I struggled to keep my focus. Just when my eyes were becoming a little too heavy for comfort, I saw it, a solitary tree standing near the highway. This wouldn't be remarkable in any other circumstance, but this tree was ablaze. Flames leapt from its branches, yet it didn't seem to be burning down. It stood there, a spectacle of fire against the backdrop of the setting sun. I pulled over, grabbed my fire extinguisher, and ran toward it. But as I got closer, I realized something astonishing. There was no heat emanating from the flames. Cautiously, I extended a hand toward the fire and felt nothing but the cool desert air. The flames were cold, or at least not hot. My rational mind grappled with this impossibility. It was then that I heard the whisper, a hushed voice so soft it was almost drowned out by the crackling flames. Help me, it said. I looked around thinking someone must be playing a trick on me, but there was no one. I was alone with this inexplicable burning tree. Who are you? I stammered, feeling ridiculous for talking to a tree, but unable to help myself. I am bound, the voice whispered, more audibly this time. Release me. Without thinking, I pulled out the small hatchet I kept in my toolkit for sample collection. As the blade cut through the bark, the flames flickered, as if reacting to my touch. Finally, with one last swing, I severed a branch. The moment it fell, the flames vanished, leaving the tree as it was, just a tree. I felt a sudden rush of wind, and a feeling of liberation washed over me. The tree looked normal, mundane even, but I couldn't shake the sensation that something extraordinary had just occurred. I took the severed branch with me, storing it carefully in the back of my pickup. That night, I did some research and found local Native American legends about spirits being trapped in trees, waiting for someone to release them. Could it be that I had encountered one such spirit? Rational explanations eluded me, but the branch, still untouched by burn marks, was a tangible, physical proof that I clung to. Since then, my views on the paranormal have shifted. I don't know what I released that day or what it meant, but I do know that the desert is a place of mysteries, some better left unsolved, others begging to be explored. Whatever it was, that fiery visage is etched in my memory, a constant reminder that reality is far more complex and wondrous than we can ever fully comprehend. pendant was an unexpected discovery, hidden beneath the floorboards of my newly purchased Victorian home. It was a delicate piece with a deep blue gemstone set in ornate silver. The moment I clasped it in my hand, a rush of emotions flooded over me, fear, sorrow, and a deep sense of longing. That night, as I drifted off to sleep, the dreams began. 
I found myself in a bustling town square, the surroundings unfamiliar yet oddly comforting. The attire, the architecture, everything hinted at a time long past. In this dream world, I was a young woman named Ilara, living a life of privilege but bound by societal expectations. Night after night, the dreams delved deeper into Ilara's life. I felt her joys, her heartbreaks, and her secret love affair with a man named Samuel, a talented blacksmith. Their love was passionate but forbidden, as Ilara was promised to another, a wealthy merchant named Lord Blackthorn. The dreams grew more intense, culminating in a fateful evening. Samuel had crafted a pendant for Alara, the same one I had found as a symbol of their undying love. But their secret rendezvous was discovered by Lord Blackthorn. In a fit of rage and jealousy, he confronted Alara, and the confrontation turned deadly. The last thing I felt in the dream was a sharp pain, the world fading to black, the pendant slipping from Ilara's grasp. I awoke with a start, the weight of Ilara's memories pressing down on me. The pendant wasn't just a piece of jewelry. It was a link to a past life, a life cut tragically short. Determined to find closure, I began researching the history of my home and the town. The local archives revealed a tale that mirrored my dreams. Ilara and Samuel were real, their love story a tragic chapter in the town's history. Lord Blackthorn, consumed by guilt, had become a recluse and the pendant was lost to time. With the truth revealed, I felt a duty to honor Ilara's memory. I sought out Samuel's descendants, discovering that his great-great-grandson was a historian living in the same town. Together, we erected a memorial in the town square, commemorating the love story of Ilara and Samuel, ensuring their tale would never be forgotten. The dreams ceased, but the pendant remained with me, a tangible connection to a past life. It served as a reminder of the cyclical nature of existence, the idea that love transcends time, and that sometimes the universe grants us a chance to right the wrongs of the past. The leaves had just started to turn colors, and I found myself driving on a stretch of road in West Milford, New Jersey, known as Clinton Road. My buddy, who was a folklore enthusiast, had filled me in on the tales of the area. A notorious 10-mile stretch, it had more legends associated with it than any other road in the U.S. Stories ranged from ghostly apparitions, strange creatures, to even eerie gatherings of unknown societies. It was near twilight, that perfect hue of orange and purple in the sky, when I started my drive. I remember feeling slightly uneasy as the dense woods on either side of the road appeared to close in on me. As I drove further, the tranquility of the fall season began to be overshadowed by an inexplicable weightiness in the air. In the descending darkness, my headlights caught a glimpse of something by the side of the road. A decrepit-looking truck, from what seemed like the 60s, parked haphazardly by the side of the road. Being the Good Samaritan, I thought I'd stop and check if someone needed any help. I pulled over a few yards ahead and rolled down my window. There was stillness in the air, except for the faint whispering of the wind through the trees. I called out, Hey, anyone there? Need help? To my surprise, a coin suddenly dropped onto the asphalt beside my car. I picked it up and inspected it. It was old and worn out, dated back to 1965. I recalled one of the legends associated with the road, the ghost of a boy who had died under mysterious circumstances and if you dropped a coin on a certain bridge, he'd throw it back. Was this the bridge? 
A shiver ran down my spine. Just then, the old truck's headlights blinked to life. Its engine roared and it started moving, backward. The vehicle didn't turn around. Instead, it backed up at an alarming speed, headlights blinding me momentarily. Fumbling for the ignition, I managed to get my car started and I sped away. The old truck seemed to follow for a bit, but its presence faded the farther I got from that spot. Relief washed over me as I saw the sign indicating the end of Clinton Road. But the coin? It sat on my dashboard, a grim reminder that not all legends are mere tales. It took me weeks to muster up the courage to drive by that road again. By daylight, of course. Whenever someone asks me if I believe in ghosts or paranormal activities, I simply show them the coin, a testament to that eerie autumn night on Clinton Road. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live on the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, just to give some reference people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug there for my laptop. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30, and it was perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village, really. Just to set the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window, when all of a sudden I see this bright light just over the fields. It was multicolored, and it kind of blooms and grows larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough late in March in the middle of the pandemic lockdown. Except that it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, but if I had to guess, I would say it was two acres or more away, and larger than a family car, hanging maybe... 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually it faded and disappeared, again not behaving anything like a firework, and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later I glanced out again and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot, but it vanished almost the moment that I looked at it. This light was maybe a third the size of the original, and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Ballymoney Town firework display is much farther away, and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we would have heard it. A drone still strikes me as the most likely, we wouldn't have heard it inside the house, and I guess it might have been rigged with really powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful, so I don't know, and the size still throws me off. I've never, ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime, and I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think I might have seen a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media, though, and I haven't seen anything since. I grew up in Ireland, and back in the 90s, my family had a small holiday home in Ballyornan that we shared with a bunch of relatives. The house has long since been sold, but there were a couple of freaky things that happened to me. The house was located in a small, isolated area with a bunch of other holiday homes and families. The entrance had a farmer's field attached where people would always pat and feed the white horse that was always there. Polo mints were his favorite. 
One year, when I was around six or seven, my younger cousin and I crawled through an opening in a barbed wire fence that we used to do regularly to go pat the horse close up. This was also in the middle of the day, so it was completely bright. We were feeding and patting the horse when I noticed along the top of the field a person running across. But something was strange, markedly that they seemed to be completely translucent. They stopped dead in their tracks and turned to face us, about 50 yards away. At this point, the horse started kicking and neighing and became extremely unsettled. It ran off to the other end of the field. We turned around and this person was still coming at us. We could see a face, and I remember it being completely sinister looking, with a smile. My cousin and I absolutely bolted back through the barbed wire fence and ran straight home. We didn't mention it to any of the adults because we shouldn't have been entering the private property in the first place, so we had a few sleepless nights, but we let it lie. In my adult life, I had recounted this story to a few friends, but sort of at the time I was still convinced myself that I had fabricated it and Maybe it was nothing. Until I ran into my cousin at a New Year's party a few years back. We hadn't spoken for some time as he'd been living in America, but over a pint I recalled the story to him, and he absolutely recalled every single detail. This gave me the weirdest chilling feeling I've ever had, mainly because I assumed that we did see something, but that I had most likely fabricated it. But he even recalled this person's face and the sinister look the smile, and the translucent appearance. This may not be the creepiest thing you'll ever read about, but it's always been very personal to me, and I often replay it in my head, over and over. I've seen some really strange things in the Navy. This is one of the two strangest things that I've seen during my career at sea. We were in the South Atlantic Ocean at the time, northwest bound on a course for what ultimately would be the U.S. Gulf, coming from the Cape of Good Hope. It was February 1995. I was on duty on the bridge at the time, and I remember going inside the chart room to fix the ship's position. We had Omega, Lawrence C, SatNav, and some early GPS models. I don't have the exact position, but I do remember that the nearest land was the island of St. Helena, and using the dividers, I remember that I reckoned we were about a thousand nautical miles or less broadly south-southwest off of the island. People need to understand that what I saw was not bioluminescent worms or other marine organisms. This light that I saw was very different. I've seen plenty of all that, more than anybody would ever want to see when I was serving aboard ships in the Persian Gulf. This was like a lit marine floodlight inside the sea that produced a green light. It seemed stationary to an observer aboard my vessel because whatever it was was moving at exactly the same speed with my vessel, on exactly the same course submerged and abeam. The phenomenon lasted for about 10 minutes. No entry was made in the log. We did not report this to a senior officer or the skipper, and I just cracked some jokes with the remainder of the bridge team, trying to convince them that it was bioluminescent marine organisms. One of the personnel on duty that night on the bridge had also convinced himself that it was worms, and he tried to help me convince the others. The U.S. Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard never got to hear about this. I was young, my career was just starting, and I didn't want anything to do with anomalous phenomena. I definitely did not want to be interviewed by senior officers ashore, trying to prove to them that I'm not Fox Mulder, nor did I want to get any odd remarks on my personnel file. As far as I know, U.S. Navy subs do not have floodlights that work when they're submerged. I have no freaking idea what this was. I suppose it could have been Russians or something or someone else entirely. Were someone to ask me today about this, I would still deny everything, and I've never spoken to anyone in the U.S. Navy or U.S. Military or U.S. Coast Guard about this, nor do I want to. 
I'm pretty sure that they have a pretty good idea what it is in the U.S. Navy. And I'm sure plenty of other officers and NCOs have seen the same thing. I'm sure they have all filed reports. And I'm really not curious of ever finding out what this is. This happened early, around five or six in the morning, and I was fast asleep. I was about 10 years of age. So I was sleeping and gradually woke up in a nice, relaxing way. I didn't jump up or startle or anything like that. I rolled over to face the wall. I always go to sleep in this position. And as I rolled over, there was a man dressed in all white with a white glow around him. In his hands, he had rosary beads, and he was praying with his head bent down toward the ground. At this point, I was literally frozen solid with fear and stuck in the spot I was in. I pulled the covers up over my head for a split second, and then realized that I could move, and I ran downstairs to my parents' room. I've seen a ghost. There's a ghost in my room, I said. Son, there's not. You've had a nightmare. Go back to bed. I refused to go back to my room. I fell asleep in their bed. A couple of hours later, the house phone rang, probably at around 7 or 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, which is highly unusual. My dad answered the phone. Hello? What? How? Right, okay, I'm up. I'll be over as soon as I can. Is everything okay? My mom asked. No, my brother Tony has died. I never met my uncle Tony. He lived in England, and we live in Ireland. He was only 30, and died peacefully in his sleep. My dad brought some photos to show me who he was, and to tell me about him. And that's when I realized. This was the man who had been kneeling beside my bed praying. It was a slow night. Halfway into my graveyard shift as a security guard, I found myself slumped in my chair, sipping stale coffee and watching feeds from the security camera. Monitors flickered in a rhythmic cycle through different angles of the hospital. Corridors, waiting rooms, stairwells. The place was a labyrinth after dark, silent except for the hum of machinery. My eyes were getting heavy when I saw it. Camera 12, third floor corridor. A shadowy figure moved along the wall, elongated and indistinct. I blinked, rubbed my eyes. The figure remained, inching closer to the far end of the hallway where it intersected with another. I glanced at the clock, 3.07 a.m. Grabbing my flashlight and keys, I made my way to the third floor. Adrenaline cut through my drowsiness. Either somebody had breached security, or I was chasing phantoms. The elevator dinged softly, doors sliding open. I stepped out, flicked on the flashlight, and swept the beam down the corridor. Nothing. I checked the adjacent hallways, even popped into a few rooms. No sign of an intruder. Yet the unsettling sensation of being observed washed over me. I shook it off and headed back to the control room, a rational part of me figuring it was a camera glitch or a trick of the light. Back at my desk, I rewound the footage. The shadowy figure reappeared at the same spot, moving in the same direction, fading as it reached the hallway's end. No logical explanation came to mind. I logged the incident, noting the time and camera number, though omitting my eerie feelings no need for people to question my sanity. In the nights that followed, I watched that corridor like a hawk. The figure never reappeared, but the memory lurked in the back of my mind, a puzzle with missing pieces. And though I still patrol the third floor, I do it with a quicker step, always reminding myself to breathe, especially when my flashlight casts long shadows on the wall.
As an ER nurse, I've seen my fair share of strange things during the graveyard shift, but nothing prepared me for the night that I saw the ghost of a young child wandering the halls of our pediatric ward. It started like any other night, busy and chaotic. We had a bad car accident come in, so all hands were on deck in the ER. Once things finally calmed down around 3 a.m., I decided to stretch my legs and grab a coffee upstairs. That's when I saw him. A young boy, no more than six or seven, peeking his head around the corner at the end of the long hall. He had this lost, forlorn look on his face that struck me as odd. Quietly, I called out, Hey there, are you lost? But he didn't respond. He only stared back with sad eyes before disappearing around the corner. I hurried after him, turning the corner only to find the hallway completely empty. A chill went down my spine. There's no way he could have gotten out of there that fast. I searched every room, every nook and cranny of that ward looking for the boy, but he was nowhere to be found. When I told the other nurses what I had seen, they just nodded. It turns out several of them had seen this ghostly boy over the years, always wandering the halls late at night. We now think he's the spirit of a child who passed away here long ago, still drawn to the pediatric ward where he spent his final days. Though the encounter spooked me at first, I now find it kind of comforting to think that he finds some solace in visiting the kids, like he's watching over them, even from beyond. So, if you ever find yourself in the pediatric ward late at night and see a lone boy wandering the halls, don't be afraid. Just know that he's one of our own, and he means no harm. When I was 12, my younger brother and I used to travel up over the border to a small town in Northern Ireland to visit our father, as my parents had divorced. My dad, being a firm Protestant, insisted that we rejoin a Protestant scout group called the Boys' Brigade. We had left it a few years prior, due to moving across the county and there being no installation where we had moved. So now that we could attend it again, we were drafted in and off we went. For anyone wondering, it isn't at all like American Scouts. It's like Sunday school, but you sit around and read scripture, learn marching drills, play football, dodgeball, etc., all inside of a massive church hall, and then every so often you'd go on a day trip to different places. This one particular trip had us going off for an overnight weekend stay in some adventure camping compound way up in the forests adjacent to a coastal town. Rock climbing, kayaking, orienteering, etc. But much more controlled and set out. It would be less like wild camping, more like show up to this place, get our own dorm rooms with bunk beds in them, wake up and go have breakfast in the cafeteria, then go do some activities, go get dinner, and finally back to the dorms for the night. So upon getting to my dorm room, I picked the top bunk next to the window, and when it came time to sleep, I was laying on my side, looking out, when I noticed that there was an old tree stump directly ahead of me. The stump was directly ahead in a straight line as you exited the dorm complex, so anybody walking out to go get breakfast in the morning would see it. You couldn't not notice it, as it was just there. So the next morning I woke up late and everyone else was already walking down to get breakfast. So I pulled my clothes on and ran down to catch up. As I exited the main doors, I saw a woman in a white dress sitting on the tree stump, just combing her hair. Now this woman had bare feet, and she didn't look like she belonged there. Remember this compound was completely empty bar us scout boys and our brigade leaders, so seeing any type of person there would raise some alarm bells, but the fact that it was a woman in a clean white dress with bare feet in the middle of a compound in a forest just combing her hair was unnatural. I rubbed my eyes as I knew that I was seeing things, but nope, still there. So I did what any scared boy would do. I ran the hell out of there back up to my dorm room and nervously looked out the window, 
to see that she was now gone. I waited until a brigade leader came up to tell me to get out to breakfast, and I told him what I saw. He didn't buy it for a second, and ushered me out the door. The next day we went home, but it has stuck with me all these years. Supernatural or not, it wasn't normal, and it still gives me shivers thinking about it. There was no rhyme or reason, even if it was just a normal woman, to be there. But, in hindsight, given our local lore and culture, I sometimes wonder if I saw a banshee. My grandmother is one of those people who seems to just be naturally susceptible to paranormal activity. She's in her late 70s and has numerous stories about all sorts of spooky and unexplainable encounters she's had throughout her life. She used to keep me entertained for hours with me getting her to constantly tell and retell her stories again and again. It's the way she tells them, I think, that really invokes a sense of fear. Hopefully, I can do her justice with my recounts, as she's not quite up to speed on Reddit. The house she grew up in throughout the 50s was haunted, undoubtedly. We'll start with the time that she was walking home from school as a 10-year-old girl. She grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, in a typical city-style terraced house. Maybe 50 houses joined together on a long, narrow street. There was no one immediately around her as she walked home from school one brisk January afternoon, except for one gentleman walking maybe 20 yards in front of her. He was wearing a long black overcoat with a bowler hat, not something that would raise any eyebrows at the time. Suddenly, my grandmother noticed the man stop in front of her house, open the little gate at the front of the small garden, walk the five yards down the path to her front door, open it, and enter the house. Still, she thought nothing of this, simply assuming the man was a friend of her parents, or a colleague of her father's of some kind. Oddly, however, when she got to the front door and went to open it not moments after the man, the door was locked. She thought this strange, as the man had just pushed it open and walked in. Not too weird, though, right? Someone may have just locked the door behind him. What was strange, however, was that upon entering the house not 45 seconds after the man in black did, she found herself to be the only one in the house. No parents, no man in black, nobody. My grandmother often speaks of the noises she used to hear lying in her bed at night. And by noises, I mean a horrible, blood-curdling wheeze, coming from, of all places, directly under her bed. She described it as the long, drawn-out breaths that you would imagine coming from a 90-year-old, 40-a-day smoker on their deathbed. This would happen night after night after night. She used to run downstairs to tell her mother about the man under her bed, but her mother was a stern Christian woman and would have nothing to do with it, often scolding her and sending her back to bed for telling the devil's tales. She explains how she used to just cover her head with blankets and pray for the wheeze to stop, crying herself to sleep most nights. The last story that I'll mention for now again takes place in the same house. My great-grandfather was a policeman and often worked in a regular shift pattern. The house had a small hallway upon entering the front door, around five by five foot, just large enough for a coat rack and the stairs to begin. Immediately to your right when entering the front door was the living room. Most evenings after dinner, my grandmother would sit in the living room and listen to the radio with her sister while her mother knitted or sewed. Rather regularly, they would hear the front door unlock, open and close, the hall light switch flick on, and the rustle and knock of a coat being removed and thrown on the coat rack. My great-grandmother would say, Oh, that must be your father home, or something of the sort, before going to greet him in the hallway. On numerous occasions, though, they wouldn't be able to find him immediately and they would assume that he'd gone upstairs. They would go upstairs to welcome him home, but to no avail. There would also be no coat on the rack. And then, 15 or 20 minutes later, her father would arrive home. It just so happens that my grandmother found out years after moving out of that house 
that a single man had lived there alone for years and died in the very room that she slept in as a child. Apparently, he had some kind of respiratory condition. The Pacific Northwest is known for its lush landscapes, dense forests, and misty coastlines. But on one of my solo road trips through Washington State, I encountered something far more mysterious than the usual scenic vistas. I was driving along a coastal route, the ocean waves crashing against the cliffs to my right. As the afternoon sun began its descent, I approached a long suspension bridge named Elysian Crossing. I hadn't seen it on any map, but it seemed like a shortcut to the next town. As I began my ascent onto the bridge, a dense fog enveloped the area, reducing visibility to just a few meters. But halfway across, the fog cleared suddenly, revealing a breathtaking sight. A sprawling city on the horizon, its skyline unlike any I'd ever seen. Towering spires shimmered with golden light, and intricate buildings seemed to float above the water. Entranced, I continued driving, eager to explore this mysterious city. But as I reached the end of the bridge, a disorienting sensation washed over me. The city vanished, and I found myself back at the entrance of Elysian Crossing, the bridge stretching out before me once again. Confused, I pulled over at a nearby diner. The place was quaint, with a few locals sipping coffee at the counter. I asked the waitress about the bridge and the city I had seen. Her face turned pale. Oh, so you've seen the Mirage City, she whispered. She beckoned an older man, introduced as Mr. Lee, to join us. He began, Elysian Crossing has been here for as long as anyone can remember, and so have the tales of Mirage City. It's said to be a reflection of a city from another time, or perhaps another dimension. Those who see it are said to be chosen. Chosen for what? I asked. Mr. Lee shrugged. Some say it's a blessing, a glimpse into a utopian future. Others believe it's a warning, a reminder of the transients of our existence, but no one really knows. All that's certain is that you can't reach the city. Many have tried, only to find themselves back at the start of the bridge. I left the diner with more questions than answers. That night, I camped nearby, the silhouette of the Elysian Crossing visible from my tent. I dreamt of the Mirage City, its streets filled with people from different eras, all coexisting harmoniously. The next morning, I attempted to cross the bridge again, but the city didn't appear. It seemed my glimpse of the Mirage City was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I continued my journey through the Pacific Northwest, but the memory of the bridge and the city stayed with me. Whether it was a vision of a possible future or a mere trick of the light, the Elysian Crossing and its Mirage City served as a reminder of the mysteries that exist just beyond the veil of our understanding. This is one of my many experiences at St. Thomas Church. This one was about eight years ago. Probably not that scary compared to other things that I've experienced, but it was the first one that popped into my head. I went to a graveyard that had a church with four of my friends. One of my friends knew about it as he had come once before. The rest of us had never been. Now, my intention was to go there to see if I could genuinely talk to any spirits because of past experiences. Two of my friends, however, were the usual let's have a laugh and mock the dead type, while the other two were shitting themselves, as you do. We walked around for about 15 minutes and I was asking questions like, is anyone here that wants to talk? 
but it was hard with my two friends acting like idiots. So I just thought, okay, this is silly. I'll just stop. Now, just to be clear, two of the cars we took were right next to each other, about half a meter apart, with the big gates to the right of the cars, which is where you enter straight into the graveyard. We walked back to the cars, and I leaned against one car, and one friend next to me, on my left, and the other three leaned against the other car. Now we're all facing each other, just talking, when suddenly from the right of us, we hear this voice, almost like a child's voice, say, help me. I am not kidding. My friends and I all looked right in the same direction at the same time. All of our heads just turned, and we all went silent, giving each other that look like, what's going on? I said quietly to all of them, you heard that, right? Their faces said it all. Then about 30 seconds later, we heard it again. Help me. But it was a little bit fainter. My friends started to panic, and I was a little scared, but more curious. They opened their car doors so fast it wasn't funny. I don't blame them. I hopped in the back of my mate's car, the one that I was leaning on, and her car wouldn't start straight away. I looked out the window and my two mates in the other car had already sped off. I was trying to calm my friends down, who I was in the car with, but after about a minute the car started and my friend who was driving sped off screaming, I'm never coming back here again, while my friend in the passenger seat agreed. When we were off the road that leads to the graveyard, she slowed down, and I pulled my phone out to see if I could find anything about this graveyard, as I had never been before. I found out that there were two young twin brothers who used to play around there at the church, and attend with their family. One day they were playing and tried to play a prank. Something went wrong, and they both caught fire and burned to death. I swear that voice we heard sounded exactly like a young boy's voice. Creeped me out. I told my friends and they agreed. They also said that they would never go back there, and I can't blame them. Personally, I've been back four times now, and something has happened every time. So, my church is haunted, but there are areas that one might consider a hot spot. These areas are the first floor men's bathroom, the bridal room, and the baptistry, which is connected to the third floor bathrooms. After years of being the custodian's son and part-time custodian, my friend has experienced pretty much all the notable spirits and ghosts that are in the church. One of these spirits is little more than a mild inconvenience, due to the fact that it likes to throw a wet paper towel into an otherwise clean hallway. My friend had told me about this spirit's antics before the story I'm about to tell you occurred. My friend and I were around 16 when this happened. My friend was playing basketball with two other friends from church one day during summer break. This was midday, so there was no one else at the church, and the church remained locked until we decided to go in. Being the custodian's son, my friend had the key. While taking a break from playing, all three of my friends swore that they saw the blinds in one of the windows on the third floor move like someone had brushed their hand from top to bottom. Me, not being a big basketball person, was not at the church to witness this part. Immediately after they saw the blinds move, they called me to tell me that they were going to go inside to investigate if I would be interested in joining them. I was. I arrived a few minutes later and went inside. Obviously, being an old building, the church has a tendency to make noises, but some of these were very distinguishable footsteps. One of my buddies put his phone on the voice recorder and he sits it in the first pew of the sanctuary while we're wandering about the rest of the building, hoping to record some of the noises we keep hearing. We place the phone down and head to the third floor, 
Nothing paranormal occurs on our first pass, but for some reason we decide to take the exact same path we had just taken over and over. On our second go-round is when we noticed something strange. There's a broom propped up in the doorway of the men's bathroom on the third floor. This broom was without a doubt not there on our first pass. We don't think much of this until our third trek, which is when we notice that the broom is still in the doorway, but in a different position. The thing about it was that the broom had not slid out at the bottom, but had been stood up. We continued on this path maybe three to four more times. Each time, the broom had been moved to a different position in the same doorway. We decided that it's been long enough, so we go to check on the phone that my buddy had put in the sanctuary. We all go in and begin listening to the recording, when we finally realized how stupid of an idea it was, because there was no way to tell what was us and what wasn't. That is, until we hear a loud tap that was coming from just a few pews behind the phone. The tapping gets closer, and then one more tap even closer. Finally, we hear a triple tap on the screen of the phone. After listening to the recording, we decided to check on the broom one more time. As we reached the third floor, there are two very obvious things that have changed. One, the broom is now in a different doorway altogether. And two, there's a wet paper towel laying in the middle of the hallway in front of the men's restroom. My friend claims to have seen a reflection that wasn't ours in the window across the hall from us. And that's when we decided that we were done ghost hunting for the day. A couple of years later, one of my buddies is helping his dad, who's a plumber, renovate one of the bathrooms in the church. As they're headed to the bathroom, my buddy spots a familiar sight. In the middle of the hallway is a wet paper towel. My dog, Max, has always been a good judge of character. He's the kind of dog that would wag his tail at strangers, but growl if he sensed something off. So when he began barking at a specific corner of my room every night, I took notice. It started subtly. Every night around the same time, Max would grow restless. He'd pace around the room, his eyes fixated on the corner. Then he'd bark loud warning barks that would make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I'd check the corner, but there was never anything there. No bugs, no strange shadows, nothing. This routine continued for weeks. I tried rearranging the furniture, cleaning the corner thoroughly, even placing a small lamp there to dispel any shadows. But nothing worked. Max's nightly barking persisted. One evening, after a particularly long day, I was lying in bed, reading a book with Max by my side. As the clock neared the usual time, Max began to growl, his gaze fixed on the corner. I sighed, preparing myself for the inevitable barking, but this time was different. As I turned my head to look at the corner, my heart skipped a beat. There, standing amidst the dim light, was a shadowy figure. It was tall and slender, its form wavering as if made of smoke. It had no discernible features, just a dark silhouette that seemed to absorb the light around it. Frozen in fear, I could only watch as the figure slowly moved, its form shifting and swirling. Max's barks grew louder, more frantic. The figure seemed to acknowledge him, turning its head slightly in his direction. Gathering my courage, I reached for the lamp on my bedside table and switched it on. The room was flooded with light, and the shadowy figure vanished instantly. The following day, I contacted a local paranormal investigator, desperate for answers. He arrived with an array of equipment and began his investigation. After several hours, he sat me down and shared his findings. The corner of my room, he explained, had an unusually high electromagnetic reading. Such readings, he said, were often associated with paranormal activity. He believed that the shadowy figure was a residual entity, 
a remnant of some past event or emotion trapped in a loop. He performed a cleansing ritual using sage and salt and placed protective talismans around my room. As he worked, Max watched intently, occasionally wagging his tail. That night, for the first time in weeks, Max slept peacefully. The corner remained just a corner, devoid of any shadow figures. Days turned into weeks and the incident became a distant memory. Max's nightly barking ceased and the room felt lighter, more welcoming. I often wonder about the shadowy figure. What was its story? Why was it trapped in that corner? But some mysteries, I suppose, are best left unsolved, and all I know is that I'm grateful for Max, my loyal protector, always alert to the unseen dangers lurking in the shadows. The piercing shriek of a monitor alarm jolted me awake. I rushed down the hall to room 309, the source of the commotion. Rounding the corner, I saw the patient's heart monitor flashing a flat green line. Code blue, I called out. The rapid response team mobilized within seconds, crashing through the door prepared to resuscitate the patient. But as we entered, we found the patient sitting up in bed very much alive and very confused, breathing normally. He looked at us bewildered as his monitor continued to show no heart rhythm. Well, what's this all about? He asked hoarsely. The doctor quickly checked his pulse and found it steady. No CPR needed. After a manual reset, the monitor returned to normal. False alarm. Later at the nurse's station, we marveled at the bizarre malfunction but I knew better after hearing similar stories. Room 309's spiritual tenant wanted to test our response time. We passed this supernatural drill with flying colors. My heart still racing from the adrenaline rush, I said a little prayer of thanks that our patient was unharmed. As long as I'm working here, our ghostly resident can set off all the false monitor alarms they want. I'll always be ready for anything, paranormal or otherwise. The basement had always been a place of mystery in our old family home. Growing up, it was the realm of forgotten relics, dusty boxes, and childhood dares. But as an adult, tasked with clearing out the house after my parents decided to downsize, the basement became a chore. One afternoon, as I sifted through boxes of old photographs and trinkets, I stumbled upon an old tape recorder. It was heavy, its plastic casing yellowed with age. Curiosity peaked, I pressed play, expecting to hear a forgotten family memory or perhaps one of my childhood attempts at recording a radio show. Instead, a chilling voice filled the room. It was a man's voice, shaky and filled with desperation. Please, if anyone finds this, I need help. They're keeping me here. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. The message ended abruptly, replaced by static. My heart raced a cold sweat forming on my brow. The voice was unfamiliar, and the sheer terror in it was palpable. I immediately contacted the local police. They took the tape recorder, and after analyzing the recording, they began an investigation. The house had been in our family for generations, and no one could recall any incident or person that might be connected to the voice on the tape. Weeks turned into months, and the mystery deepened. The police were unable to identify the man or determine when the recording was made. The tape itself was old, but without a specific date or more information, leads were scarce. Determined to find answers, I began my own investigation. I scoured local newspapers and archives, 
looking for any mention of missing persons or mysterious events connected to our home. My search led me to a series of articles from the 1970s about a local man who had vanished without a trace. The man's photo bore a striking resemblance to a young version of a neighbor I remembered from my childhood, Mr. Grayson. I approached Mr. Grayson with my findings, and after some initial hesitation, he revealed a tale. In his youth, he had been involved with a group that dabbled in the dark side of the occult. Drawn in by the allure of forbidden knowledge, he soon found himself in over his head. The group, led by a charismatic but unhinged leader, believed in harnessing the energy of fear. Mr. Grayson had been chosen as their sacrifice, imprisoned and tormented to feed their dark rituals. One fateful night, he managed to escape, recording his plea on a tape recorder he found in the basement. He hid the recorder, hoping that somebody would find it and rescue him. But by the time he emerged from his hiding place, the group had disbanded, its members disappearing into the shadows. Traumatized, Mr. Grayson moved away, changed his identity, and tried to forget the past. He returned years later, believing the group was long gone and that he could find some semblance of peace. The revelation sent shockwaves through our community. The police reopened the investigation, and with Mr. Grayson's testimony, they were able to track down and apprehend the remaining members of the group. The tape recorder, once a forgotten relic, had unveiled a dark chapter in our town's history. It served as a haunting reminder of the secrets that can lurk beneath the surface, hidden in the shadows of the past, waiting for the light of truth to reveal them. As an ICU nurse, I've witnessed many patients pass, but Tony's death stunned me in a way that I still can't explain. He was a beloved grandfather in his late 60s, on life support after a major stroke. His chances were slim, but the family held out hope. Late one night during my shift, Tony's monitors suddenly started alarms. He had gone into cardiac arrest. We immediately started CPR, but the chaotic noise faded into the background as I tried to focus. The doctor began asking Tony questions trying to stimulate any remaining brain activity. Tony, can you hear me? If you can hear me, try to respond. To my shock, a weak voice croaked, Yes, doc, I'm still here. The doctor and I froze and looked at each other with wide eyes. The voice was clearly Tony's, but it was impossible. He had flatlined. Tony, are you in any pain? The doctor continued warily. Again, Tony's strained voice uttered, No, all the pain's gone now. My hands shook as I continued chest compressions. How was he speaking with no heart rhythm? Do you see anything around you, Tony? Any bright lights? Asked the doctor. No lights, just peaceful darkness, Tony responded. His voice grew fainter with each word. It's all right, Doc. My time's done. And please tell my family I love them. Then silence. Ten minutes later, we finally ceased efforts and called his time of death. But the chill from hearing a dead man's voice never left me. I avoided mentioning the supernatural event in my report. Who would believe a patient conversed while flatlined? I questioned my own sanity but deep down, I know what I heard. Since that night, I've paid closer attention as patients slip away. A few times, I'm certain that I've made out faint whispers of loved ones' names or gasped prayers long after the vitals ceased, their voices like wisps of vapor untethered from their bodies. Somehow, in those final moments between life and whatever lies beyond, there's an uncanny communication that technology can't detect. The monitor may show a flatline, but the spirit still stirs. 
Perhaps we put too much faith in our tools, and not enough in forces unseen. There's so much about the human spirit that eludes even our most advanced science. All I know is that day, Tony spoke to us beyond the veil of life, through a means unknown. His fading words will forever resonate. Wherever his spirit traveled next, I hope he found the peace he sought. For now, I keep monitoring the screen, but listening beyond it as well, honoring the mysterious ways the dying may speak their last pieces, even after the ship of life has sailed. Some ports of call lie beyond the reach of our maps. We can only have faith in the journey. It had been an exhausting day of meetings in Phoenix, and I was more than eager to make the drive back to my home in Flagstaff. The thought of my own bed was the only thing keeping me going as I sped down the empty highway. Arizona's night sky was something to marvel at, endless and filled with stars, a stark contrast to the city lights I'd left behind. I was about halfway through the journey when it happened. A flicker of light in the sky caught my attention. Not unusual, of course. Shooting stars are a common sight in these parts. But then another flicker followed, this time a bit longer, accompanied by two more bursts of light. My curiosity peaked, I pulled over to the side of the road to get a better look. I stepped out of the car, the cool desert air filling my lungs as I looked up. At first, there was nothing but the usual celestial panorama, but then I saw them. A series of lights, glowing orbs really, moving in a formation unlike any aircraft I had ever seen. They were perfectly synchronized, darting around in complex patterns that made my head spin. It lasted for maybe a minute, but it felt like an eternity. Then, as quickly as they had appeared, the lights shot upward and vanished, leaving me staring at an empty sky. I stood there, dumbfounded. I'm a rational person, or at least I'd like to think I am. But what I had just witnessed defied any rational explanation. I considered taking out my phone to record the phenomenon, but realized I'd been so awestruck that the thought hadn't even crossed my mind until it was too late. Climbing back into the car, I continued my drive home, my mind racing with questions. Had I just seen UFOs? A secret military operation or something else entirely? And why me? Why there, on that empty stretch of Arizona highway? The questions persisted long after I got home and crawled into bed. Sleep was elusive that night, and when it finally came, it was filled with dreams of lights in the sky, darting around in formations that seemed to spell out messages I couldn't quite decipher. In the days that followed, I scoured news reports and social media, looking for any mention of the mysterious lights, but found nothing. It was as if I had been the sole witness to this celestial ballet. That experience changed something in me. Whenever I look up at the night sky now, it's not just stars I see, but possibilities. Countless, endless possibilities that stretch as far as the universe itself. Whether those lights were extraterrestrial in nature or something else entirely, I may never know. But they serve as a constant reminder that the world is filled with mysteries. And sometimes, those mysteries choose to reveal themselves when you least expect it, under a sprawling canopy of an Arizona sky. Oasis Medical Center wasn't a place anyone would mistake for a retreat, despite its name. It was an old, rundown hospital built in the 60s, 
with updates so infrequent it was like stepping back in time. But a paycheck is a paycheck, and you take work where you can find it. I was an IT specialist by day, a position that often had me walking the endless maze of hallways to fix computers and other electronic equipment. The medical staff appreciated me, and I didn't mind the work until I started noticing the faces. The first time it happened, I was installing a software update on one of the heart rate monitors in room 417. Leaning over, I glanced at the screen, waiting for the loading bar to fill. And there, reflected in the glass, was a face. Not my face, mind you, but a face I didn't recognize. Old, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks, a man, or what used to be one. I spun around. The room was empty, except for the patient, an elderly woman asleep in her bed. The hairs on my arms stood up. But I told myself it was just stress, lack of sleep, whatever. I shook it off and finished the update. The next time, I was in the surgical ward, calibrating a piece of equipment I couldn't even pronounce. I bent down to adjust a dial when I saw another face in the reflective surface of the metal tray next to me. A young girl this time, with eyes too big for her face, staring at me like I had done something wrong. I jerked back, my heart pounding against my ribs. A nurse walked by, glancing curiously at me. You okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I muttered doubting the words even as I said them. This started happening more frequently. Faces in computer monitors. Faces in the glass panels of medicine cabinets. Faces in the reflective surfaces of surgical tools. Always when I was alone. Always when I least expected it. And always different. Men, women, young, old, eyes full of sadness, anger, or accusation. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I started digging through old hospital records, scouring news articles online, anything to give me some insight. What I found sent a chill down my spine. Over the years, Oasis Medical Center had an unusually high number of unexplained deaths. Patients who passed away under mysterious circumstances, with causes of death listed as inconclusive. Were these the faces I was seeing? Spirits trapped in the hospital, bound to the place where they had met their untimely end? I took my findings to management, but they dismissed me, saying that it was all hearsay and coincidences. They even hinted that if I kept it up, I would be let go. So I shut up, but I didn't stop looking. I was transferred to the night shift. Less staff, fewer questions. I spent my nights walking the dark halls, my ears straining for sounds, my eyes narrowed in concentration. I took to carrying a small pocket mirror, taking it out to glimpse reflections when I felt I was being watched. And that's when I saw her, the young girl, the one I'd seen in the surgical ward, reflected in my pocket mirror. She looked at me and pointed behind me. I turned around and there, on the computer monitor was a series of numbers. Medical records, a date, I didn't know. I documented everything, started putting pieces together, dates matching records and news articles. It was like a grim puzzle, each face corresponding to an unexplained death, each one a silent scream, a plea for justice. But what could I do? I was no detective, no avenger of spirits. Even now, as I sit in my makeshift office, surrounded by equipment that should be devoid of anything supernatural, I know I'm not alone. The faces are still there, glimpses in the glass, flickers on the screen. Are they asking me for my help or warning me? I don't know. All I know is that I can't escape them. Even as I write this, a reflection not my own stares back at me from the monitor's glass. It watches me, studies me, and for a brief moment, I swear it smiles. So I'm left with a choice. 
dig deeper, risk my job, my sanity, to give these lost souls a voice? Or turn away, leave the hospital, and hope that the faces in the glass are bound to this place, and not me? Each night, as I clock in and walk the dim corridors, I can't shake the feeling that my decision is no longer just about me. And in every reflection, I see eyes, watching, waiting, wondering what I'm going to do next. This is another story from my friend, the church custodian, and from the church that we both attend. My friend David and I were at his graduation party, and we were telling one of his other friends about some of the strange things that go on at our church. David's friend didn't really believe the stories, so we decided to take him to the church that night when we knew that nobody else would be there. We get to the church around 9 p.m., unlock the doors, and go in. All the lights are off, so we're going room to room, turning them on as we go. Almost immediately, we all hear footsteps on the floor above us. We finish going through the first floor, and as we're ascending the stairs, we hear the footsteps come to the top of the stairs, which is around a landing halfway up the staircase. In the window on the landing, we can clearly see an outline of what looks like a person. At this point, our friend had decided that he'd gotten enough proof to believe our stories and was ready to leave. We're standing in the parking lot, facing the door, arguing over who's going to have to go back in and turn all the lights off, when all of a sudden there are three very distinct taps on the nursery window. The nursery is on the second floor, and on the side of the building that we were facing. That made the decision about turning the lights out a little bit harder. Fun fact about the nursery. Once we got back to David's house, we were telling his mom, who's the actual custodian for the church, about what had happened. And she told us that she hated having to go into the nursery while she was alone due to the feelings she got in there. She also said that the old wooden rocking chair that was in there would almost always be rocking when she went in to clean. So she would go clean something else and wait for whoever was in the rocking chair to finish up. A few friends and I decided to book a small getaway up north for a week or so. We settled on a lovely converted church in the middle of nowhere, next to a small river near the sea. After a couple hours of driving to the place, we finally arrived and were faced with this small converted old church. It was beautiful, and we were sure we were going to have a great time. We opened the door and started to settle in. There was a log stove in the corner, and with it being September in Scotland, it was kind of chilly. I made sure that it was lit consistently. We cracked open some drinks and put on some music. Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast to be exact, but we never thought of the connection to the church. So we had our drinks and a great night. I had fallen asleep on the sofa. And I woke up through the night, but had this strange feeling of somebody watching me. I shrugged it off, thinking that it was just because of the strange surroundings, and that I was probably just uncomfortable in a new place. The next morning I woke up and decided to do all the dishes. While I was washing up, my friend came through and sat on the sofa. I had a dinner plate and a side plate in my hands, and turned around to put them on the counter, as I turned away, I saw the plates slide along the counter and nearly fall off. As you would expect, I grabbed them, but as I did, I felt some kind of energy push back at me. It was the weirdest feeling, kind of like being electrocuted but without the pain. I dropped the plates and stepped back in panic as my friend said, Are you okay? I just said, Yeah, I'm fine. 
because I didn't want to seem silly. What I realized, though, after it happened, was that I was wearing a Black Sabbath t-shirt. Most of the things that happened seemed to happen in connection with that band or something similar. My other friend came through then and remarked how cold it was in the room, which was strange because, as I mentioned before, I had the log burner stove going all the time. Again, I said nothing. A few days passed, and on the last night, my friend was tidying up as we were all in bed. We heard footsteps upstairs, but we thought it was just him, until we realized that he was washing dishes and hadn't been upstairs all night. It was a crazy week, and some other things happened, but those were the most serious. Growing up, I had an imaginary friend named Mr. Whispers. He was tall, with elongated limbs and a shadowy face, always obscured by the brim of his old-fashioned hat. As a child, I found comfort in his silent presence. He'd appear in my room, sitting in the corner, watching over me as I played with my toys or read books. Whenever I felt lonely or scared, I would talk to him, and even though he never spoke back, I always felt understood. As I grew older, Mr. Whispers faded away, becoming just a distant memory of my childhood. I went on to college, started a career, and settled into adulthood, leaving behind the whimsical beliefs of my youth. But a few months ago, things changed. I had just moved into a new apartment, and as I was unpacking, I stumbled upon an old drawing I had made as a child. It was a crude sketch of Mr. Whispers, his tall figure looming over a smaller depiction of me. Nostalgia washed over me, but it was accompanied by an uneasy feeling, a prickling sensation at the back of my neck. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard it, a soft rustling sound like fabric brushing against the floor. I turned on the bedside lamp and there he was, Mr. Whispers, standing in the corner of my room just as I remembered him. But something was different. His posture was more menacing, and the room felt colder. I tried to convince myself it was just a dream, a trick of my tired mind. But night after night he returned, and unlike the silent guardian of my childhood, this Mr. Whispers was more aggressive. Objects would move on their own, doors would slam shut, and I'd wake up with unexplained scratches on my arms. One particularly terrifying night, I woke up to find him hovering over my bed, his face inches from mine. For the first time, I heard his voice, a deep, guttural whisper. You left me behind. I decided to seek help. I contacted a local paranormal expert hoping to find answers. As I described my experiences, he listened intently, his expression growing more serious. Imaginary friends, he began, are often manifestations of child's emotions or desires, but sometimes they can be something more sinister, entities from another realm that latch on to the innocence of a child. He believed that Mr. Whispers was one such entity, and now that I had acknowledged him again, he had returned, stronger and more malevolent. The expert performed a cleansing ritual in my apartment using sage and chanting ancient incantations. As he worked, the atmosphere grew tense, and I could feel Mr. Whispers' anger. But as the ritual neared its end, there was a loud, piercing scream, and then silence. The expert left me with a protective talisman and instructions to keep it close. Entities like Mr. Whispers, he warned, are never truly gone. They wait for a moment of weakness to return. It's been weeks since that night, and I've had no further encounters with Mr. Whispers, but I often wonder about the nature of imaginary friends and the thin line between childhood fantasy and paranormal reality. I keep the talisman close, a constant reminder of the unseen world that lurks just beyond our perception.
When I was in high school in the 80s, there was this story about a local church in the country, long abandoned, that there were satanic gatherings every Sunday at midnight. The front door was painted red. There was a long dirt drive to the right of the church that led to an abandoned farmhouse. Legend had it that the farmer had killed his entire family one night. So an old stone church, no parking lot, cemetery directly in front of the church, and the dirt path on the right leading to the farm three miles away, on an unlit blacktop five miles away from any houses or main roads. I was 17 and my friends were 18. It was the summer after graduation. My friend Darla and I were driving around with her annoying friend Betsy who was sitting in the back seat. I was driving Darla's car and she was the passenger. It was around 11.30 p.m. when Darla and I decided that we should drive to the church just to see if the stories were true. Betsy freaked out in the back seat the entire way, and being young and immature, I wanted to either smack her or laugh the entire way there. Around 11.50, I pulled up and decided to scare Betsy by pulling onto the dirt lane. I was about a quarter of a mile in. Betsy freaked out. I was laughing. Darla was high. Two minutes later, I kid you not, a station wagon pulls into the drive behind us. At 11.53, on a Sunday night, it was two elderly people, around 80 years old, dressed in their Sunday best, both frail and white-haired. They stayed, and we discussed. Betsy said, oh my gosh, get us out of here. I said, there's no way out except backward. I wasn't going any further down the drive, and there was a cemetery to my left, a stone church at the upper left, and a thatch of trees to my right. We were effectively trapped. Darla said, do you think they're devil worshippers? No, I said. They're too old. Betsy screamed, haven't you seen Rosemary's baby? They were old. I'm trying to stay calm when another car pulls behind the station wagon. It's now 11.57 p.m. It's a brown Dodge. A young kid gets out, walks up to the old couple, and talks to them for a while. Okay, they know each other. Now I'm getting freaked out. I call out to the old man, can you please back up? Can you ask the guy behind you two? We'd like to leave. Thank you. Darla says the kid came to my window and threatened to stab me with a knife that he showed me. I don't remember that. The old man unleashed a torrent of curse words that I still don't understand. He called me all kinds of derogatory names, everything you can think of, telling me he didn't know the kid, so he couldn't be rude and ask the guy to move. His wife just sat there. I yelled, yes, you do know him. He just walked up to your car and talked to you. Then, suddenly, they both left. I peeled out and took off down the road. I didn't see their cars or lights, and it's a fairly straight road. Twenty seconds later, the kid jumps out of the bushes on the side of the road, right in front of the car. We screamed, I swerved, and we never went there again. Looking back, Darla and I must have been traumatized. I don't remember peeling backwards and getting us out of there. She doesn't remember the kid jumping in front of my car, and I don't remember the kid coming to my window with a knife. But between all of us in the car, we put the story together. Needless to say, it was the most bizarre and scary moment of my life. A month after Lucy's funeral, the first letter arrived. It was an ordinary Tuesday, filled with drizzling rain and the monotony of my nine-to-five job. The beige envelope stood out in the pile of bills and junk mail, and the handwriting caught my eye immediately. Cursive loops and intricate swirls. It was Lucy's handwriting. I opened it cautiously, my hands trembling a bit. The letter inside unfolded effortlessly as if it couldn't wait to spill its contents. 
It detailed a childhood memory, the time we'd build a treehouse in the backwoods behind our old house. The narrative was so precise that it felt like I was reliving the moment. The smell of the fresh cut wood, the feeling of scraped knees, the thrill of secrecy. Only Lucy and I knew about it. A lump formed in my throat. Lucy had died in a car accident. It was sudden and it was brutal. And here was a letter speaking in her voice about events only she would know. Over the next few weeks, more letters arrived. Each envelope was identical, each letter more intimate than the last. They recalled secrets we'd shared, fights we'd had, and the intricate bonds we'd formed as sisters. The letters never explained where they came from, and there was never a return address. It felt both comforting and unsettling to read these letters, comforting because in those moments I could almost hear Lucy's laughter and feel her presence. Unsettling because with each letter, the walls of reality seemed to thin and I started questioning my own sanity. I decided to confront my family, but when I showed the letters to my mother, her eyes filled with a blend of hope and sorrow, as if she wanted to believe but couldn't afford to. My dad just shook his head, muttered about forgeries, and retreated to his home office. The final letter broke the pattern. It described the night Lucy left the house for the last time, how she was running late, how she'd forgotten her lucky charm bracelet. The bracelet had been a gift from me, and it was something she never took off. Yet after the accident, we couldn't find it. In the letter, Lucy wrote that she had wished she'd turned back to get it, almost did, but decided against it. The last line was, take care of mom and dad, Soph, and take care of yourself. I miss you. I didn't receive any more letters after that. It was as if Lucy had said her final goodbye, making peace with her untimely departure. I found myself torn between relief and an aching emptiness, as if a chapter had closed but left me holding a book with missing pages. Months later, while cleaning the attic, I stumbled upon a small, tarnished box. Inside, cushioned on a bed of faded velvet, was Lucy's lucky charm bracelet. I still don't know how it got there, wedged between old yearbooks and dusty Christmas decorations. And maybe I'll never know, but that's okay. Maybe some questions are better left unanswered. Back in 2018, I met a sweet girl at my church. I'm going to call her Lily for the sake of this story, as I don't want to reveal her personal information. We became pretty good friends. We would sit with each other or nearby every service. We attended canned food drives to help others around Thanksgiving. And we sat together with a few older couples at church during lunches. But outside of being close church friends, we weren't really that close outside of that context. At one point, we had each other's Snapchats before I deleted it. The week before my birthday, I went to church as normal, ate breakfast with another friend of mine and her kids, and I made my way to the sanctuary. I saw Lily sitting on the right-hand side of the aisle, and I sat next to her. We talked for a bit, and then service began. However, halfway through, she got a phone call and left the church. She didn't come back, so I figured that maybe she had a family emergency or had to go to work early. I finished up at church, talked to my pastor and his family, and I headed home to give a couple piano lessons. Nothing else odd or weird crossed my mind, though. I just carried on with my week until next Sunday. The following Sunday was my birthday. I was excited because it was my golden birthday, the year of 25. I don't usually like celebrating my birthday, but this was going to be a good one. I'm a newlywed, spending the day with my husband, having my favorite coconut cream pie instead of cake. I still wanted to go to church that morning, though. I love my church and church family and spending time with them. 
From the minute the church doors opened, everything was off. I walked down to the basement and had a cup of cold coffee, a bagel, and I noticed a few people around me were just pale, cold. I can't even properly describe the sadness on their faces. I'm a pretty introverted person, so I didn't ask any questions. I just went back upstairs to the sanctuary and waited for the service to start. My pastor walked up to the podium with tears in his eyes. He began to tell us about how there was a tragedy within the church. Lily had taken her own life the weekend prior, Friday night to be specific. I started crying uncontrollably. I had no idea she was dealing with that, and I felt like an awful friend. We had a beautiful service dedicated to her before her funeral. We all sang songs that she loved, prayed for her mother and family, and prayed for her. I left right after church, and I went straight home. I didn't think about the details of her death because it was just too much. A few hours later, though, I remembered, the Sunday before, I saw her at church. How is that possible, though? She passed away Friday night, but I somehow saw her on Sunday. I sat right next to her. I had a conversation with her before services. I watched her answer her phone and walk out. I became angry, scared, disappointed, depressed. Every emotion that comes with losing a friend at such a young age. I fell into a hole. After I had grieved and prayed for a couple of days, something came to me. My church does live streams, and there would be a clear view of our service and us sitting next to each other. I logged on to my Facebook, found my church's page, and started searching for the date that I had last seen her. The strangest part of everything is that every live stream is in chronological order, so I figured it would be pretty easy to find. But to this day, I still haven't found it. I asked the person in charge of recording and uploading the sermons on Facebook where it was, and he said that somehow there were technical difficulties that day, and they were unable to stream the service or even capture any of the audio. I've racked my brain for months. To this day, I feel as if she was at church Sunday to say goodbye to me. I asked other members if they had seen her the week before, and all have said that they couldn't remember if they had, or they'll just correct me, saying, Honey, she passed away last Friday night. There's no way she would have been here. My church is fairly small, and we only have a morning Sunday service, so there's no possible way that I could have gotten the days mixed up. I've had many ghost encounters in my life, way too many to count. But this one hits the hardest. I wish I had more answers than I do, or some kind of proof, but I don't. I didn't have any eerie feeling when I last talked to her. She didn't feel like a ghost or an apparition. It felt like every other time, like she was really there, without a doubt. I hope that one day I can find some answers, an explanation of some sort. But for now, I have to keep telling myself that this is how Lily decided to say goodbye to me, and I have to learn to be okay with that. The host, Mrs. Waverly, was a kind elderly woman with a warm smile. She handed me the keys to room 13, a cozy space on the second floor overlooking the gardens. The room was beautifully decorated with vintage wallpaper, antique furniture, and a comfortable four-poster bed. Exhausted, I quickly settled in and drifted off to sleep. The night was restless. I was plagued by dreams of a young woman in period clothing, wandering the halls of the inn, her face etched with sorrow. In the dream, she would always lead me back to room 13, pointing to a portrait on the wall, her eyes pleading. I awoke with a start, the first rays of dawn filtering through the curtains. Shaken by the vividness of the dream, I noticed the portrait from my dream hanging on the wall. It was the same young woman, her gaze hauntingly familiar. Over breakfast, I struck up a conversation with Mrs. Waverly, 
casually mentioning the portrait in room 13. Her face turned pale, her cheerful demeanor replaced by a look of concern. You stayed in room 13? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I nodded, recounting my dream. Mrs. Waverly took a deep breath and began to share a tale that had become local legend. The young woman in the portrait was Lillian, the daughter of the original owners of the inn. She had fallen in love with a guest, a young artist who had stayed in room 13. Their love was passionate but short-lived, as he was called away to war and never returned. Heartbroken, Lillian spent her days in room 13, waiting for her love's return, until she passed away from a broken heart. After her death, guests reported strange occurrences in room 13, whispers in the night, fleeting glimpses of a figure in period clothing, and dreams of Lillian's tragic tale. The disturbances became so frequent that the room was closed off, left untouched for years. Mrs. Waverly, realizing her oversight in giving me the keys to that room, apologized profusely. But I reassured her, expressing my desire to help Lillian find peace. That evening, with the guidance of a local medium, we held a seance in room 13. The air grew cold as we reached out to Lillian, offering her solace and understanding. The medium conveyed a message from Lillian, expressing her gratitude for being remembered and her desire to be reunited with her lost love. As the seance concluded, the atmosphere in the room shifted, a sense of calm settling over everything. The portrait of Lillian seemed to glow, her expression one of peace and contentment. From that day on, room 13 was no longer off limits. Guests who stayed there reported feeling a gentle presence, a guardian spirit watching over them. The Briarwood Inn became not just a and b but a testament to the enduring power of love. A reminder that even in death, our stories continue, waiting for someone to listen and remember. I've always been fascinated by my family history, which led me on a journey to a remote village in Connemara, Ireland. My family's roots were supposedly traced back to this quaint, picturesque place. The village was the kind of place where time seemed to stand still, with rugged landscapes and a deep sense of history. I visited the local parish to learn more about my ancestors. The parish priest was kind enough to let me look through the old records. I spent hours poring over dusty ledgers and faded manuscripts, tracing back generations of my family. But as I delved deeper, I stumbled upon something unsettling. There were records from the late 1800s that hinted at a sinister secret in the village. It seemed that several of my ancestors were involved in some sort of dark pact or ritual. The details were vague, but it was clear that it was something the village wanted to forget. The more I asked around, the more I felt a resistance from the locals. It was as if there was an unspoken agreement to keep the past buried. However, an elderly villager eventually confided in me. She spoke of an old legend, a tale of a pact made with a malevolent force that promised prosperity in return for unspeakable acts. The legend was tied to my family, and the impact of their actions seemed to linger in the village. Strange occurrences, unexplained disappearances, and a lingering sense of unease were all mentioned in hushed tones. I left the village with more questions than answers. The beautiful landscapes of Connemara now seemed to hide a dark, troubled past. The truth about my family's history was more complex and disturbing than I had ever imagined. Back home, I often think about that village and the secret it's guarding. It's a reminder that sometimes, in searching for our roots, we may uncover truths that are darker than we're prepared to face. Connemara will always be a part of my history,
but now it's a place shrouded in mystery and shadowed by a past that refuses to be forgotten. It began a few nights after I settled in. I was tucked into bed, the house silent, save for the occasional creaks and groans of its old bones. Just as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard it, footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps echoing down the hallway outside my bedroom door. I sat up, straining my ears. The footsteps continued, growing louder, closer, my heart raced as I considered the possibilities. Was there an intruder? But I had locked all the doors and windows. Gathering my courage, I flung open the bedroom door, expecting to confront someone. But the hallway was empty. The footsteps had stopped, replaced by an eerie silence. I checked every room, every possible hiding spot, but found no one. I tried to dismiss the incident as a product of my imagination, perhaps amplified by the stress of the move, but the footsteps returned the next night. And the night after that, always at the same time, always the same slow, echoing pace. Sleep became elusive. The anticipation of the nightly footsteps filled me with dread. I even set up cameras in the hallway, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever was causing the sounds. But every morning, when I reviewed the footage, the hallway remained empty, even though the footsteps were clearly audible. Desperate for answers, I turned to my neighbors. An elderly couple, Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, lived next door and had resided in the area for decades. Over a cup of tea, I hesitantly shared my experiences. Mrs. Thompson exchanged a glance with her husband before speaking. This house has a history, she began. Many years ago, a young man lived there. He'd return home late every night, his footsteps echoing in the hallway as he made his way to his room. One fateful night, he never made it home. He was involved in a tragic accident and died. She paused, her eyes distant. They say that sometimes, places remember. The house remembers his footsteps, his nightly routine. It's as if it's stuck in a loop, replaying that sound over and over. I was taken aback. The idea that my house was echoing the past, that it was haunted by memories rather than spirits, was both fascinating and unsettling. Determined to break the cycle, I sought the help of a local medium. She performed a ritual, filling the house with the scent of sage and lavender. She spoke to the house, urging it to let go of the past, to find peace. That night, as the usual hour approached, I waited with bated breath, but the footsteps never came. The house was finally silent. Weeks turned into months, and the memory of the nightly footsteps began to fade. The house, once echoing with the sounds of a bygone era, now resonated with my own memories and experiences. But sometimes, in the stillness of the night, I think about the young man and the imprint he left behind. It's a haunting reminder of the thin line between the past and the present, and how places, just like people, can hold on to memories long after they're gone. I never really gave much credence to stories about the unexplained or the supernatural. Ghosts, UFOs, cryptids. I lumped them all into the category of campfire tales and tabloid fodder. But one late night drive through the desolate stretches of Arizona's highways changed all that. I was traveling from Flagstaff, a drive I'd made countless times before. It was around 1 a.m. and the night was as clear as it gets the sky peppered with stars. The highway was empty, save for the occasional truck or car that would zoom past, a fleeting encounter with another soul in this vast, 
dark expanse. My playlist was running low on songs and my caffeine high was starting to wear off. I told myself another hour and I'd be in Flagstaff, out of this car, in bed. That's when I saw it. The shape, or rather shapes, far ahead on the road. As I got closer, the shapes started to take form. They looked like animals, but not any animals I'd seen before. They were large, too large to be coyotes, and their gait was awkward, kind of hunched and erratic. I slowed down as I approached them. They seemed to be crossing the highway, completely unbothered by my car. The first instinct was to grab my phone and snap a picture, but as I reached for it, one of the creatures turned its head to look at me. Its eyes glowed an eerie, unnatural shade of yellow. I froze, my hand hovering over the phone. The look in those eyes was unsettling, inexplicably so. It wasn't just animal curiosity. It was almost as if it recognized me, or recognized that I recognized it. And then, as swiftly as they had appeared, they were gone, disappearing into the scrub and cacti on the side of the road. I sat there, still slowed to a near halt, my hands trembling on the wheel. I drove off, my heart pounding and my mind racing. Rational explanations came and went. Desert barrages, maybe? Or perhaps they were just animals distorted by the dark and my own sleepy imagination. Yet that look, that haunting, penetrating gaze stayed with me. When I finally got to Flagstaff, I couldn't shake off the unease. I looked up local legends and folklore about Arizona's highways and found tales of skinwalkers, shape-shifting creatures from Native American folklore. Could that be what I encountered? I didn't know, and I wasn't sure I wanted to find out. Since that night, I have avoided driving that stretch of highway, always opting for alternative routes even if they add time to my journey. I've also stopped scoffing at tales of the unexplained. After all, there are things out there in the dark, lonely roads of Arizona that defy understanding, and I've seen them with my own eyes. My brother Amir and I were inseparable. Growing up, we shared secrets, dreams, and countless memories. But life has its cruel twists, and a car accident took Amir away from me two years ago. The grief was overwhelming, and I struggled to find a way to move on without him. One evening, as I was reminiscing about our childhood, my phone buzzed with a new message. The sender's name sent a chill down my spine. Amir. The message read, Find my diary, under the old oak. I stared at the screen, my heart racing. It had to be some sick joke, I thought. Someone must have gotten hold of Amir's old phone or number. I tried calling the number, but it went straight to voicemail. The next day, another message arrived. Please, it's important. Remember our treehouse? The mention of the treehouse struck a chord. Amir and I had built a treehouse in the massive oak tree at the back of our childhood home. It was our secret hideout, a place where we shared our deepest thoughts and dreams. Driven by a mix of curiosity and hope, I decided to visit our old home. The property had been sold after our parents passed away, but the new owners were kind enough to let me explore the backyard when I explained the situation. The treehouse was still there, though weathered by time. Climbing up, memories flooded back. And there, hidden beneath a loose floorboard, I found a small, leather-bound diary. The diary was filled with Amir's handwriting, detailing his thoughts and experiences over the last few months of his life. As I flipped through the pages, one entry caught my attention. It spoke of a dream he had, where he'd passed away but was able to communicate with me through messages. He wrote of his wish for me to find this diary, to understand his feelings, and to find closure. T. 
tears streamed down my face as I read his words. It felt as though Amir was right there beside me, guiding me one last time. Over the next few days, I pored over the diary, reliving memories and gaining insight into Amir's world. It was a therapeutic experience, helping me come to terms with his loss and understanding the depth of our bond. The messages stopped after I found the diary. I never figured out how they were sent or who was behind them. But deep down, I wanted to believe it was Amir, reaching out from beyond to offer comfort and closure. I kept the diary, cherishing it as a final gift from my brother. It served as a reminder of our bond and the belief that love transcends even the barriers of life and death. When I first toured the apartment, I was immediately drawn to its spacious rooms, high ceilings, and large windows that let in an abundance of natural light. However, there was one peculiarity, a locked door in the hallway. The landlord, a middle-aged man with a somewhat nervous demeanor, quickly brushed off my inquiries about it, saying it was just an old storage room, nothing to be concerned about. I moved in, excited to start this new chapter in my life. The first few days were uneventful, filled with unpacking and decorating. But then the noises began. Every night, precisely at midnight, I'd hear it. Soft, persistent scratching coming from behind the locked door. It started as a faint sound, almost like the scurrying of a mouse. But as days turned into weeks, it grew louder, more desperate. Curiosity and unease growing, I approached my landlord again, pressing him for more information about the room. He hesitated, then finally relented, sharing a story that had become something of an urban legend in the building. Years ago, the apartment had been occupied by a reclusive artist. He was rarely seen, always engrossed in his work. Rumors swirled about his obsession with a particular piece, a project he kept hidden in that very room. One day, he disappeared without a trace, leaving behind all his belongings. The only sign of his presence was the locked room, from which strange noises could be heard. The landlord admitted that no one had been able to open the door since, and over time it was simply accepted as a quirk of the building. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to take matters into my own hands. With the help of a locksmith, the door was finally opened, revealing a dimly lit room covered in a thick layer of dust. The walls were adorned with various paintings, each more haunting than the last, but the centerpiece was a large canvas in the middle of the room. It depicted a dark, shadowy figure, its form almost human, but with elongated limbs and sharp, claw-like fingers. The background was a chaotic blend of colors, giving the impression of movement and turmoil. As I stared at the painting, a chilling realization washed over me. The scratching noises, the desperate sounds. It was as if the figure was trying to escape the confines of the canvas. Wanting to rid my home of this eerie presence, I contacted an art historian, hoping to gain insight into the painting's origins. She was fascinated by the piece, noting its unique style and the palpable energy it exuded. After extensive research, she discovered that the artist had dabbled in the dark side of the occult, using his work as a medium to channel and trap restless spirits. The shadowy figure in the painting was believed to be one such entity bound to the canvas by the artist's dark rituals. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I sought the help of a spiritual expert. He performed a cleansing ritual, releasing the trapped spirit from the painting and ensuring it could no longer harm anyone. The painting was safely stored away, and the room was sealed once more. The nightly scratching ceased, and a sense of peace returned to the apartment. 
The experience served as a reminder of the power of art and the thin line that separates our world from the unknown. It taught me that some doors, both literal and metaphorical, are best left unopened, and that behind every locked door lies a story waiting to be told. I'm currently seeking some insight into a strange event that happened in my past. I'm hoping for possible explanations related to cryptids or paranormal phenomena, so I can understand what happened. This occurred back when I was living in Seymour, Indiana, when I was about eight or nine years old. I was spending my day at a playground located near the apartment complex where I lived. In my playtime, I distinctly heard my mom's voice calling out to me from a direction entirely opposite to where she was at the moment. Baffled, I went to confirm that it was her, only to be told that she had not called me. I went back to playing and I didn't hear the voice again. What puzzles me are actually a few aspects of this experience. First, my mom was situated a substantial distance away from me, probably about four or five minutes away. Yet the voice that mimicked hers seemed to come from an identical distance, but in the complete opposite direction. Secondly, I have no prior history of hallucinations in my life. I initially shared this story before, but I got more questions than answers. Hopefully somebody knows what this might be. Skinwalker doesn't seem to fit the description, at least based on what I understand, but some kind of mimicry was at play. At the station, there was this old gear collection, a makeshift museum of firefighting history. Helmets, hoses, and nozzles from decades past were arranged in a glass case near the entrance. Among them was a classic leather helmet, one that had belonged to a firefighter who died in the line of duty in the 1980s. I'd never paid it much attention, until one day when my standard issue helmet was damaged during training. While waiting for a new one, I took the old leather helmet from the display, just to cover shifts until the replacement arrived. It looked worn but sturdy, a relic from a bygone era that had seen its share of flames. The first time I put it on, I heard them, distant cries for help, coming from a direction I couldn't pinpoint. We were at the station, not out on a call. My buddies lounging around me heard nothing, their conversations rolling on uninterrupted. I took the helmet off, and the voices vanished. During a house fire two days later, it happened again. Amid the crackling of burning wood and the hissing of water jets, I heard the cries. They were desperate but distant, as if floating from some far-off dimension. I told my crew, but they brushed it off, attributing it to the stress of the job, or maybe some strange acoustics. It wasn't just cries. Sometimes I heard fragments of conversations, urgent snippets like, this way, or can't hold on much longer. I knew it wasn't radio interference. It was something else, something deeply unsettling. My skepticism started to wane. After each shift wearing the helmet, I found myself researching old fire incidents, trying to identify the source of the voice, the hidden tragedy that seemed to be crying out for recognition. I came across news articles about the firefighter who originally wore the helmet, a guy named Mike, who died rescuing a family trapped in a burning apartment building. His body was found near the children's room, almost as if he'd been trying to make one final heroic act. I couldn't escape the thought that Mike's presence, or some echo of it, remained in that helmet. I felt as if I were being guided or warned, though I couldn't tell which. It was as though the cries were drawing me closer to something I couldn't quite grasp. The last time I wore the helmet, 
we were called to a massive fire at an old factory. It was a difficult operation, full of risks and unknowns. Inside, through the dense smoke and intense heat, I heard the cries again, this time more distinct, more urgent. They seemed to emanate from the heart of the inferno, from a place no one could survive. Guided by the voice, I discovered a man trapped under debris. It was in an area we hadn't searched yet, a place we might have overlooked. As we pulled him out, I heard the voice one last time, a faint whisper that sounded like, thank you. After that night, the voices stopped. My new helmet arrived, and I returned the old one to its glass case, next to the faded photographs and memorabilia of firefighters past. I often look at it when I walk by, feeling a strange mix of gratitude and mystery that I can't fully explain. But deep down, I believe Mike had something to do with it. His final act of heroism from beyond the grave. Motorcycling had always been my escape. The feeling of the wind against my face, the roar of the engine beneath me, the freedom of the open road. It was therapeutic. One sunny afternoon, I decided to take a ride through the scenic routes of Pennsylvania. My destination was a series of tunnels, known locally as the Timeless Tunnels, due to their old world charm. As I approached the first tunnel, I noticed its stone walls were covered in moss, and the entrance was darker than I expected. The moment I entered, an eerie silence enveloped me. The usual echo of the motorcycle engine inside a tunnel was absent. It felt as though the tunnel was swallowing sound itself. Emerging on the other side, I was met with a sight that made my heart skip a beat. The world outside was different. The modern cars I was used to seeing were replaced by vintage models from the 1950s. The billboards showcased products and movies from that era. People were dressed in styles long out of fashion. Confused, I pulled over at a nearby diner. The sign read, Betty's Diner, in neon lights. And a jukebox played tunes from artists like Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry. I took off my helmet and walked in, hoping to find some answers. The patrons looked at me curiously, my modern riding gear clearly out of place. I took a seat at the counter, and a waitress in a polka-dotted dress came over. What can I get you, hon? She asked with a smile. I ordered a coffee, trying to gather my thoughts. What's today's date? I finally asked. She raised an eyebrow, but answered, July 12, 1956. I choked on my coffee. It was impossible. Just moments ago, I was in 2023. I tried to explain my situation to the waitress, but she laughed it off, thinking it was a joke. Determined to understand what had happened, I decided to explore this version of the world. Over the next few days, I experienced the 1950s in all its glory. I danced to rock and roll, watched movies at drive-in theaters, and even attended a local fair. The world was simpler, the pace slower, and there was a sense of community everywhere I went. But as the days turned into weeks, a longing for my own time grew. I missed the conveniences of modern technology, the diversity and progress of the 21st century, and most importantly, my family and friends. One evening, as I was riding, I decided to revisit the tunnel, hoping it might hold the key to returning to my time. As I approached, the same eerie silence from before enveloped me. I rode through, holding my breath, and as I emerged on the other side, I was met with the familiar sights and sounds of 2023. Relief washed over me. I headed straight home, hugging my loved ones a little tighter that night. The experience in the tunnel and the 1950s remains the most surreal event of my life. I often wonder if it was a dream, a glitch in the fabric of time, or a glimpse into an alternate universe. But the memories are as vivid as any other, and I cherish the lessons I learned during my brief time in the past. 
The world has changed in countless ways over the decades, but the essence of humanity remains the same. And while it's essential to progress and look forward, sometimes a glance back can provide valuable perspective on the journey ahead. The road trip was supposed to be straightforward. My family and I were traveling through the French countryside, heading towards the coast for a summer vacation. But when a fallen tree blocked our path, we were forced to take a detour. The narrow, winding road led us through dense woods before opening up to reveal a quaint village nestled in a valley. Stone cottages with thatched roofs lined the streets, and a crystal clear stream flowed through the center. It was picturesque like something out of a fairy tale. But what struck us most was the silence. There were no cars, no modern machinery. Instead, horses and carts moved along the cobblestone streets, and the villagers went about their tasks dressed in clothing that seemed centuries old. Curious, we decided to explore. The villagers were friendly, greeting us with warm smiles, but there was a hint of confusion in their eyes as if they weren't used to outsiders. We entered a small inn, hoping to grab a bite to eat. The interior was lit by candles, and the menu was handwritten on a chalkboard. As we ate, we chatted with the innkeeper, trying to learn more about the village. It's called Valombre, he said. We're a simple community, living off the land, just as our ancestors did. But why isn't Valombre on any map, I asked. The innkeeper looked uneasy. We've always been here, but the world outside, it seems to have forgotten us. As we continued our exploration, we noticed other oddities. There were no phones, no electricity. The village seemed trapped in time, untouched by modern advancements. At the village square, we met an elderly woman named Isabel. She spoke of Valombra's history, of a curse that had been placed on the village centuries ago by a scorned witch. The curse trapped the village in a timeless loop, preventing it from moving forward. The outside world changes, but Valombre remains the same, Isabel said with a sigh. We're trapped in this moment, forever. The weight of her words settled over us. The beauty of Valombra, with its old world charm, was overshadowed by the realization that its inhabitants were prisoners of time. As evening approached, we decided to leave, promising Isabel and the others that we'd find a way to break the curse. But as we drove away, the village began to fade, disappearing into the mist until it was gone entirely. We tried to retrace our steps, but the path to Valombre had vanished. It was as if the village had never existed Back in the modern world, we searched for any record of Valombre, but found nothing. It was a mystery, a place lost to time. But we never forgot the village or its inhabitants. And every year, on the anniversary of our visit, we'd gather as a family and light a candle, hoping that somewhere in a timeless pocket of the world, Valombre and its people would find their way to freedom. The winding dirt road cut through the dark, dense forest as Andrea and I drove in uneasy silence. I had suggested we take this back road shortcut through the woods to get away for the weekend. But now regret gnawed at me as the encroaching trees and deepening dusk transformed the drive into an unsettling journey into the unknown. Andrea gazed out her window nervously as the gravel path twisted ever deeper into the gloom remind me why we're taking this way again? It's just a bit of scenic back road, that's all, I replied with a confidence I didn't feel. I flipped on the headlights, casting faint illumination onto the road ahead. It'll take us right to the cabin by the lake. Uh-huh, 
Andrea said skeptically. She was right to be apprehensive. Even I was growing uneasy, though I couldn't place why. These were just harmless rural woods, I told myself. But as we continued down the narrow lane, the forest seemed to close in oppressively. Strange noises echoed from the shadowy trees, raspy whispers, distant shrieks. It must be animals, I thought, tamping down the prickle of fear on my neck. Did you hear that? Andrea whispered, voicing my own dread. It's nothing, probably just some weird bird, I said, trying to sound casual. But then through the dense trees, I spotted a faint flickering glow up ahead. Look, there's a clearing. Let's check it out. Eager for any diversion from the creeping forest, I veered off towards the light. We parked at the edge of a large moonlit glade. Andrea peered nervously into the dark woods surrounding the open space. I have a bad feeling about this place, she began, but her words trailed off as we both stared in awe and confusion. There in the clearing stood at least two dozen ghostly figures clad in long robes and peaked hoods. Their forms glowed with an ethereal sheen as they shuffled silently into a circle, carrying lit candles. Together, the phantoms began to chant in a long-forgotten tongue, their hollow voices overlapping in a hypnotic drone. What the hell? I breathed. Andrea gripped my arm eyes fixed on the ritual unfolding before us. We huddled by the car like intruders as the candlelight illuminated the specters' shadowed faces inside their hoods. Then the tempo of the chanting quickened. The circle of entities swayed and convulsed as if building toward an occult crescendo. Andrea and I watched, paralyzed. The air buzzed with frightening energy that set my teeth on edge. We need to get out of here now, Andrea urged in a frantic whisper. Despite my fascination, I knew she was right. We were witnessing something ancient and evil that we were not meant to see. I turned the key and the car's engine roared to life, shattering the ghostly ritual's trance. The entities froze, their empty gazes finding us through the trees. Moving as one, they glided swiftly toward us, candles blowing out in a sudden gust of wind. Go! Andrea screamed. I slammed the car into gear and hit the gas, fishtailing onto the gravel road as the phantoms converged on the glade behind us. Heart pounding, I careened down the dark path until the spectral ceremony faded into the distance. At last we reached the main highway, welcomed by the glow of street lamps. The entity-infested forest lay miles behind us. Still shaken, Andrea and I continued on toward the cabin and tried to make sense of what we'd witnessed in that isolated clearing. Some ancient sect gathering to recreate their profane ceremonies, only visible under the full moon? Or ghosts eternally reenacting a dark ritual that bound them to those woods? We may never understand the secrets that lurk down winding wood drive. But we know to never again take that unholy shortcut through the forest. The entities that dwell there are not meant for living eyes. This happened outside of Hillsboro, Illinois. The story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town, randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working and just chat. Not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tiege, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tiege told me that he heard a rumor of some weird lights out at an old cemetery, just outside of town. Tiege was a pathological liar, 
so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started backing up what Tej was saying, so I told them that as soon as I finished cleaning up the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at about one in the morning. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck. So the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to the cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck. So I parked the truck right in front of the bridge. Tiege told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out. At this point, I didn't really trust Tiege and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at two in the morning. So I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes passed and we started to see fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could see them even in the woods around us. I asked Tiej if those were the lights he saw, but before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill and I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been for moving around in the woods where trees were blocking their light. I started freaking out and I was screaming at both of them and said that if they were playing some kind of prank, it wasn't funny and I was leaving. I tried to turn the truck back on, but it turned once and then died. Tiej had a shocked look on his face, which only made me more anxious. At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas when turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up then and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge, and it had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew that I needed to get out of there. Tiege was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted to see this thing, that he wanted to see this thing to get closer, but I wasn't listening. I was shaking as I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we'd come. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tiege and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer, searching to see if I could find any explanation as to what I saw. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? I had no idea. It all seemed like BS to me, honestly, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her to the cemetery, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge and walked up the hill and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on the tombstones, flashlights, even footprints around the muddy woods, but we didn't see anything that could explain what I had seen the night before. The cemetery was also too far away from any major road for it to have been car headlights. I still don't know what we saw that night, but I get goosebumps every single time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me to keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens in the world. And maybe that lesson was worth it. Today, my mom told me a story that happened in December of 2019. She works at a hospital. 
I found her story quite unsettling. Just for backstory, I'm from Catalonia, Spain. My mom is a doctor who works in a public hospital as a radiologist. She has no mental illnesses and is overall healthy, and the building is in good condition. No gas leaks or anything like that. So her story went like this. She has a friend who went to her workplace to have some mammographies done. Everything goes on as usual, and when they're done, my mom goes to an adjacent room's computer, room N4, where the images have been sent. She closes the door after her. No more than 30 seconds later, she hears the doorknob turning violently, as if somebody is desperately trying to enter the room. At first she thought it was her friend, so she yelled, come in. Note that the doors have lead protection to avoid ionizing radiations piercing through. The knob just kept turning. They were shaking it as well, so she yelled again, come on in. She thought how rude it was of them to act like this. It was then when she realized her friend couldn't be there as she was putting her clothes back on and there was no way she already had. She explicitly told me that she had the feeling that nobody would be behind the door when she opened it, so that was it. She quickly opened it and sure enough, nobody was there. There have been a couple more incidents around that room too. For example, one night there were two doctors with my mom when suddenly one of her co-workers witnessed an ecography gel bottle flying at extreme speeds against a wall. There was nobody there, just the three of them. They were all astonished. I know this sounds a bit too cliche-like, maybe because I'm not experienced, but I can assure you that she didn't make this up. One of her co-workers says that there's something wrong with that floor as well. I really don't know what to think. My eyes were already heavy, the dashboard clock flashing 2.37 a.m. as my car cruised along the near-empty Arizona highway. I had been driving from Tucson to Sedona for a long overdue solo retreat. The road was a dark ribbon flanked by towering saguaros and jagged hills. The only light coming from my headlights and the occasional star that peeked through the cloudy sky. I was reaching for my thermos of coffee when it happened. The radio, which had been playing a soft country tune, suddenly erupted into static. Annoyed, I fumbled with the dials, trying to find another station, but to no avail. And that's when I saw her, a woman in white, on the side of the road. Startled, I stepped on the brake. In the split second that it took to slow down, my rational mind kicked in. What would a woman be doing out here in the middle of nowhere, especially at this hour? My foot almost hit the gas pedal to keep going, but something made me stop. She was young, maybe in her early twenties, her white dress glowing in the dark. Her dark hair covered her face, obscuring it from view. As I pulled over, my gut tightened. This was against my better judgment, but what if she was in trouble? I rolled down the passenger side window a couple of inches. Hey, do you need help? I called out. The woman looked up, her face now visible, and what I saw made my heart skip a beat. Her eyes were completely black, no whites or irises, just a void of darkness. Can you give me a ride? Her voice was a whisper, but it echoed in my car as if she were sitting right next to me. Every fiber of my being screamed to drive off, yet I was paralyzed, trapped in her gaze. Then from the depth of my subconscious, an old Native American proverb my grandmother used to tell me surfaced. Never lock eyes with evil, for it will consume you. Summoning every ounce of willpower, I looked away, my hand gripping the gear shift. As I prepared to accelerate, 
she let out a wail, a terrible, mournful sound that seemed to reverberate in the air long after it stopped. When I glanced back to where she stood, or where she should have been standing, she was gone, vanished. I floored the gas pedal, my car shooting forward as if jolted by my own adrenaline. The radio blinked back to life, resuming the country song where it had left off as if nothing had happened. I didn't stop until I reached Sedona, and even then I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that had enveloped me. Later, as I recounted my experience to a local, he nodded gravely. Sounds like La Llorona, he said, referring to the weeping woman, a famous ghostly figure in Hispanic folklore. She's been seen on these roads before. You're lucky you drove away. Whether it was La Llorona or something else entirely, I can't say. But I do know that the experience forever altered my perception of what lies beyond the realm of human understanding. Now, whenever I find myself driving on lonely roads in the dead of night, I can't help but wonder what, or who, might be lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. This is just a little story in case anybody is interested. I work in a medical lab in a series of hospitals, and lately I've been working in one that has a senior's home attached. One wing is for seniors who are in their right minds and just can't look after themselves anymore, wheelchair bound, things like that. The other wing is for seniors who have dementia, Alzheimer's, and so on. Usually when I drive into work, at least once a month, the flag out front is at half mast meaning that one of the seniors has passed away. The medical lab in this hospital has a small waiting area outside, and the rooms in the lab are in an L shape. The smaller part is the blood collection room, and the longer is the actual lab with the machinery and so on. The door leading from the collection room to the lab is at the junction of where the long side and short side of the L meet, and this is also the entrance from the waiting room to the collection room. I hope you're not confused, but it's the best way I know how to describe it. One morning, I was working by myself. The other tech was out doing x-rays. And as I stepped from the lab to the waiting room, out of the corner of my left eye, I saw a man standing at the door. He was wearing an old jacket, a baseball cap, and jeans. Very normal wear for older men in this area. As I was moving from one foot to the other, I assumed he was waiting for blood work, so I turned to ask him, but when I went to face him, there was no one there. I laughed it off, assuming that I had just seen things, went to my computer, sat down, and did some work. When it was time to go back into the lab and unload the centrifuge, I passed the open door and now saw the same man in the same place out of the corner of my right eye. Again, I turned, and again, there was no one. At this point, I was getting a little weirded out. Leaving the lab to walk back into the collection room, passing the open door, I went more slowly this time. And yes, holy crap, he was still there. Now seen out of the corner of my left eye, just like the first time. While I do believe in spirits and the like, I always believe that 90% of the time there's a perfectly normal explanation for everything. There's a potted plant in my house. If you see it from the corner of your eye, it looks like there's a big shaggy dog there. We've never had a big shaggy dog, and our house was built on that land, so I know that there aren't any shaggy dog ghosts going around. It's just how your eye sees things and your brain interprets them. But at this point, I'm starting to get even more freaked out. A part of me wants to see if I can contact him, and a part of me just wants him to go away. About ten minutes later, the other tech has returned. As she's walking from the collection room to the lab, she stops and gives me a start. She looks back at me and laughs and says, oh, I just thought I saw an old man sitting in the chairs there. I looked at her and simply said, I've been seeing him all morning. Are you serious? She asked. Very. 
I said. We never saw him again, but the next day, we learned that one of our seniors had died that afternoon. I guess it was either someone who had passed and was lost, or he was waiting for the other senior. Either way, I won't be forgetting that experience for a while. The highway stretched out in front of me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the Arizona desert. It was past midnight, and I was the only car in sight. The sky was so clear that the stars looked like pinpricks on a dark curtain, and I felt as though I was driving through space, alone in the universe. It was a peaceful sort of isolation. But then my car started to sputter. Glancing down at the dashboard, I saw the needle on the fuel gauge sink dangerously close to E. I cursed myself for not checking earlier. Just as I began to pull over, my headlights flickered and died. In an instant, I was plunged into darkness, save for the dim illumination provided by the moon and stars. Nervous but determined, I managed to pull my car off to the side of the road. I took out my phone to call for help, but no bars. I was in a dead zone. Great, I muttered, contemplating limited options. That's when I noticed it. A soft, bluish glow in the distance, beyond the road, somewhere amidst the cacti and brush. My first thought was that it was another vehicle, but the light didn't resemble headlights. It was more ethereal pulsating softly, like the light of a firefly, but much brighter. Curiosity overcoming caution, I grabbed a flashlight and stepped out of the car, locking the doors behind me. I began walking toward the light. As I got closer, I realized the glow was emanating from a cluster of rocks arranged in a circle. The rocks themselves seemed to be the source of the light, I reached out to touch one, half expecting to feel heat, but they were cool to the touch. As my fingers made contact, the rocks glowed brighter, and for a moment I felt a strange sensation, like an electric charge running through me. Images flashed in my mind, strange symbols, a night sky different from our own, and faces I couldn't recognize. Just as quickly, the visions were gone. Stunned, I stepped back. The rocks dimmed, returning to their original glow. Shaken, I returned to my car, my mind buzzing with questions. When I got back in, I turned the key in the ignition, half expecting it not to work. To my surprise, the car roared back to life, headlights and all. Confused but grateful, I drove away constantly glancing in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see the glowing rocks follow me. They didn't, but as I looked back one final time, I swear I saw them flash brightly, as if saying goodbye, or perhaps until next time. I don't know what I stumbled upon that night. Some local legends speak of spirit stones, rocks imbued with mystical energies, but what I experienced seemed beyond the realm of any folklore. Those glowing rocks and the visions they triggered have left me both intrigued and humbled, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that lie just beyond the boundaries of human understanding, even in the empty stretches of an Arizona highway. The atmosphere of the office changed at night. What was familiar in the daylight took on a different texture in the solitary glow of my desk lamp. I was working late, again, plowing through spreadsheets and emails in the eerie quiet. I had just clicked over to a new task when it happened. My computer screen blinked for a second, 
and then words began appearing in a blank Word document. Check the Thompson report. You missed a detail in the second paragraph. My hands hovered over the keyboard, fingers suspended in confusion. I was alone in the office. I was certain of that. Even the janitors had already finished their rounds. My mind raced to my old mentor, Karen. She would always catch those little mistakes, the almost invisible details most people would overlook. She had passed away five years ago, a sudden illness that had taken her far too young. People in the office said her work ethic and dedication were unmatched, right up to her last days. Hesitant, I clicked on the Thompson report and skimmed to the second paragraph. Sure enough, I had made an error, a subtle one, a misplaced decimal that could easily have been overlooked, but would have altered the financial summary. A chill crept up my spine. Was this some elaborate prank? Some strange glitch? I looked around my dimly lit office, half expecting to see Karen's stern but encouraging face peering out from behind a bookshelf. But the room was empty. Refocusing on the screen, I corrected the error. As soon as I did, another message appeared on the blank document. Good catch. Don't forget to cross-reference the inventory data. It was exactly the kind of tip Karen would give. The kind of meticulous step she insisted could make or break a project. Nervously, I opened the inventory data and began cross-referencing. Within minutes, I found another oversight. Minor to anyone else, but crucial in the grand scheme of things. The night wore on and the tips kept coming. Review the meeting agenda. Double check the new contract. The formatting on slide 7 is inconsistent. Each tip pointed to a flaw or an oversight that I would have missed, but Karen would have caught. Finally, as the clock neared midnight, a different message appeared on the screen. You're ready for tomorrow. Trust yourself. It was a classic Karen phrase, a seal of approval she'd grant only when she thought you had met her exacting standards. I leaned back in my chair, staring at the words on the screen. The room felt colder, but not in an unwelcoming way. It was as though the air had thickened with purpose, brimming with a silent but palpable intent. I didn't hear from Karen after that night, not in the way I did during those haunting midnight hours. My presentation the next day went smoothly, every detail falling perfectly into place, every tip Karen had provided proving invaluable. Days turned into weeks and the eerie events of that night transformed into a blur a surreal experience that mingled with the reality of deadlines and meetings. Yet, every time I catch a detail I would have otherwise overlooked, or when I take an extra minute to review something most would deem trivial, I can almost sense Karen's approving nod, a silent affirmation from a presence I can neither explain nor forget. My friend is a church custodian, and he's told me a lot of paranormal stories. While I was talking to him about an experience we had, I realized that I had seen an embodiment of one of the spirits from our church, something I had previously thought that I hadn't experienced. I saw it when I was very young, so I never put it together, until I was talking to my friend about something he had seen. He was talking about the time we'd been lured into the church by a dark figure in the window, which proceeded to lead us on a wild goose chase through the church. He described the figure he had seen as an average-sized male with no features, just all black. After hearing this, I remembered a time where I was waiting on my parents, who were talking to some people after evening service. Mostly everybody had gone home at this point, and the lights were all turned off on every floor except the ground floor. Being the adventurous little kid I was, and not really believing in ghosts at the time, I decided to go to the third floor, with all the lights off. As I rounded the steps to the third floor, I saw, thanks to the light in the parking lot coming through the window, the silhouette of an all-black man. The entire shadow was black and I couldn't make out any features. 
I immediately ran back to my parents and told them. But, as any good Baptist parents would do, they told me it was just somebody from the church. This occurred in the same spot that my friend said he had seen the figure. I was driving through the winding roads of West Virginia, the dense fog making visibility almost nil. The radio forecast had warned of such conditions, but I was determined to reach my destination by nightfall. As I rounded a bend, I was met with an unexpected sight, a traffic jam. Cars, buses, and trucks were at a standstill, but these weren't modern vehicles. They were all from the 1940s and 50s. People dressed in period clothing stood outside their cars, looking just as confused as I felt. I stepped out of my car, trying to make sense of the situation. A man in a fedora approached me. Hey there, buddy. Been stuck here for hours. Seems like there's been an accident up ahead. I nodded, deciding to investigate the cause of the jam. As I walked further, the scene became more chaotic. There were overturned vehicles, and people were shouting and crying. At the center of it all was a bus, its front mangled, having collided with a truck. A woman, her dress torn and face covered in soot, approached me. Please, sir, can you help us? We can't seem to move on. It hit me then. This wasn't just a traffic jam. It was a scene from a tragic accident that had occurred decades ago. These were the trapped souls of those who had perished unable to find peace. Determined to help, I approached the bus. Inside, I found a group of children, scared and crying. They were on a school trip when the accident happened. I spoke to them gently. It's time to go home. Your families are waiting. One by one, the children began to fade, their spirits finding the peace they had been denied for so long. Outside, I approached the drivers of the bus and the truck. Both were filled with guilt and sorrow. It wasn't your fault, I told them. Accidents happen. It's time to forgive yourselves and move on. As they disappeared, the scene around me began to change. The overturned vehicles righted themselves, and the cries and shouts faded away. The fog lifted, revealing a clear road ahead. I returned to my car, the weight of what I had witnessed heavy on my heart. The ghostly traffic jam was gone, but the memories would stay with me forever. It was a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the importance of finding peace, both in life and in death. And as I continued my journey, I sent a silent prayer for all the souls I had encountered, hoping they had finally found the rest they so desperately sought. The night was dark and the road empty as I drove home from my late shift at the factory. The radio played softly, but static filled the silence between songs. I yawned, exhausted after the long day's work. Just a few more miles and I'd be home to my warm bed. That's when I first heard it, a woman's voice singing. It cut through the static, an eerie, haunting melody. I turned up the radio wondering if a new song was playing, but only white noise came through. The singing continued, wordless and distant. It seemed to come from outside the car. I drove on, puzzled. Out here on these rural back roads, there was nothing but trees and the occasional farmhouse. Where could the singing be coming from? It grew louder, like a siren's song, beckoning me onward. The voice was at once captivating and chilling. Without thinking, I began to drive faster, compelled by the hypnotic song. The voice led me down a narrow dirt road I'd never noticed before. On either side, the forest loomed dark and impenetrable. The melody spiraled higher, 
impossibly beautiful and yet unearthly. I should turn back, I thought vaguely, but the compulsion to follow overpowered me. The road curved and dipped until I realized I no longer knew where I was. The voice kept calling. At last, I rounded a bend, and there stood an ornate iron gate, adorned with creeping ivy. It stood open, leading to a cobblestone path that disappeared into the shadows. The singing resonated all around now, at once, coming from everywhere and nowhere. Against my better judgment, I parked and stepped out of the car toward the gate. I had to find the source of the haunting song. As I passed through the gate, the singing stopped abruptly. The silence rang in my ears. The path led to the steps of a Victorian mansion that seemed abandoned, the paint peeling, the lawn withered and overgrown. Yet a faint light flickered from one curtained window. I climbed the steps to the front door. My body shook, equal parts fear and exhilaration. What would I find within? Again, desire compelled me to turn the tarnished knob and enter. Inside lay only gloom and a chill that raised the hairs on my arms. Cobwebs draped the furniture, and the air smelled of decay. I nearly turned to run, but then the melody began once more. It came from upstairs, a mournful refrain like a lover's lament. My gaze fixed on the winding staircase, every instinct screaming at me to flee this dreadful place. Still I climbed, one step after another. The ancient floorboards creaked underfoot as I ascended. The singing grew louder, almost directly overhead now. At the top, I found myself in a long hallway, lined with more peeling doors. Only one stood ajar, a room at the end from which the song poured. I drifted toward it, my breath shallow, my blood roaring in my ears. Reaching out with trembling fingers, I pushed open the door. Moonlight spilled in through a broken window, illuminating the crooked form of a woman in white sitting before a cracked mirror. Her long, dark hair hid her face as she combed it slowly and sang. I stood frozen. Her song had led me here, but now that I had found its source, I was terrified. Sensing my presence, the woman turned. Her gaunt face was pale as death her eyes black pools that fixed my own. But most horrible was her mouth, impossibly wide, nearly splitting her face in two, revealing rows of jagged teeth. As her song shifted to a bone-chilling shriek, she rose like a wraith, hair writhing about her like shadowy tendrils. I turned and fled even as she glided after me, nails clawing. I stumbled down the stairs and out the front door to my car. Behind me came the shrieks as the house seemed to come to life, shuddering and swaying. I drove off in a frenzy, swerving back down the dark path until I reached the main road. The thing's cries pursued me, furious at my escape. At last I reached home, collapsing in my bed as dawn broke outside. Yet I still hear her ominous song in my dreams, calling me back to that nightmare manor deep in the woods. And I know one night soon, Despite my terror, I will return. For her haunting melody is a siren's call I cannot resist, no matter the peril. The roadside singer awaits to make me hers forevermore. It was during one of my weekend visits to the local flea market that I stumbled upon the ring. Tucked away amidst a pile of old jewelry, its intricate design and shimmering stone caught my eye. The seller, an elderly woman with a kind face, told me it was from the early 1900s and once belonged to a woman named Lila. On a whim, I bought the ring and slipped it onto my finger. Almost immediately, a rush of images flooded my mind. I was standing in a grand ballroom, the sound of classical music playing in the background. Men and women danced gracefully, their outfits reminiscent of the early 20th century. I could feel the weight of a long flowing gown 
and the tightness of a corset. The emotions were overwhelming, a mix of excitement, nervousness, and anticipation. As quickly as the vision came, it faded, and I was back at the flea market, disoriented and shaken. I took off the ring, trying to process what had just happened. Over the next few days, curiosity got the better of me. Each time I wore the ring, I was transported into Lila's world. I saw snippets of her life, her joys, her sorrows, her dreams, and her fears. I witnessed her secret romance with a man named Samuel, the heartbreak when they were forced apart due to societal expectations, and the joy when they reunited against all odds. Through these visions, I felt a deep connection to Lila. I began to research her life, hoping to learn more about this mysterious woman whose memories I was experiencing. I discovered that Lila was a prominent figure in the early 1900s, known for her advocacy for women's rights and her defiance against societal norms. But it was her personal diary, which I found in a local archive, that provided the most insight. Lila wrote of the ring, a gift from Samuel, and how it held a piece of her soul. She believed that whoever wore the ring would be able to see the world through her eyes and understand her struggles and triumphs. As the days turned into weeks, the line between Lila's world and mine began to blur. I found myself drawn to places she had been, meeting descendants of people she had known, and even advocating for causes she had believed in. One day, while wearing the ring, I had a vision of Lila in her final moments. She was old, but content, surrounded by loved ones. She spoke directly to me, thanking me for keeping her memories alive and urging me to live my life with the same passion and determination she had. With tears in my eyes, I promised her I would. The vision faded, and I was back in my world, the weight of the ring heavy on my finger. I continued to wear the ring, drawing strength and inspiration from Lila's memories. It became a symbol of our intertwined destinies, a testament to the power of the past to shape the present. And while I never had another vision as vivid as that final one, I always felt Lila's presence guiding me, reminding me of the legacy she left behind and the responsibility I had to honor it. The town of Black Hollow had always been shrouded in mystery. At its heart lay an old, abandoned graveyard, said to be cursed. Legends spoke of restless spirits and eerie occurrences, tales that were passed down through generations. As a newcomer to the town, and an avid fan of the supernatural, I was naturally drawn to the graveyard. One overcast evening, armed with a flashlight and a sense of adventure, I ventured into the graveyard. The wrought iron gates creaked as I pushed them open, revealing rows of ancient tombstones, some so weathered that the names were barely legible. A thick fog blanketed the ground, giving the place an otherworldly feel. As I wandered among the graves, I felt an overwhelming sense of sadness. It was as if the very air was heavy with the weight of untold stories and unfulfilled dreams. I paused at a particularly old tombstone, its inscription reading, Here lies those who wander but never rest. That night, as I drifted off to sleep, I was jolted awake by a vivid dream. I was back in the graveyard, but it was different. The fog had lifted, revealing a moonlit landscape. The tombstones were no longer just slabs of stone. They were doorways, each leading to a different realm. From each doorway emerged a spirit, their forms varying from shadowy figures to more defined human shapes. They approached me, their eyes filled with a mix of curiosity and desperation. One by one, they shared their stories with me. There was a young woman who had died of a broken heart, her spirit forever searching for her lost love. 
a soldier who had perished in battle, his soul tormented by the horrors he had witnessed, a child who had died too young, his spirit longing for the life he never got to live. Each night, a new spirit would visit my dreams, sharing their tales of sorrow, love, and redemption. It was both a blessing and a curse. While I was privileged to hear their stories, the weight of their pain was often too much to bear. Desperate for a reprieve, I sought the help of a local historian, hoping to find a way to break the curse. He spoke of a ritual, passed down through the ages, that could help the spirits find peace. It involved returning to the graveyard at midnight, lighting a candle for each spirit, and reciting an ancient prayer. With hope in my heart, I followed the historian's instructions. As I lit each candle and recited the prayer, I felt a shift in the atmosphere. The oppressive weight lifted, replaced by a sense of calm and tranquility. That night, my dreams were different. The spirits returned, but this time, they were at peace. They thanked me for helping them find closure, their forms slowly fading away, leaving behind a serene dreamscape. The curse of the Black Hollow graveyard was broken, but the memories of the spirits and their stories remained with me. They served as a reminder of the thin veil between the living and the dead, and the importance of listening to and honoring the tales of those who came before us. As I explored my new home, I stumbled upon a small room that seemed to be a child's bedroom. Time had left its mark with peeling wallpaper and creaky floorboards. But what caught my attention was an old porcelain doll sitting on a rocking chair. She wore a faded blue dress, her hair neatly tied in a bun, and her glassy eyes seemed to gleam with an inner light. A small name tag around her neck read, Evelyn. There was something unsettling about those eyes. No matter where I moved in the room, it felt as if they were following me watching my every move. I tried to shake off the feeling, attributing it to the stress of the move and my overactive imagination. Over the next few days, as I settled into the house, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Every time I passed the room, I'd glance in, and there she'd be, Miss Evelyn, her gaze fixed on me. One evening, to test my sanity, I turned the doll to face the window and left the room. But the next morning, she was back in her original position, her eyes locked onto the doorway. Curiosity piqued, I decided to research the history of the house. At the local library, I found old newspaper clippings and records. The house had once belonged to the Whitmore family. They had a daughter, Evelyn, who tragically died at a young age. Devastated by the loss, her mother had commissioned a doll to be made in Evelyn's likeness, hoping it would provide some solace. The more I delved into the history, the more I began to connect the dots. Residents after the Whitmores reported strange occurrences, items moving on their own, soft giggles in the night, and the ever-present feeling of being watched. One evening, as I sat in the living room, I heard a soft humming coming from the direction of the child's room. I cautiously approached, the door creaking open to reveal Miss Evelyn, rocking gently in her chair, the room bathed in a soft, ethereal glow. Taking a deep breath, I addressed her. Evelyn, is that you? The room grew colder, and the doll's eyes seemed to shimmer. A soft voice, almost a whisper, replied, I'm lonely. Tears filled my eyes as I realized the truth. Evelyn's spirit was trapped, bound to the doll, longing for companionship and the life she never got to live. Determined to help, I reached out to a local medium. She conducted a seance, communicating with Evelyn's spirit. Through her, Evelyn conveyed her desire to be free, to move on and be reunited with her family. The medium performed a ritual, 
releasing Evelyn's spirit from the doll and helping her cross over to the other side. The atmosphere in the house immediately felt lighter. The oppressive weight of sadness lifted. Miss Evelyn, the doll, remained in the house, but her eyes no longer followed me. She sat in her rocking chair, a silent witness to the history of the house and the little girl who once called it home. I often think of Evelyn and hope that she found peace. Her doll serves as a reminder of the mysteries of the unknown and the thin line between the living and the dead. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. I have epilepsy, so I'm never sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I've never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. For a short period of time, my ex and I lived at his late grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move and I saw a little drably dressed old man, about one and a half feet tall, run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in, and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I'd already been through, when he asked me what happened, I just told him I'd slipped. Another thing I once saw may have been a troll, but I'm not sure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you can enlighten me. I had been doing a lot of meditating, three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was this three and a half to four foot naked, wrinkly, elf type troll thing. I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I've had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. There are other times that I have seen them as well. Once in childhood, I had an encounter with my late Noni, and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways, and nothing has ever been found other than some white spots from chronic migraines, and those popped up super recently. I've also been evaluated by a neuropsychologist, and nothing other than my seizures, due to the head trauma, has ever been wrong with me. Like I said, the head trauma happened way after I saw the troll or gnome or whatever it was. I don't know what these things are, but what do you think? The first note appeared on a Tuesday morning. As I reached for my coffee mug, I noticed a folded piece of paper under it. Unfolding it, I read, Don't trust him. The message was scrawled in a hurried manner, but the handwriting was unmistakably mine. Confused, I looked around my apartment, half expecting to find evidence of a break-in, but everything was in its place. I tried to brush it off, thinking maybe I'd written it in a half-asleep state and forgotten about it. But the unease lingered. Two days later, another note appeared, this time inside my laptop. Watch your back, it read. The chill that ran down my spine was undeniable. I live alone, and the thought that someone might be sneaking into my apartment was unsettling. But the fact that the notes were in my handwriting made it even more perplexing. The notes continued to appear over the next few weeks. He's watching. Don't go out tonight. Stay away from the window. Each message was more ominous than the last, and I felt like I was losing my grip on reality. I decided to set up a camera in my apartment, 
hoping to catch the culprit in the act. Each morning, I'd eagerly review the footage, but there was never any sign of an intruder. However, one night, the footage revealed something that left me stunned. Around 3 a.m., I saw myself rise from the bed, eyes vacant and expression blank. I walked to the desk, took out a pen and paper, and began writing a note. Once done, I placed it in a drawer and returned to bed, all the while remaining in a trance-like state. The realization hit me hard. I was writing the notes, but in a state of somnambulism or sleepwalking. But why? And what did the warnings mean? Seeking answers, I consulted a sleep specialist. He explained that stress, trauma, or unresolved issues could trigger such episodes. He suggested undergoing a sleep study and also recommended seeing a therapist to explore any underlying emotional triggers. During therapy, I delved deep into my past and uncovered a repressed memory. Years ago, I had been in a relationship with a man named Alex. It started off well, but over time, he became possessive and abusive. One night, in a fit of rage, he threatened me, and I genuinely feared for my life. I managed to escape and moved cities, changing my identity to stay hidden. The therapist theorized that seeing someone in my new city who resembled Alex might have triggered these memories subconsciously, leading to the sleepwalking episodes and the warning notes. With this revelation, I decided to confront my past. I reached out to authorities and discovered that Alex had been searching for me, his obsession never waning. Every one of those notes was some part of me that knew, warning me that he was around. With the evidence I provided from the past, they were able to apprehend him. The notes stopped appearing, and my sleep returned to normal. The ordeal taught me the power of the subconscious mind and how it can protect us in ways we can't even fathom. While the journey was terrifying, it ultimately led me to confront my past and find closure. So when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large sensory house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV. Except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. 
I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it. And as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me, so much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there. For a few years, at least. Then, after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay, and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage, so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes. Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could sense supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night, hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me. And while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal. So I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard, and I saw out of the corner of my eye my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, 
especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off, and it made everyone move out. Eventually, she ended up selling it again, and the current residents have stayed there the longest. So at the time, I'm about eight years old, and my mom got remarried, and she was on her way to her honeymoon with my new stepdad. I went to my cousin's house, out in the middle of the woods, near a really old coal mine, with only a gravel road to get there. Just for perspective, the driveway is about 50 yards long, and it's in direct sight of the front door. When I get there, nothing seems wrong, it's nighttime. I'm playing Wii with my cousin, and he gets tired and falls asleep. We're sleeping in the living room, which has the front door in it, and the door was mostly glass. So we're laying on the floor, and I have direct vision through the front door. It's about midnight, and I can't sleep. My mom is in a different country, and I miss her being eight years old, so I just look out the door laying there, kind of zoning out. About ten minutes later, I see something walking up the driveway. It looks like a shadow, but it's white looking. It also looks like it has a pickaxe in its hand. I'm thinking, how can a shadow be white? It just doesn't make sense. And who would be outside right now with a pickaxe? At this point, I'm petrified because it stops about halfway, so about 25 yards from me, and just starts hitting nothing with the pickaxe. Eventually, it stops swinging after 20 or so swings, and walks back down the driveway, and I never saw it again. When I say it swings at nothing, I mean it. There was nothing there for it to hit, and it didn't make a sound. I just saw this person hitting the air with a pickaxe. After it walked down the driveway, I never saw it again. I'm 20 years old now, and I still think about this. Reliving it in my head makes me feel uneasy. It gives me chilling goosebumps, and it honestly makes my eyes water. I was too scared to say anything and I only started telling people what I saw around the age of 15 or 16. That's when my cousin told me that he had seen the same thing before when he was little, and he never saw it again either. Most people have theorized to me that it was residual energy of a coal miner acting out his job. Perhaps where the house was used to be an extension of the mine, or maybe there were rocks or ore that they chopped up, who knows. But... Either way, I get goosebumps every time I think about him. Our family road trips were always filled with laughter, games, and of course music. My wife, Aisha. Our two kids, Maya and Sami and I, were on a summer drive through the heart of Virginia, heading towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. The landscape was picturesque, with rolling hills and dense forests flanking the highway. As we drove, I decided to scan the local radio stations, hoping to find some classic rock or perhaps a catchy pop tune. But what we stumbled upon was something entirely unexpected. The radio tuned into a station WVLR Memories 88.9, and a soft, melodic song began to play. The lyrics spoke of a summer romance at a county fair, of stolen glances atop a Ferris wheel, and whispered promises under a starlit sky. Aisha suddenly gasped. I remember this. That summer when we went to the county fair in Roanoke, we had our first kiss on the Ferris wheel. 
She looked at me with teary eyes, lost in the memory. But there was a problem. Aisha and I had never been to a county fair in Roanoke. We'd met in college in New York and had never visited Virginia until now. Before I could voice my confusion, another song began. This one was upbeat, detailing a family picnic by a lakeside, with children laughing and playing in the water. Maya and Sammy's eyes lit up. That's like the time we went to Lake Anna and had that huge water balloon fight, Sammy exclaimed. Again, this was a memory that didn't exist. We'd never been to Lake Anna. Song after song, the radio played tunes that evoked memories we hadn't lived. There was the winter ballad that reminded Aisha of a snowy dance we'd never attended, and the rock anthem that brought back memories of a concert where Maya had supposedly gotten her first guitar pick. The atmosphere in the car grew thick with a mix of nostalgia and confusion. It was as if the radio was tapping into an alternate timeline, playing songs from moments that had never occurred in our lives, but felt as real as any other memory. As the sun set, the signal began to fade, and the mysterious WVLR Memories 88.9 was replaced by static. We drove in silence, each of us lost in our thoughts, trying to make sense of the phantom memories. We reached our destination, a cozy cabin in the mountains, but the events of the drive dominated our conversations. We speculated about the nature of memories, parallel universes, and the power of music to evoke emotions. That night, as the kids slept and Aisha and I sat on the porch, looking up at the stars, she whispered, even if those memories aren't real, they felt beautiful. It's like we got a glimpse into another life, another version of us. I nodded, wrapping my arm around her. Maybe in some other universe, those memories are real. And that version of us is reminiscing about our memories, wondering about a life where they met in New York and took road trips through Virginia. We laughed at the thought, but the magic of the forgotten playlist stayed with us. It was a reminder of the infinite possibilities of life, the countless paths not taken, and the beautiful moments that exist, whether we've lived them or not. I know this story is going to sound weird and crazy, but hear me out. I'm not too familiar with this subreddit, but a friend of mine who's always talking about metaphysics, the twilight zone, simulation type stuff, loves this sub and keeps telling me to post my story. Anyway, here's my story. Two weeks ago, I was about to get ready for a party at six. Just before I started getting ready, one of my friends messaged me super excited because a guy she's had a crush on for the last four years finally asked her out and he was coming to the party with her. While I was texting her back, my younger brother walked into the room and asked if I could drive him to his friend's house, which I agreed to do. Then I went into the bathroom to have a shower and do my makeup. So I got in the shower, but when I went to wash my hair, I realized that my conditioner was finished. I was pretty ticked off because I had only bought it a couple of days beforehand, and it's an expensive brand. My younger sister always uses up my things, so I knew that she had used it all. She had also trashed the bathroom, leaving water everywhere and her dirty towel on the floor. I was pissed off, and I was about to get out of the shower in order to tell her off and get some more conditioner. But as I went to get out, I realized at the last second that she'd kicked the grippy mat that we have at the bottom of our shower tub up. Our shower and tub is super slippery without the grip mat. So as I went to step out, before I could realize it, my foot slipped and I fell neck down onto the edge of my tub. Time seemed to slow down in my head. And I remember that my last thought was, wow, this is how I die? How stupid. But here's the thing. At the moment of, 
impact, I woke up in a start back in my bed. I know it sounds stupid and cheesy like something from a dumb Netflix show, but there's literally no other way to describe what happened. I was lying in my bed right before I got up to shower the first time, but I don't remember falling asleep. And the thing is, I've been a lucid dreamer for the last five years or so. And if this was a dream, it was way more vivid than anything I have ever experienced. What really weirded me out though, was that the exact same friend who texted me the first time messaged me after I woke up to tell me that the guy she'd had a crush on had asked another girl out and that she was really bummed out about it and didn't want to come to the party. I was weirded out that there was some similarity between that and the dream, but I didn't think about it much at first. As I went to reply, my younger brother came in to ask if I would take him to his friend's house. All the blood drained from my face. He just stood in the doorway looking confused and asked me what was wrong. I rushed to the bathroom, feeling like I was losing my freaking mind, and I went to check the conditioner bottle. I know this sounds completely crazy, but the bottle was finished just like before, and the grip mat was kicked up. At that point, I went back to lie down in bed and I texted my friends to tell them that I would not be going to the party. I'm pretty sure that I slipped in the shower, died, and then woke up in some alternate dimension. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I really don't know how else to explain this series of events. In any case, it's rattled me ever since. I write in a daily journal, and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened, based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. The first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. 
was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in old house, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. While cradling my five-year-old niece on our porch, she looked at me and said, When I was grown up and you were just a baby, 
I accidentally let you fall off a deck and you didn't survive. But that wasn't all. She told my girlfriend that I wouldn't return from work because I was no longer alive. At the tender age of three, she had astonishingly recited the birth dates of about 30 people that my girlfriend is acquainted with, even though she'd hardly met these people in her short life. Her peculiar nature is undeniable, and as much as we love her, she's always creeped us out just a little. The old battlefield was a popular tourist spot, known more for its historical significance than its rumored hauntings. I've always been a history buff, so when I had the chance to visit, I jumped at the opportunity, eager to walk the grounds where soldiers once fought and died. The day of my visit was overcast, the gray skies lending an eerie atmosphere to the vast open fields. As I wandered, I tried to imagine the scene all those years ago, the roar of cannons, the shouts of commanders, the desperate cries of wounded men. As evening approached, I found myself drawn to a particular spot on the battlefield, a small grove of trees. The air there felt heavy, charged with an energy I couldn't quite explain. I lingered for a while, lost in thought, before finally heading back to my hotel. That night, as I drifted into sleep, the dreams began. I was back on the battlefield, but it was no longer quiet and empty. The ground shook with the force of artillery fire, the air thick with smoke and the metallic scent of blood. All around me, soldiers clashed in brutal combat, their faces twisted in fear and determination. But the most unsettling part was the sound. The deafening booms of cannons, the whizzing of bullets, the anguished screams of men, it was all so vivid, so real. I could feel the heat of the explosions, the ground trembling beneath my feet. Each night, the dreams returned, each more intense than the last. I'd wake up drenched in sweat, the sounds of battle still ringing in my ears. Desperate for answers, I decided to revisit the battlefield hoping to find some clue or explanation for my haunting dreams. I was drawn once again to the grove of trees, the epicenter of my unease. As I stood there, an old man approached me. He introduced himself as a local historian and shared that the grove was the site of a particularly bloody skirmish. Many soldiers had fallen there, their bodies never recovered, their spirits said to still haunt the grounds. He believed that some visitors, especially those sensitive to the energies of the past, could pick up on these lingering spirits, their memories seeping into the subconscious. Determined to find peace, I sought the help of a spiritual healer. She performed a cleansing ritual, using sage and chanting to clear any residual energies that may have attached themselves to me. She also gave me a protective amulet, infused with herbs and crystals, to ward off any unwanted spirits. Over the next few nights, the intensity of the dreams began to wane. The sounds of battle grew fainter, the images less vivid. Eventually, they stopped altogether, replaced by the usual mundane dreams of everyday life. The experience left a lasting impression on me, a reminder of the thin veil that separates the present from the past the living from the dead. It taught me that history is not just a series of events recorded in books, but a living, breathing entity, its echoes reverberating through time, waiting for someone to listen. I've always been a deep sleeper, the kind who could sleep through thunderstorms and blaring alarms. So when I began feeling unusually fatigued during the day, I decided to invest in a sleep tracker. 
the sleek wristband would monitor my sleep patterns, providing insights into the quality and duration of my rest. The first morning after wearing it, I eagerly checked the data. To my surprise, the tracker showed periods of wakefulness during the night, with a significant amount of activity around 3 a.m. According to the device, I had been up and walking around for nearly an hour. I brushed it off as a glitch, assuming the tracker needed calibration. But night after night, the pattern persisted. Each morning, the device showed me awake and active during the early hours, even though I had no recollection of ever leaving my bed. Curiosity turning to concern, I decided to set up a night vision camera in my bedroom. If I was indeed sleepwalking, I wanted to know. The next morning, I played back the footage with bated breath. The room was bathed in the soft green glow of the night vision. For the first few hours, all was still. But then, around 3 a.m., something startling occurred. I saw myself sit up, eyes wide open, but with a vacant stare. Slowly, I climbed out of bed and began to wander around the room, touching objects, pausing occasionally as if listening to something inaudible. After nearly an hour, I returned to bed, settling back into a deep sleep. The footage was unsettling. My sleepwalking self moved with a deliberateness that was eerie, displaying behaviors and mannerisms I didn't recognize. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I consulted a sleep specialist. He diagnosed me with somnambulism, a sleep disorder that results in episodes of walking or performing complex tasks while asleep. Stress, he said, was a common trigger, but there was something he couldn't explain. During one of our sessions, I mentioned the way I'd pause during my nocturnal wanderings, as if listening to someone. Intrigued, he suggested an experiment. We would conduct an overnight observation, using sensitive audio equipment to pick up any sounds that might be occurring during my episodes. The results were chilling. During one of my sleepwalking episodes, the microphones picked up faint whispers, too soft to be discernible, but unmistakably human. The doctor was baffled, unable to provide a logical explanation. Returning home, I decided to delve into the history of my house. A deep dive into local archives revealed a tragic tale. A century ago, a young woman named Clara had lived in the house. She had been known to converse with unseen friends, often wandering the house at night, whispering secrets into the dark. One fateful evening, she disappeared, never to be seen again. The parallels were uncanny. Was I tapping into some residual energy reliving Clara's nocturnal conversations? Was she the source of the whispers? Seeking closure, I reached out to a medium. She conducted a seance, attempting to communicate with any spirits present. As the candles flickered, she made contact with Clara, who revealed her loneliness and desire for companionship. My sleepwalking episodes, it seemed, were a way for her to connect, to relive her nightly wanderings, the medium helped guide Clara to find peace, releasing her from the confines of the house. That night, for the first time in weeks, my sleep tracker showed a full, uninterrupted night of rest. The experience left me with a profound sense of wonder and respect for the mysteries of the universe. It was a reminder that sometimes, the lines between the past and the present, the living and the dead, are more intertwined than we could ever imagine. Flat tire, middle of nowhere, no cell reception, the trifecta of a road trip gone bad. I cursed under my breath as I surveyed the situation. My car sat lopsided on the gravel road, as desolate a spot as you could imagine. The sky was beginning to bruise with twilight, and the prospects of changing a tire in the dark were far from appealing. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, 
Headlights appeared in my rearview mirror. A pickup truck, ancient but well kept, slowing down as it approached. A sliver of hope. Maybe I wasn't so unlucky after all. The truck parked behind me and out stepped a man, older, weather beaten but spry. His overalls were stained with years of oil and grit, the name Eugene embroidered above his heart. Looks like you could use some help, he said squinting at my flat tire. Would be much appreciated, I replied, relief washing over me. Eugene moved with a quiet efficiency, unpacking his toolkit and getting to work. His hands were strong, deft, each movement precise. In no time he had the flat tire off and the spare on. There you go, he said, wiping his hands on a rag. Good as new. I couldn't believe my luck. How much do I owe you? He waved a dismissive hand. Consider it a favor. Just pay it forward when you can. I thanked him profusely, still awed by the timely intervention. As he drove away, his truck's taillights faded into the encroaching darkness, as if swallowed whole. When I got back into town, I headed straight for the nearest garage to get a proper tire replacement. While there, I mentioned Eugene and how he'd helped me out. The mechanic paused, his face turning a shade paler. Did you say Eugene? Drives an old Ford pickup? Yeah, that's him. Know him. The mechanic looked at me as if I'd grown a second head. Eugene's been dead for years, passed away in that very truck, a collision up on Millersfield Road. A cold shiver trickled down my spine. That's impossible. He helped me just a couple hours ago changed my flat tire and everything. The mechanic stared, then walked over to a cluttered bulletin board on the wall. He shuffled through various papers and pulled out a faded newspaper clipping, handed it to me. The headline read, Local Mechanic Dies in Tragic Accident. And there he was, Eugene, unmistakable despite the grainy black and white photograph, that familiar smile, those wise eyes, I felt my knees weaken, my stomach turn. Looks like Eugene's still looking out for folks, the mechanic murmured, reclaiming the article and pinning it back on the board. I left the garage in a daze, new tire in place, but my understanding of reality irrevocably altered. I had been helped by a man who was no longer of this world, a long dead handyman, still aiding travelers in distress. As I drove away, the thought weighed on me, heavy but oddly comforting. Whatever force let Eugene linger, it was a benevolent one, a shred of goodness stitched into the fabric of an otherwise indifferent universe. And as I merged onto the highway, my eyes flicked to the rearview mirror, half expecting to see those headlights one more time. But all that met my gaze was the open road and the gathering night. It was a foggy evening as I drove through the winding roads of the Appalachian Mountains. The mist was thick, reducing visibility to just a few feet ahead. As I rounded a bend, I spotted a figure on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. Given the weather and the remoteness of the location, I decided to stop. The hitchhiker was a young woman, dressed in a faded floral dress that looked like it belonged to another era. Her eyes were a deep shade of blue, and there was a certain sadness about her. Thank you, she whispered as she climbed in. I need to get to Silverpine. I was taken aback. Silverpine was a town that had been abandoned after a mining disaster in the 1940s. Are you sure? There's nothing left of Silverpine. She nodded. It's where I need to be. We drove in silence, the only sound being the hum of the engine and the occasional droplets of rain hitting the windshield. As we approached the old location of Silver Pine, the fog grew denser. The hitchhiker pointed to a dilapidated sign barely visible through the mist. Just up ahead, she said. I slowed the car, trying to navigate through the thick fog. 
When I turned to ask her for more specific directions, I found the passenger seat empty. The door was still closed, and there was no sign of her anywhere. Confused and a little frightened, I continued driving until I reached the remnants of Silver Pine. The town was a ghostly sight, with decaying buildings and overgrown vegetation. In the town square, there was a memorial with names of those who had perished in the mining disaster. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the memorial. As I scanned the names, one caught my attention. Lila May Thompson. Below the name was a picture of the young woman I had picked up, wearing the same faded floral dress. A chill ran down my spine. I quickly got back in my car and drove away, the image of Lila May's sad blue eyes etched in my mind. The fog began to lift, and as I looked in the rearview mirror, Silver Pine disappeared into the mist, along with the phantom hitchhiker who had once called it home. The old, wrinkled map called to me from the dusty shelves of my grandfather's study. As a child, I had spent hours poring over its faded contours and landmarks, dreaming of the adventures it promised in foreign lands. But one road had always captivated my imagination, Route 00. It meandered whimsically across the map, not seeming to connect any two points in particular. My grandfather said he had never discovered where it led, though he had searched for years. When I inherited the map after his passing, the unfinished business of Route 00 beckoned. I set off on a journey to trace its path, hoping to uncover the secrets behind this mysterious road. Mile after mile I followed it, the dotted line leading me through forests and valleys, over hills and streams. Food and fuel dwindled as the days wore on, but I pressed forward, drawn irresistibly by the promise of what lay ahead. The road grew steadily narrower and less maintained. With each turn, the surroundings grew more ominous, the way ahead darker. Still I continued, shadows now seeming to creep from the woods to encircle me. Finally, the crumbling pavement dwindled to a single dirt track through the gnarled trees. My heart pounded as I glimpsed a small light shining in the distance. This was what I had been searching for all along. I stumbled into a clearing, where the moldering remains of an old carnival lay sprawled before me. This was a place that time had forgotten, that the world had left behind. As I walked slowly past the decaying tents and rides, memories of my childhood began flooding back, of warm summer nights spent at the county fair with grandfather. A carousel sat silent, once bright horses faded and peeling. In the hall of mirrors, I saw reflections, not of myself, but of friends and family, long gone. Around each corner lay a glimpse into my past, sending me deeper down forgotten paths in my own mind. I wandered for what felt like hours through the abandoned carnival, each exhibit triggering another vivid memory. The fun house with its warped mirrors took me back to the time I got lost as a child and stumbled out in tears. The broken down roller coaster reminded me of laughing wildly while clinging to my grandfather's arm. With every step, the past became more real than the decay surrounding me. I found myself mentally revisiting moments I hadn't thought of in years. The first time I rode a bike, school dances, graduations, it was as if this place held within it the very essence of my memories. Finally, I arrived at the abandoned Ferris wheel, rising skeletal against the night sky. One last carriage waited, as if beckoning me aboard for a final ride. I stepped into the creaking car, and as the wheel lurched into motion, began a slow ascent into the darkness above. Looking down, the road that had led me there now seemed to stretch on without end two paths diverging, one into memory and one into infinite unknown. As the carriage rocked higher, pulling me away, 
Flickers of past regrets and unrealized dreams began to play before my eyes. I saw the paths not taken, the risks not ventured, but interspersed were memories of accomplishments, loved ones, moments of joy. A kaleidoscope of memory and emotion engulfed me, somehow more vivid and real than anything in my present life. I knew then the truth about Route 00. It leads wanderers not to any physical place, but deep into the recesses of their own hearts, minds, and fears, revealing their secrets. Whether it was real or only a dream, I may never know. But I emerged from that forest changed, memories made vivid again, mysteries of my own heart illuminated. The journey itself was the destination. Route 00 is an invitation to reckon with where you've been, who you became along the way, and where those winding back roads of life might yet lead, if you dare to follow them. The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge, Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. 
Rotting planks whizzed under my tires, and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone, but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally, until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost's wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. It started out subtle at first, a glimpse of unfamiliar scenery in the rearview mirror that was gone when I looked back, a car that seemed to vanish as it drove behind me. I brushed it off as just tired eyes playing tricks on me during long and lonely drives. But the visions in the mirror gradually intensified, like a radio tuned between stations, flickering between realities. Until finally, one night on an empty stretch of highway, the image behind me shifted completely. Instead of the dark road receding into the distance, I saw a bright, sunny day and a car that was not mine. Inside was myself, but with slightly different hair and clothing. He looked happy, content, and next to him sat a woman, my wife, but not as I knew her. Her hair was shorter, face a little smoother, eyes shining as she smiled at the other me behind the wheel. I slammed the brakes in shock. This was no trick of the eyes. The mirror had become a window into another world, one where it seemed life had taken me down a different path. As my heart pounded, the other me cruised along, chatting and laughing, blissfully unaware of my gaze. I drank in every detail hungrily envious of his confident air, the affection between him and his wife, my knuckles white from gripping the steering wheel. I feared blinking lest the vision dissolve. When I finally continued driving, I could not tear my eyes from the mirror. Mile after mile, it tracked that other, happier version of my life. Days when I knew only loneliness and regret, he spent in parks and beaches with his family. Nights I wasted in bars, or numbly staring at a TV screen. He enjoyed cozy dinners and long talks with his smiling wife. It all seemed so perfect, so effortless for him. Why hadn't I made different choices? The mirror became an addiction, my evening fix, feeding an insatiable craving for that life untaken. I left work early each day, racing to get behind the wheel, hungry for my glimpse of what could have been. My wife's face when I got home barely registered. I was fixated on the wife who waited behind the glass each night as I drove away again. Until finally, one rainy evening, my car hydroplaned on a slick curve. The world spun out of control, and I had one last frozen instant to see the other me still driving happily onward, unaware of my fate. Then everything went black. 
I drifted back into consciousness, the sting of antiseptic in my nose. My wife sat at my hospital bedside, her face lined with worry and fatigue. As I struggled to speak, tears welled in her eyes. There were times I thought you wanted a different life, she said softly. But in the end, you were always devoted to this one. The truth sank in, even through the fog of pain medication. That other winding road had never really existed. My weaknesses and mistakes were my own, not some cosmic injustice. All I could do was go forward from here, striving to rediscover the best parts of myself again. Maybe the mirror had been a warning, or even a gift, a glimpse of how every choice shapes our lives. I can't change the past, but I can still steer myself toward a brighter future if I keep my eyes focused ahead. The road behind me no longer haunts my thoughts. Wherever the highway leads next, the only way is forward. It was supposed to be a simple road trip. My friends, Priya, Carlos, and I, had planned a weekend getaway to a cabin in the woods. The drive was straightforward, a four-hour journey through the heart of Oregon's dense forests. We set off early in the morning, our car packed with snacks, music playlists ready, and spirits high. As we drove, we chatted, sang along to our favorite songs, and admired the scenic beauty outside. About two hours into our journey, we approached a tunnel carved into the side of a mountain. The entrance was framed by old, moss-covered stones, and the inside was pitch black, the other end not visible. Carlos, who was driving, joked, feels like we're entering the twilight zone. We laughed, but as we entered the tunnel, an eerie silence enveloped the car. The radio lost signal, and our voices seemed muffled as if the very air inside the tunnel was absorbing sound. It felt like mere minutes before we emerged on the other side, blinking against the bright sunlight. We all let out a collective sigh of relief, the tunnel's oppressive atmosphere still fresh in our minds. But as we continued driving, something felt off. The landscape looked different, more overgrown, as if nature had reclaimed the area. The road signs indicated that we were only 10 minutes away from our cabin, which was impossible given we had at least two more hours to go. Confused, I checked my watch, expecting it to be around noon. But to my shock, it read 5.30 p.m. Priya checked her phone, and it showed the same time. We had somehow lost over five hours, but the journey through the tunnel had felt like mere minutes. Panic set in. We tried to retrace our steps, but everything was a blur. We remembered entering the tunnel, the silence, and then exiting into the changed landscape. When we reached the cabin, the owner, an elderly woman named Mrs. Adler, greeted us. Seeing our distressed faces, she invited us in for tea. As we recounted our experience, she listened intently, nodding occasionally. Once we finished, she sighed, Ah, the lost tunnel. I've heard tales, but you're the first I've met who's experienced it. She explained that the tunnel was ancient, older than any records could trace. Over the years, travelers had reported similar experiences, losing hours or even days after passing through. No one knew why or how it happened, but it was always on days when the sun was particularly bright, casting the tunnel into deep shadow. Mrs. Adler's words sent chills down our spines. We were grateful to be safe, but the lost hours weighed heavily on our minds. What had happened in the time we couldn't account for? The rest of the weekend was uneventful, but the mystery of the lost tunnel stayed with us. We decided to take a different route home, not wanting to risk another encounter. To this day, we still wonder about those lost hours. Were we in some sort of time warp? Did we experience things we couldn't remember? The answers remain elusive, but one thing is certain. 
the lost tunnel, with its ability to bend and steal time, is a reminder of the mysteries that still exist in our world, waiting to be discovered. The highway was a ribbon of darkness, my truck's headlights barely making a dent. Mile after endless mile, I'd been listening to country songs and chugging lukewarm coffee. There's a rhythm to the road at night, a hum that can hypnotize you if you're not careful. My eyes started to blur, a dangerous lull seeping into my bones. That's when I saw her, a figure on the side of the road, draped in what looked like a white shawl. Odd. People don't usually walk along interstates at 3 a.m., not in places like this, where the closest town is a good half-hour drive away. Something about her posture said she wasn't hitchhiking, wasn't lost. She seemed to be waiting for something or someone. My first instinct was to drive past. Maybe it was fatigue. Maybe it was the jaded part of me that thought it was some sort of setup. But something compelled me to pull over, tires crunching on the gravel shoulder. She approached the truck without hesitation, as if she'd been expecting me. No face, just darkness under the hood of her shawl. But when she spoke, her voice was young, almost melodious. Do you seek fortune, driver? I almost laughed. Fortune was a long shot for a guy hauling freight cross country. More like decent mileage and good coffee. Her head tilted, considering. Follow me, she said. And then she turned away, floating, yeah, floating, about a foot above the ground. My instincts screamed not to, but I was suddenly overtaken by curiosity. Shifting the truck into gear, I trailed her as she glided smoothly along the edge of the road. The whole setup screamed of legends, of La Llorona, or the Japanese Yurei, but this wasn't Mexico or Japan. This was a lonely stretch of American asphalt. Eventually, she led me off the highway onto an unmarked dirt road. My truck bumped and jostled, and for a moment I feared I'd lose her in the dust and darkness. But she was always just ahead, an eerie beacon. The road ended abruptly at the entrance to what looked like an abandoned barn. She stopped and turned toward me. Inside, you will find what you seek. I should have bolted right then, turned that truck around and sped back to the sanctuary of the highway. But I didn't. Instead, I stepped out and walked into the barn. The wood creaked under my weight, dust motes floating lazily in the slivers of moonlight that snuck through the gaps in the slats. There was something on a rickety table at the center, half buried under a tattered cloth, a metal box with an intricate lock. I reached out hands trembling. Before I could touch it, a cold wind blasted through the barn, extinguishing what little light there was. My heart hammered in my chest. I groped around, grabbed the box, and bolted back to my truck. The figure was gone. I didn't open the box until I'd driven a good hundred miles. Inside, nestled in faded velvet, was an antique pocket watch. I grabbed it and flipped it open. The time was stuck at 3.15, the exact moment I'd first seen her. Only then did it hit me. What if she'd led me to something darker, something malevolent? I felt a shiver creep up my spine, but by then, the road was pulling me again, back into its monotonous hum, and the night stretched long and endless ahead. The long stretch of midnight highway unfurled before me as I drove through the rugged countryside. This desolate road was a shortcut to my destination, but my grip tightened on the wheel as local legends surfaced in my mind. Locals had spoken of this highway's hauntings, phantoms who preyed upon lost travelers. I tried to shake off my nerves. Ghost stories were merely fiction after all. 
But alone on this forgotten route, I could not ignore the chill creeping down my spine. My headlights illuminated a battered sign, Scenic Route 7. This remote byway was said to be plagued by a variety of supernatural horrors. In Ireland, nearly identical roads held the same name and tales of spirits, known as Wailing Women, their shrieks echoing as they searched eternally for their lost children. In Japan, an analogous winding highway crossed the forest of Aokigahara, infamous for its yurei, ghosts of the forgotten. But the local legend that unnerved me most centered around a phantom hitchhiker. Stories told of a young woman dressed in white standing on the roadside, silently begging for a ride. Any driver who dared stop for her soon disappeared, never to be seen again. My gaslight suddenly blinked on and my stomach dropped. I was running low on fuel, still miles from civilization. With no choice, I kept driving down the pitch black road. The rocky cliffs around me seemed to close in as a dense fog rolled across my path. I could barely see ahead when through the mist, I spotted a faded sign for a gas station. Grateful, I veered off towards the weathered building. Perhaps they still provided services to wayward travelers like myself. But as I pulled up, not a light shone in the decrepit station. A rusty old pump stood unused amidst weeds. Everything about the place screamed abandonment, except for one detail, a yellow payphone under an overhanging roof. Could it possibly still work? Worth a try, since my cell had no signal. I dug for loose change in my glove box and walked over. The payphone's cracked receiver felt heavy and cold in my hand. I lifted it to my ear, deposited my coins, and miraculously heard a dial tone. Quickly I punched 911, seeking aid or at least directions. One ring, then two. Suddenly a girl's voice answered, her tone strange and distant. Please, help me. I jumped, taken aback. I cautiously asked who was speaking, but she only replied again, now clearly desperate. Please, you must help. He's coming. Her plea sent a chill through me, but I pressed for details. Where was she? What was happening? The voice grew fainter, as if speaking from the end of a long tunnel. Her last words sank my heart. He's here. He's... Then only static. I slammed the receiver down, breathing fast. This was no 911 call. Dread flooded my veins at the implication. Somehow I had connected directly with the ghost girl hitchhiker herself, calling across dimensions for aid. I ran back to my car, throwing it into gear. Peeling out back onto the road, I pushed the gas pedal to the floor. But only minutes later, through my headlights piercing the night mist, a shadow took shape. The silhouette of a young woman emerged. My blood turned to ice. It was her. The phantom wore a gossamer white dress, raven hair flowing untamed over her face. She stood utterly still, thumb outraised. Every fiber of my being screamed not to stop. But her form drew closer in my high beams, her thumb still desperately lifted. Against all reason, I pulled over, though never stopping fully. Perhaps I could help free her spirit. She floated to my passenger window, peering in. And then I saw her face, skin paler than snow, eyes jet black and devoid of life. Her beauty was chilling, otherworldly. This was no trapped soul, but something far more sinister. Ancient instinct took over, and I floored the gas. The phantom smile stretched unnaturally wide as I left her behind fading back into the fog. I raced onwards, pursued only by my pounding heart. Local legends were true. This was a haunted highway, stalked by a deceiving, vengeful ghost. I dared not glance back to see if she followed still. Only the road ahead mattered now. I drove until I reached the highway's end, where it rejoined the main interstate. The disappeared into dawn's first light but I know I'll never take the haunted detour of Road 7 again. For some journeys lead places from which we can never return.
waylaid forever by the spirits that walk our darkest byways. I was driving the empty stretch of highway late at night, glancing at the peeling billboards littering the roadside. Most displayed dull ads for cheap motels and roadside diners. But one caught my eye, a blank white sign marked only with black lettering. Turn back now. A prickle ran down my neck. It seemed less a warning than a dark prophecy. But I shook off my unease and drove on through the creeping fog. Miles later, Another mysterious billboard emerged. Last exit, one mile. Again, a creep of dread. These signs almost seemed to know my presence here, long after midnight on this abandoned route. I chalked it up to fatigue and the mist playing tricks. But soon, more ominous messages began to take shape in the haze. We have been waiting. Your journey ends here. Each gave me a start, my imagination spiraling. Who was sending these silent warnings? Distracted, I nearly missed a faded placard peeking from the thicket. Turn back, dead end ahead. I slowed, gripping the wheel. This deserted back road was a shortcut I'd taken for years without incident, but the sign's persistent warnings filled me with foreboding. Still, only a few more miles to go. I pushed on warily. That's when it emerged ahead a towering billboard stark against the darkness. Last chance. My breath caught. Dread coursed through me, but the road ahead remained smooth and empty. With a shaking laugh, I dismissed my fears as fanciful. The messages were merely pranks, not grim portents. But then, around a sharp bend, my headlights fell upon one final board rooted in the dirt shoulder. Its message turned my blood to ice. Sarah, we are waiting for you. The breath left my chest. My name on this remote road, impossible yet undeniably real. These were no pranks, but dire warnings from an unknown force. I floored the gas pedal, swerving around the last sign. Had to outrun this nightmare highway with its messages from beyond the void. Tires squealing. I raced on through the dark, eyes wild for a branching road to escape this valley of omens. But the way ahead remained stubbornly straight and desolate, my only choice forward or back. And then, behind me, a new light flared, harsh and blinding. An engine roared, drawing closer until it loomed large in my rear view. An unmarked white van, creeping up fast, headlights seeming to glow with malevolence. My terrified gaze jumped back to the road ahead. No exits, no turnoffs to shake my pursuer. The van edged nearer until it was just feet from my bumper, high beams flooding my car, trapped on this road between darkness and darkness. This was the end the omens foretold. So I made my choice, floor the gas and leave the road entirely. My car jolted down the rocky shoulder, slamming into the ditch. The van blared past, unable to follow. Wheels spinning, I gritted my teeth and slammed the pedal down, fighting to climb out of the gully. With one last grunt of effort, my battered car lurched back onto the pavement. The white van was gone, its high beams fading into the distance. I rolled to a stop, hazard lights blinking, breath heaving. A close call, but I'd escaped the road's omens and my pursuer along with it. Relief flooded through me as I steadied my shaking hands, but relief faded to chilling awe as I peered behind me. At the spot where I left the road, there stood no ditch or rocky drop-off, only more cracked pavement stretching unbroken into the past. No gully existed to have trapped me. There was no earthly reason I should be free. The full force of realization hit me, this was no ordinary road. Something beyond reason led me here, and now let me go, spared from the grim fate the signs foretold. Numb, 
I drove on until finally reaching safe asphalt and lamp-lit streets. But I knew now never again to take that darkness-veiled back road. For I had glimpsed the void and those who dwell beyond. By some grace, I slipped free this time. But next time, I may not escape the highway's messages from beyond. The waiting ones would have their due. So my friends and I visited this abandoned place in Slovakia. The asylum was first opened in 1918 as a spa center. Later, it was rebuilt as an asylum and closed in the 1970s. It is said that patients were tortured here and many experiments were done on them. So I took a lot of pictures and recorded about 15 minutes of videos We've experienced strange sounds. Something made a lot of noise, but we didn't make anything of it at first. After the noise, we said, do that again if you're here, but nothing happened. But then as we were leaving, something made a noise behind me, and my friend said he could feel a cold touch on his back. So we finally left the place and looked at the photos. There's something on the photos that I need to debunk, or not. I enhanced the photos already, so you can see better. The links will be in the description. I'd love to hear your opinions about them. I don't know what we saw, but I'd love to debunk it or confirm what it is. In 2018, a group of friends from college and I decided to go and spend a month in Berlin over the summer. We spent our time between part-time jobs, partying and just simply enjoying the city and its cultural activities. Everyone in the group was cycling places, but not me. We had a bit of a bike situation with mine, and so I decided to spend the rest of our time there on foot or using the metro. It wasn't that much of a bother, until we decided to go and party near the River Spree. This place has bars and clubs, and it's overall a great place to party. But from what I recall, public transportation didn't go that far in the middle of the night. They had all cycled there, so I was the only one without a means to go back to our apartment. It was a 20 minute cycle from the bar, but it was at least a 35 minute walk. A friend of mine, I'll call her Ava, decided to walk back with me and just take her bike next to her so that she wouldn't leave me alone wandering around the city in the middle of the night. It was about 4 a.m. by the time we left. As we're walking down this rather big street and chatting, I remember smelling food and seeing this restaurant past the pedestrian crossing to which we were headed. I'm a foodie and I was rather hungry, so that was pretty appealing. A woman was sitting there having some kind of food. She had black hair. I could see her profile through the large windows, which took up almost the entire wall up to the ceiling. I specifically remember thinking, that's weird that they're still open at this time of night. I remember telling myself I had to tell Ava about it when the flow of conversation allowed it. As I was walking and starting to cross the road, the crossing in front of the restaurant, things got kind of blank. It's like I was on autopilot. I was hearing her voice, but it was kind of muffled. Once we were past this restaurant, Ava stopped, turned to me and said, wait, wasn't there a restaurant just there with a woman eating? I had completely forgotten to tell her. It's like my memory had been wiped and restored within seconds. And there it was, a hotel. The large windows were the same and inside was the hotel's restaurant with a layout and tables that looked nothing like what we saw, 
and nobody was sitting there eating. We were both very shocked and saw that a male receptionist with short hair was in there. I knew we just had to ask him if somebody had just been eating there. It was just too weird. He was a little bit freaked out about us coming in like that, but he said he'd been alone in there for hours. After discussing with Ava, we found out that she also saw the woman eating, but she only saw her back. She was seated with her back to the window. While I could tell everything about this woman, because I saw her entire profile. After that, Ava never wanted to talk about it again. She got mad whenever I tried to bring it up. People seem to have changed around me after this event too. Even my mom started to not remember things that she should have remembered. And a lot of people just seemed different overall. I must also note that I was not drunk, not by a long shot. And staying up that late was really common for me at the time. So I didn't feel sleep deprived either. Also, Ava saw the same thing I did. Interestingly enough, the name of the hotel that was originally a restaurant when we saw it is the Grimm Hotel, in reference to the author of many fairy tale stories. All in all, a very weird experience. This happened to me a few months ago. My two friends and I decided to take a trip to Los Angeles for fun. Keep in mind that we are from the East Coast and we don't know anybody in LA. On the last day of our vacation, we had to check out of the hotel by 11 a.m. The night before, we had gotten back to the hotel really late, so we ended up sleeping in. We knew that it would be difficult to get completely packed up and ready to leave by 11, so we decided to go to the front desk and request a late checkout of noon. We had done this at another hotel before with no issues, and this place wasn't really at capacity with guests, so we figured it was a reasonable request. I drew the short straw and was tasked with going down to the front desk. The elevator in this hotel was really old and quite small, and I found it to be very creepy. I also have mild claustrophobia. So I avoided the elevator and walked down the three flights of stairs instead. I asked the receptionist if we could have a late checkout and gave her the room number. She looked at me surprised and said, yes, we approved your late checkout already a few minutes ago. I was very confused and I asked her to elaborate. Apparently, a girl had come down a minute or two before me to ask for a late checkout for our room number, and then had walked out of the building. At this point, I figured that maybe one of my friends had, for whatever reason, decided to take the elevator down and ask before I did. I grumbled a bit at this because I had just walked down those stairs for no reason at all, and it didn't make any sense why they would ask me to go and then beat me to it. But I got back to the room and to my surprise, both of my friends were there. One of them was taking a shower and the other one was packing. It didn't look like either of them had left the room. So I was kind of like, all right, which one of you's the prankster? They were pretty confused and asked me to explain. So I told them what the receptionist had said and they were shocked neither of them had left the room, and it seemed too big of a coincidence that somebody would have the same request as us at the same time and just make the mistake of giving our room number. I have no idea who that girl was that made the request. They started joking that maybe it was me from another dimension or something. But yeah, whatever it was, the whole thing was kind of eerie. Over a decade ago, I was traveling on vacation. 
and I had booked hotels through some page similar to Expedia, but smaller. Anyway, I got to one of the cities that I was visiting, and I walked to where the hotel I booked was supposed to be. It was a construction site. I tried to call the emergency number for the webpage, but no one ever answered. I was really mad, but I figured I would just deal with my refund once I was back home, and I looked for a new place to stay. I was in the city for an event, so I knew some other people who were also there. I asked them where they were staying and decided to just get a room there. It was like a Best Western or Holiday Inn, something along those lines. Anyway, I'm checking in and the receptionist tells me I already have a paid booking there in my name. I am 100% sure I did not mix up the addresses. Also, this hotel was a completely different brand or group. I suppose the website could have rebooked me, but they never informed me of it. And the address that they sent me to was nowhere close to the other hotel. There are hundreds of hotels in that city. The chance that I would randomly pick that one were pretty slim. I never did manage to speak to anybody from that webpage, but... It still freaks me out just a little bit. This year, my partner needed to be admitted to hospital for an infection with complications. The condition was called Ludwig's angina and I was allowed to stay with him. We were there a total of three nights. Our hospital is quite old. Think that nasty greenish linoleum and the ceiling panels with the dots. I'm not sure the exact year that it was established, but I imagine it would be over a hundred years old at this point. On the first night that we stayed, I was trying to fall asleep on a couple of chairs that I had pushed together, which was not very comfortable. I tossed and turned for a bit, and then decided that I needed to get up and use the bathroom. Just before I actually got up, my head was rested on the wall beside me. Through the wall, I heard somebody softly calling out my name. Let me tell you, it scared the pee right back up there. I didn't fall asleep that night. I rather just passed out from exhaustion at a certain point. The next morning, my partner and I went for a walk to go and have a smoke and the hospital is smoke-free, so we had to walk a bit. Just around the corner from our room, in the ward, there were two elevators. As we approached the loft, the doors popped open. We both kind of looked at each other with confusion. The light on the button had not been on, so I know that nobody called it. The doors remained open for a while, before we hesitantly stepped in. I felt a presence with us next to the buttons, as I pressed the G button. When I reached over to press it, there was a cooling sensation. I suppose it just could have been a draft, but either way, we went and had our smoke and came back to find the same elevator still open and waiting for us. We both half-joked about the kind ghost orderly who was helping us get around. Unrelated to the above stay, our hospital has always had weird stuff happening, with all the lifts. For example, it will stop on floors that aren't requested, or it will go too fast or too slow. I suppose it could be easily explained away as mechanical stuff, but nobody's ever been able to find a problem, so I'm not so sure. When I was in college, I was a banquet worker at a hotel. One night we were hosting a wedding and we ran out of trash bags. We couldn't find any anywhere. So my boss asked me if I could track down a room service cart and grab anything I could find, even if it was small. At this point, it's almost one in the morning. The wedding is winding down and the hotel is quiet. I didn't have access to the room service closet or laundry as a banquet server, so I was literally just going floor to floor, hoping that somebody had left their cart out. 
Finally, on the sixth floor, I saw a cart at the far end of the hall. I could hear a baby crying, and I saw one of our hotel provided bassinets in the hall next to a closed room door. I had to pass the bassinet to get to the cart. It was empty, as it should have been. As I got closer, the crying became louder. It made absolute sense to me, but it gave me this icky feeling in my stomach. I tried not to think anything about it. The baby must be in the room crying and the parents parked the bassinet outside because they decided not to use it, right? I raided the cart for the roll of bags and I noticed that the cart belonged to my friend Juana. She had an Aerosmith sticker on her cart, so I knew that it was hers. The next day I saw her at work and I mentioned that I had stolen her bags and apologized because she probably had to hunt some down at the very beginning of her shift. I then jokingly thanked her for leaving it next to the bassinet or baby room and I joked about how unsettling it felt to be in an empty hotel corridor next to an empty bassinet while listening to a crying baby in the wee hours of the morning. She was like, that's weird. I cleaned a room on that floor at the very beginning of my shift. I took the bassinet back down to the rollaway storage room first thing yesterday morning. That family checked out before you even got here. We discussed how unusual it was to have more than one family with a baby request a bassinet so close together, especially on the same floor. We rarely had to dig out a bassinet. At that point, we kind of thought that maybe it was two different families with two different babies who got a bassinet, but it was still strange. As I was leaving and clocking out in the laundry room, Juana stopped me to tell me that the bassinet shouldn't have been there. She double checked the logs. No other families had requested one or even been there. We have a checkout sheet for bassinets and rollaway beds so that if we need one and we can't find one, we know where they were the last time they were used. Sure enough, Juana's room was the last one to have a bassinet. The sheet showed another coworker checking it out for the family when they arrived and Juana checking it back into the rollaway room over 12 hours before I saw it in the hallway. I guess technically she could have forged her check-in signature, but why would she have done that? There would have been no point. And she clearly recalled returning it to the closet. Regardless of whether or not that bassinet should have been there, the crying baby definitely shouldn't have because there was no child, no family checked into that room or even on that floor. The family had checked out early and had been long gone before I went hunting for a cart. A friend and I booked a hotel room to ring in the new year. At the time of this event, I was completely sober. We were in the room and I called the front desk to ask about room service. They told me that there would be a rather loud party in the room below us this evening and offered to move us to another room. We accept this offer. They told us to get our keys ready so that we could swap them with the staff person who would deliver our new keys to our room in a few minutes. I start packing what little I had already unpacked and my friend hands me her key in the little paper holder. I pulled out my change purse and removed my key to put it in the holder with hers. This is when things got a little wonky. I can't exactly remember if I put the keys in my pocket of my sweatshirt or if I placed them down in front of the TV. But either way, when I came back from grabbing my travel bathroom bag in the bathroom, the keys were gone. I couldn't find them anywhere. The staff person arrived just a second after this. I go to answer the door to tell them that I seem to have misplaced our current keys and to please give me a minute. But 
I never do. I search through everything in the two relatively small, organized bags that I had. I searched all the pockets of my jacket, the floor, the bathroom underneath the pillows. They were nowhere. I never left the room. These keys just vanished. From the time that I left the main room to go grab my bag and the time I came back, just a few seconds, those keys were gone. To this day, I have no explanation of what happened to those keys. We never did find them. My wife and I seemed to have a simultaneous glitch a couple of years ago at a hotel in Canada. It's not the most significant or interesting glitch, I guess, but we've never experienced such a thing before or since. We were spending the night at a random hotel in Toronto on an overnight layover before flying to Mexico the next day. We are not from Canada and I had never been to Toronto before. My wife had, but as a teenager, and only on a brief trip. When we walked into the lobby to check in, there was a small line of people waiting at the desk. We got in line behind a middle-aged couple who looked like maybe they were there for a wedding or a party. They immediately turned around and smiled at us as if we were all old friends. The wife of the partner said, Hey, so are you girls heading back to Winnipeg in the morning? My wife and I faltered for a moment. She was obviously talking to us and not anybody else, but we had no idea why. We had never met this couple before, let alone engaged in any kind of conversation with them. We had just gotten to the hotel. Plus, neither of us have ever been to Winnipeg. Uh, no. I replied uncomfortably. The woman looked confused and just said, Oh. She was called up by one of the attendants and we got the other, so there was no way to talk any further. My wife and I just kind of looked at each other and laughed, like how weird. We got our room keys and went over to the elevator. It was a large chain hotel and our room was on one of the higher up floors. The elevator stopped before our floor, and when the doors slid open, there were about four to five guys there, late 30s, maybe early 40s, holding beers. They saw us and acted pleasantly surprised. They all did the, hey, kind of surprised cheer, as if they hadn't expected to run into us. My wife and I just figured they were having some fun. But then they started talking to us, as if they knew us too. Ah, we're having a party in Dan's room, one of the guys said. Again, my wife and I were unsure if they were actually speaking to us, but there was no one else in the elevator that they would be talking to, so they were. I said, oh, okay. Another guy said, you girls headed out to bed? My wife and I gave each other the side eye uh, yep, she said. Yeah, I'm pretty tired too. It's been a long day. The door slid open at what I was guessing was Dan's floor. Well, we'll all be down here in Dan's room if you change your minds. The guys got off the elevator, and when the doors closed, my wife and I started cracking up. What in the world was going on? Why did all these people seem to think they knew us? We made it to our room and got ready for bed. It was chilly, so I slept in my socks, which I almost never do. I fell asleep right away and I slept like a rock as we had already had a long first day of travel to make it to Toronto. When we woke up the next morning, I got out of bed and immediately noticed another weird thing. I was still wearing socks, but they weren't the socks I had worn to bed the night before. In fact, they weren't my socks at all. I was immediately grossed out, but my wife and I had a good laugh about it. I mean, how in the world did that happen? I've never been a sleepwalker, not once in my life. 
so weird. Since we had a flight to catch, we grabbed our stuff and made our way down to the lobby to check out. It was busy, and there was another line at the desk. We stood behind this woman who had two suitcases. She was standing with her body half turned toward us, so she saw us coming. She looked up from her phone when we got in line, and then went back to minding her own business, as we were. Then after a minute, she looked up directly at us and said, Did Bob go to get the car or something? What in the world? Again, we had never laid eyes on this woman before this moment. We had no idea who she was, and we certainly didn't know Bob. I have no idea, I said finally. Like the others, she seemed confused by my confusion. It's been a couple of years since this incident at the hotel, but my wife and I still laugh about it from time to time. That hotel was just full of people who were so sure that they knew us, but that's impossible. Our theory is that maybe there was an event at the hotel with guests who looked like us, but I mean, what are the odds of that? And that still wouldn't explain what happened to my socks. To this day, it's still the strangest thing that has ever happened to us. To cut an extremely long story short, my friend used to live in a house that was well into the woods. One day, he told me something was happening around his house, so I spent the night. We sat with our backs to the wall, and the window cracked just a bit on the second story. As we were talking, we started hearing strange noises coming from the woods. We were shocked as we peeked to see what it could be. Between his house and the woods was a big open area. We could faintly see the open area because of the moonlight but we couldn't see into the pitch blackness of the woods. Suddenly, some large white creature that looked like a naked man creeped out. It was bald, and its eyes were glowing. When we freaked out, I yelped a bit too loudly, causing it to stop and go back into the woods. The next day, being the curious people we were, we decided to go out into the woods and search. Eventually, we found a strange uprooted tree with a bunch of holes in the ground. We heard heavy breathing coming from somewhere inside, but we decided not to go in there looking. A few weeks went by and nothing. I came back to his house just to have a sleepover. He asked me to go grab one of his bikes off the back porch. I went back there through the garage, but as I was grabbing it, I felt like something was watching me. I looked off toward the woods, but saw nothing. Suddenly, I heard a strange noise literally over my head. I looked up at the roof, which was only about seven feet off the ground in that section of the house due to the elevation of the porch, and I saw a similar creature sitting on the roof just feet from my face. When I panicked, it shrieked in my face, and I ran back into the garage and slammed the door shut. My friend ran into the garage from inside the house to see what had happened, and I was panicking, telling him to lock everything. We locked ourselves inside and waited for his dad to come back. This was around six to eight o'clock at night. I don't remember exactly, but it was closer to the night. His dad was in the military and decided to step out and take a look after he came home and we told him what had happened. He saw that same creature in the distance, just on the edge of the woods but he had no explanation for us as to what it could be. It's been five years since that happened, and now I've been seeing sightings of things just like it all over the place. YouTube, Reddit, Facebook. It's really been haunting me lately, thinking back on that sound that it made when it shrieked and the way it looked. It was terrifying. Its eyes seemed very strange too. I kind of tied two and two together and figured that it must live beneath the ground somewhere and only come up when it's dark. Has anyone else witnessed anything like this? <laughs> 